Our first speaker this morning is going to be uh, Jeffrey Grimm, going to be speaking about dynamics and epidemics. Good morning, everybody. I'm sorry I'm late. Martin doesn't walk quite fast enough. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation, Malad and Martin Pislo, and for all your work in organizing the conference. Everybody who's organized meetings knows how much work goes on behind the scenes, uh, and we're all very grateful to you for, for your work and for your invitations. So before I begin, I just want to draw your attention to a paper that appeared last week, but it's not a mass paper. It's a paper written by a number of authors from OpenAI, another AI company at the University of Pennsylvania in which they uh, report on their findings on the following issue. To what degree are different professions likely to be exposed to the progress of large language models, that's to say things like ChatGPT? Uh, and the particular measure of exposure that they chose was the degree of certainty that a given profession, uh, somebody in a given profession, will be able to perform at least 50% of their work much more efficiently using large language models than thinking. And there is one profession which stands out as enormously exposed, 100% exposed, and that's mathematicians. In fact, we come top of every subgroup as maximally exposed. And you do wonder what people think that mathematicians do. But maybe they're right, but it might be worth reflecting on that. Um, the, the two areas which are found, on the, uh, on the other hand, to be least exposed, the two uh, intellectual areas rather than professions which are found to be least exposed to large language models, the predations of large language models, are science and critical thinking. The corollary is that we do neither science nor critical thinking. Now, I don't press that, I press here, presumably. So this is a personal story. I don't know whether you remember Friday the 13th of March uh, 2020. Um, the, it was a day uh, in which the world changed. It was a day when the politicians realized that we were going to face a major disease. Um, and instead of uh, handling it, I mean, instead of dealing with it in the usual way, it was going to have to be dealt with in a very special way. This, this is the day that I, with my wife, got on a plane, a non-stop plane to Australia in the afternoon. And when we woke up, when we got up on Saturday morning in Australia, the world had changed. In particular, in Australia it had changed, because the Australian cabinet had met in emergency session during our flight and closed the borders to Australia. Fortunately, they deferred the closure for 24 hours, so we were allowed in, but, but life was more difficult for people on the following plane, if there were any people on the following plane. And I don't know whether you've read the, um, there's, a, there's a nice sort of scientific biography of Jennifer Downer, uh, one of the inventors of CRISPR, the gene splicing uh, uh, science, science technology, um, in which uh, she, she recounts via the writer uh, her story, which is that they sent their kids in California off to some camp, you know, 100 miles away in California, I don't know where. Uh, and, um, and she was, I mean, Downer, of course, knows a great deal about, about uh, biology, genetics, and infection. Uh, and um, all that sort of stuff, which we're not always so expert at. Um, and in the middle of the night, she woke up. She said, they were confident. They sent her off. Don't worry, life will be fine. So we don't have to worry about this. But in the middle of the night, she woke up. In the middle of the night, and she got in the car and she drove there. And she collected her children back from summer camp in the middle of the night. So somehow, this was uh, the night we were in the play was a very uh, significant night for the um, for the events that followed. Uh, now, what happened to me is that I um, arrived in Australia. Um, on a Sunday morning. Uh, on Monday, I went into the department. No, I took Monday off. On Tuesday, I went into the department and gave a lecture. On Tuesday evening, I went down with COVID. So um, uh, within uh, a day, the maths department in Melbourne was closed, and within a week, the university was closed, and I felt a certain amount of guilt about this. Fortunately, I wasn't the first person in the university to have COVID. I was the second, so I was concealed by, by, by a primary victim. Um, but I did, however, travel to Australia against the rules of the university, which had banned members of the university from travel. My argument was that I was traveling back to a job, I wasn't traveling away. Um, now, um, so then I had a two or three weeks uh, trying to learn about, as the Australian health services were also trying to learn about uh, how to handle COVID. Um, and um, uh, one correspondence that I have regularly with Zhang Yang Li led to the question, surely we can do something with COVID. What, what can mathematicians do with COVID? Um, in particular, you might ask, what does COVID uh, lend mathematics? And the answer to this is it lends us a good model. 
uh, an interesting model which has an interesting mathematical challenges. Um, but at that time also, there was the dream of immunity. I was saying to my wife, you don't have to worry about me, I've got it, I'm going to, I'm going to become immune, I'm going to go out and not worry about COVID. Whereas the politicians at the time, if you remember, were very much in doubt about immunity. They didn't want people to believe in immunity. They were very conservative. They said, you can't count on this, it may not occur. But all the microbiologists I knew, and I know several, said, no, there's certainly going to be some degree of immunity, whether it's going to be a month or a year or forever, we simply don't know, but there will be immunity. So John Young and I decided that we would like to discuss the mathematics, the mathematical model of COVID with immunity. And that makes the problem much harder. The immunity is a major difficulty uh, to the mathematics, and I'll explain why. So the, 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 um, the, the features that we were interested in in the disease were, uh, first of all, that we're living in, the, 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 um, the, the, the population lives in a Euclidean space, locally in a two-dimensional space, but you know, in a Euclidean space. The population moves, it's a mobile population, it's not a static population. Um, a, a infection is random, you can't predict, you, know, you might uh, come very close to one person to another and get the disease from one and not from the other, even though they're both infected. And we wanted to consider the, the, the reality, uh, the mathematical react possibility of uh, the reality of immunity. And so, of course, this is a little bit reminiscent of a conversation that we had yesterday about G.H. Hardy, who reflected that relativity and number theory have no possible applications. Um, so this is the inverse question, really, which is not what mathematics gives to uh, the world, but what the world gives to mathematics, uh, what sort of model can we construct. And uh, this is, of course, a unique feature of, I mean, I say unique, um, the word unique is much misused and perhaps it's slightly misused here, but, but I think the case can be strongly made. The probability is one of the leading, if not the leading, the most obvious area of mathematical science, which pivots of theory, abstract theory, and also at real-world applications. Uh, and many of us tread the line between those two uh, with great happiness. Many of us work in pure uh, abstract mathematics uh, in the probabilistic universe. There are, there are others, including uh, uh, editors of a number of journals, who edit uh, journals of applied probability, uh, who may or may not be dealing with applications. And then, of course, there are the real applications of probability theory which you find in scientific literature. The difficulty, there are some difficulties, of course, of navigating this relationship between theory and application. And this is, um, I think, uh, epitomized in the history of the Annals of Applied Probability. When the Annals of Applied Probability began, the idea was that it would really deal somehow, really, whatever that means, but in probability, our probability, and applications, so the concrete applications of the theory, math the mathematical theory that we develop uh, within our probability, within our, within our science. Of course, um, naturally, you know, the Annals of Applied Probability went native Native being that it started publishing, in fact, published a great deal of the large number of papers really in probability, a applicable probability, but not applied probability, you might say. Probabilistic models, which we study as mathematicians, rather than probabilistic models which lead us to an analysis and an understanding of data. And, and there was a moment, I think, when the editorship of the Annals of Applied Probability changed, and the incoming editor decided that he, because it was a he, uh, would uh, f f give enormous favour to real applications, things which are really connected with the, with the world, uh, as a result of which a large number of papers which were in process of being accepted were rejected, and this caused a certain amount of bad feeling uh, 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 across the community, which, uh, which one can understand. Now the Annals of Applied Probability has reverted back to, back to norm and is publishing you know, the, the stuff that we know and the stuff that we write. Um, after all, it is part of our community, so we can, we can be pleased with this. Now, um, so this meeting of theory and application. So here there's an application and, uh, um, uh, and it's in epidemic theory. Now I don't know really very much about epidemic theory, though we've all been exposed to it in one form or another. It goes back a long way, it goes back at least to Daniel Bernoulli in 1760. Bernoulli was interested in inoculation uh, against smallpox. Um, Bernoulli built a sort of mathematical model, did an analysis and, and confronted that analysis with data to reach conclusions. Epidemics can be, uh, can be um, uh, uh, deterministic or stochastic. The determinate, stochastic epidemics, of course, step by step, the infection is random. Deterministic epidemics is you write down differential equations that govern you know, the, the growth of the, the development of states of infection or susceptibility within a population, you solve them. And of course, there's a relationship between those two, particularly in the large N limit, as the stochastic epidemic has what you might call a hydrodynamic limit, which is essentially a deterministic epidemic. But of course, epidemics begin very stochastically. You know, one, one bird infects one human. That human could fall under a bus immediately. Uh, on the other hand, that human could be, uh, uh, you know, could, 
be a, somebody who's exposed to many people in the community. Um, so there's a large amount of randomness in the beginning of epidemics. And of course, we understand that from branching processes. The branching processes, when they grow, they grow nearly deterministically. Um, but there's a constant out front, and the constant depends on what happens at the beginning. And the constant is a random variable. At the beginning, epidemic theory, of course, couldn't handle spatial, the spatial aspect of people living in a space. Um, and uh, so everything was what we physicists might call mean field. Everybody interacted sort of on average with everybody else, uh, rather than conceptually where you sit in the lecture theatre uh, affects uh, where, whether or not you catch the disease from somebody in the lecture theatre who has the disease. Of course, the introduction of space is an enormous but very significant and beautiful complication. Uh, and um, that's part of uh, what I want to show you today. Um, we do, mathematicians tend to do the theory of epidemics. We're rarely confronted, or some of us will be confronted by data. Of course, there's an enormous amount of epidemic going, theory going on in the applied science community, and that became particularly important in advising politicians on how to handle COVID. And what's the basis question? So, of course, in all these areas, there's a fundamental question. Like one fundamental question for me is, would I get it? I mean, that, that, that's, a, but that's a sort of microscopic and infinitesimal question. The question for politicians is, will there be a pandemic? Will, in some sense, a positive, you know, a, a proportion of people in my country get the disease where the proportion is substantially bounded away from zero? Because, of course, all these numbers are finite. Uh, so a pandemic is when the disease spreads through the community uh, and uh, the absence of a pandemic is when it's a local outbreak, however one defines this. Just to remind you about Bernoulli's work. So Bernoulli, um, Bernoulli was, was uh, studying the value of, I mean this is relevant because of uh, you know, the vac vac vaccination deniers, denial. Um, uh, what's the value of vaccination? So Bernoulli, interesting that Bernoulli was dealing in exactly in that question. Uh, is inoculation of the population against smallpox worthwhile? Inoculation meant the injection of, um, of, a, of a, a, a controlled form, minor form of the, of the bug. Um, so I use the word inoculation rather than vaccination. Um, uh, and uh, of course, it was, it was dangerous. People died because of the inoculation. Then, then that was understood that people died. But they also, if they didn't die, they survived longer. They survived on average about three years longer. So the question is, how do you balance these two things? Very classical work, uh, which is relevant to you know, the discussion that's going on in the world today. Why should you bother? Why should you want people to live longer? Well, um, Haley, who of course is famous for his comment, who worked in Oxford, um, uh, he uh, worked in a number of other things as well, and he also worked in the data associated with inoculation. So he had a database that, um, that Bernoulli used in order to uh, extrapolate to his, his conclusions. And the conclusion of Haley is that the reason, I mean, the reason we might care about people living longer is they make more money for the king, because they're more productive. Of course, Haley was presumably, I mean, I think we can assume Haley was a clever man, and in writing this, he was probably being a clever politician or so. So I remind you also of something that as undergraduates you may have come across, which is the general stochastic epidemic, which is somehow is everything that our model is not, or our people why put it the other way around, which is our model is everything that this is not. The general stochastic epidemic, you have a group of people in the room, and the assumption is that they all mix together. They all mix together uniformly. So if one person has a disease, they're equally likely to pass it on to any, any, any person in this room. So if you have A people with the disease and B people without the disease, the number of possible encounters are, is A, B, and so the rate at which the disease grows is proportional to those products of those two numbers. So this is a mean field model of uniform mixing, uh, and um, in, the, in the basic version of the general stochastic epidemic, uh, the disease proceeds, of course, there's no cure, and once you've got it, you've got it forever, and then the question, there are various questions that you can ask, and there's various bits of mathematics which are trivial, and various bits of mathematics which are rather testing, and special functions arise, because it's a very concrete problem, and that's the sort of thing that we, we're exposed to in, um, uh, in um, uh, elementary probability. But what's missing from that, first of all, is the spatial element is missing. Everybody's mixing uniformly. Um, there is, um, there's no recovery element in this. So once you've got the disease, you've got the disease forever. And this is the assumption is that it proceeds like a Markov chain, a Markov process, so, it, so there's an exponential distribution, so there's no dealing with general distributions. So there are a variety of things that you can do with the general stochastic epidemic, which uh, people have probably done. So before I talk about our model for the spread of COVID, if I can put it that way, let me just remind you of some basic models because they're relevant to the process that we're going to discuss and they're relevant for the proofs. So first of all, quickly in a single slide, the percolation model, 
a percolation model. So this is the percolation model on the square lattice on Z2. But of course, uh, <coughs> you can do this on any, any graph, uh, any infinite graph. Any <coughs> but let's stick to the square lattice. So each vertex is a site percolation. Each vertex is either open or closed. It's white or red. Um, the red vertices here are open. The white vertices are closed. So the, uh, the, and the, the red vertices form clusters. They form connected components of the entire grid. So in this particular picture, there's a component of size 3. There's another one of size, um, what is this, 6. And then there are three singleton components in this finite picture. Um, and so as you ask the question, so there's a prop of the parameter P here. P is the probability that any given point is open. So you flip a coin for each vertex, and you look at the, the colors which ensue, and you look at their clusters, and you ask, what can you say about the geometry of the red set? It's the basic question. And the basic statement is that, uh, is there a pandemic? Pandemic corresponds here to the existence of an infinite cluster of red vertices. And if P is small, then almost surely there will be no infinite red cluster. If P is large, then almost surely there is an infinite cluster. And so there's a critical value of P called the critical probability at which the infinite cluster uh, is created. Think about P as a variable. As P increases, more and more things become red. And at some magic value of P, um, there is an infinite cluster created. Uh, and that value, there is a critical point. It, it's not um, important in this talk what the value of the critical point is. It's actually about 0.59. We don't know it exactly for this model. Uh, there is a phase transition from the subcritical, all finite phase to the supercritical, um, uh, un unbounded, uh, unbounded cluster phase. This is a little bit like the branching process phase transition as the mean family size goes through the value 1. Um, uh, and of course it has strong connection to mathematical physics. Uh, and, and perhaps it's not um, inappropriate to point out that this model has been involved in the work of three fields medalists in the last five or so uh, ICAs. Now, just veer off slightly to directed percolation, the previous situation was undirected. Connectivity could be in any direction, but in directed percolation, connectivity has to be in a particular direction, in this case, in the northeast direction. So I specified two compass bearings, um, neither being the inverse of the other, uh, and decided that's the direction of my connectivity, northeast. So you can ask, what's the probability of an infinite path? This is going to crop up later. And so the, the sort of classic Lich theorem says the following. But if you define theta of p to be the probability that the origin is the endpoint of an infinite directed red path, then theta of p is zero for small p, positive for large p, as a critical point pc, which is deterministic, and at pc note that theta of p is zero. The corresponding statement for the undirected case is still open in general. For two dimensions we know that, but not in general. But in the directed population we know a bit more. So there's a critical point. One more model, the continuum model. We heard a mention of the, of the connection model yesterday. This is not quite the connection model. This is sometimes called the lily pad model or something like that. So these are, um, this is a Poisson process in two dimensions with some parameter lambda. And each, think of those Poisson, think of each point as the center of a lily, a circular lily. And there's, these are the circular lilies that they form. So this is the, the surface of the pond. And the question is, can the snail move to infinity on, on the connected set, on a connected set of lilies without getting his or her feet wet. And so once again, there's a critical value of lambda now for the existence of an infinite connected cluster of these circles. And, um, uh, and, and, and uh, these are balls of radius a half here for some reason, which I, which I, which I, which will become clear later. I don't know how to go back, I guess I do, but I can't go back. Was there a question? Do you mean water lilies? <laughs> It's whatever the liquid is. <laughs> Water lilies are disappointingly non-circular. <laughs> but there are lilies. I mean, for example, the ones in the, in the Amazon. There's a famous lily pond in the Amazon, very big lilies, which are extraordinarily circular. But they don't have constant radius. <laughs> so these Second model, the contact model. So, um, so the contact model is um, uh, uh, also a model for infection or spread of epidemic or spread of something. So the idea is once again you're living on a square lattice and, eat, and there are two states. Think about these as being well and being ill. So a, think about this as a disease and the contact model is a good to the spread of disease through contact. So we're living on the square lattice, remember. So the local state transitions is if, if I'm ill, 
then I become well at some rate, some rate delta, so at random, so the waiting time is exponential parameter, parameter delta. If I'm well, then I could become ill, but I only become ill through my neighbors. So the, de the density at which, the intensity at which I become ill is proportional to the number of ill neighbors. One neighbor can infect me, two neighbors can infect me twice as fast, and four neighbors infected who are ill can infect me four times as fast. So the rate at which I become ill is some constant lambda times the number of infected neighbors. So this is the well-known contact model. Contact model is much studied, so it's a beautiful theory. In particular, it has what you might call a graphical representation. So the contact model is living in the square lattice, but if you add an extra dimension representing time, then all these, these cures and infections can be represented as uh, in time, something happens in time. So you have uh, basically you construct a set of Poisson processes on these timelines and between these timelines, which tell you when you would become well if you were ill and when you would become ill if you were well. You sort of encode the entire future in these, in these uh, Poisson processes. And then you put in some infection at the bottom and you follow the arrows and the the, um, the, the rules of the, of the Poisson processes to see what happens to, what happens to the process. So this is really a, it's like a directed percolation model of a different type, but in two plus one dimensions, because you've got this extra dimension, and the time being directed. So I just want to create the relationship between the, the contact model and a corresponding type of percolation model. And once again, there's a phase transition. This leads to what, one of my favorite questions, which some of you will have answered before, but you're not required to answer it, but you can if you like. Um, what is probability theory? I think it's a question which is good to address occasionally. What do we do? How do we define we're mathematicians? What is the basic definition that we live with on a day-to-day -day basis? What are we doing? And so my answer is it's the theory of account of the infinite sequence of coin tosses. Those of you who work in processes on non-separable spaces may object to this, but for most of us, this is a pretty good definition. And the three basic objects of probability theory, or a, a, a formulation of the three basic, all, each of which occurs in this talk, by the way, uh, are the branching process, the Poisson process, and Brownian motion. And what are those things in red mean? Well, of course, the Bra Pr Poisson process, you, you know, the Poisson was thinking about horse kicks in the, in the Prussian army. Uh, and was modeling the numbers of people kicked by horses uh, by a distribution which, uh, which took his name. But of course that was a Poisson, dis Poisson distribution. So far as I'm aware, Poisson never formulated the Poisson process. But of course the Poisson distribution is a very important part of the Poisson process. Um, the branching process is uh, famous for the basic theorem that says that the probability of extinction is one if the mean family size is less than one, sorry, is, is one if the mean family size is less than one, is, is strictly less than one if the mean family size is bigger than one, and then something funny happens when the mean family size equals one. Um, and Brownian motion, of course, is a kind of continuous random walk um, observed by a number of people in different settings, but usually ascribed to Brown, uh, who was very enthusiastic about it. He had an experiment in his house in London, and in his experiment, he looked into his very special microscope, and you could see these little particles moving. He was so excited, he used to apparently run into the street and pull in passers-by so that he could show them the results of the experiment. I wouldn't try that these days. This is Galton, Watson, and bien -Aimé. Um Galton, an extraordinary individual on the left, a, a very fine sort of experimental mathematician. Um, uh, 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 unfortunately, he's got into trouble recently because it's been discovered that he coined the word eugenics, and that's led to a bad reputation. And he has his, it partly been extinguished from, um, from the academic environment as a result of that. Watson was a priest, you know, a certain number of British priests, um, or should I say English pre British priests, I guess, did find work in mathematics in between writing their sermons. Uh, and Galton, of course, formulated the question of how, how do you study the, prob the extinction probability of a, of a branching process, and he published it in a popular journal in London. And Watson, the priest, replied, um, but he got the answer wrong. Uh, I mean, his method was wrong, and his answer was incorrect. Uh, and that was corrected later, much later. Um, and it turned out that Bianemi had done it all 40 years before anyway. So this is the story of, of scientific uh, communication and uh, invention. So what, what, is this, what is the model, what is the COVID model that we're discussing uh, here, if I've still got time? Um, call it disease browning snails. These are not, it's related to what's called the frog model of uh, random walks. In the frog model, particles jump. But of course, our particles are moving according to a Brownian motion, so they can't be frogs, they have to be snails. Snails slither continuously. That's why they're called snails. 
And these are Browning snails that live in finite dimensional space. So we're thinking about d-dimensional Euclidean space, but of course I'm going to draw the line. Uh, and at the beginning, that is the snails are distributed around space in the manner of a Poisson process. I don't think that's too big, a, big an assumption, but you need some assumption of regularity, and the Poisson process is the right process to use because it's stationary under Brownian perturbations. Uh, <clears throat> so um, we have an initial set of snails distributed in the real line, like a Poisson process. And what's the disease? Well, so initially I've got one infected snail, so the infected snail starts at the origin, and all the other snails are, are, are in a state of being uninfected. And how long does this, this snail live? Well, the snail is ill. The snail at zero is ill. So the snail at zero, we're going to assume, lives for an exponentially distributed period of time with some parameter alpha. Um, and I point out then that the mean length of the illness period is one over alpha. So you have to think that increasing alpha decreases the infections. The infection is monotonically decreasing in the, in the parameter alpha, which is slightly unfortunate, but that's how we have to set it up. So this snail at zero lives for an exponentially distributed period of time. I'll tell you about movement in a moment. Uh, why is it it can, infect its, it can infect other snails? And if it infects any snail, it's just to adopt a very simple rule, which turns out to be slightly complicated. Uh, we adopt a very simple rule, which is the snail zero infects any other snail whenever they get distance within, they get within distance one of each other. So they've got to move. And the motion, there are two, motion, two, two models, and I want to impress upon you that the, 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 there are two of these things because the results differ between these two things. One is the natural one, which is what we call the diffusion model. In the diffusion model, all the snails are moving according to Brownian motion. So we're in the line, we have points, they're all moving according to Brownian motion. There's an infected particle, and the infected particle lives for a period of time, during which time that particle is about the snail is moving, all the other snails are moving. Whenever two snails get within distance one, the, the, instant, the infection passes instantaneously, and the infected snail then continues to move, also for an exponential period of time, because lifetimes of the disease are exponential from to alpha, during which time the infection could continue to spread. That's the diffusion model. Everything diffuses from time zero. In the delayed diffusion model, which is much more tractable, particles only move when they're infected. So at the beginning, all the particles are stationary except the, the particle of the origin. That particle moves. And whenever that particle touches another, becomes within distance one of any other particle who is then stationary, the second particle becomes infected and starts moving. So the infection triggers the movement, delayed diffusion. These are two, so, so of course you can perturb this in a variety of ways. Um, the rule of being within distance one is very specific. Uh, uh, and of course you can soften that up, and I might mention later on how you can soften that. Um, the Brownian movement, well it doesn't have to be a Brownian motion. Essentially any diffusion could be used. Uh, there's problems can arise for, I mean of course you know we're very good at thinking of difficult situations. Um, if you had a diffusion with a very fast variance process, or a variance process which varies a lot about through, as time varies, that might be tricky. So don't just think about a diffusion in which the instantaneous variance is constant, but the instantaneous mean can be anything you like, and then one can essentially do uh, everything one wants to do. Now, there, there, of course, there is a history. There's no history so far as I'm aware of this particular model, but there are related models in, in probability. There's the frog model, which is a discrete pro pro process in discrete time, in which frogs jump about the vertices of the square lattice, where there are other frogs who are awakened by the area. Naturally, if you're sitting on a spot and a frog lands on you, you wake up, and then you start moving, uh, and, and, and so on, uh, which is closely related to something called the activated random, random walk. And these have been around since the early 2000s. Um, and there are two, two or three large papers of Harry and Lallas associated with some of these models. The differences are that all these models are in discrete time, our model is in continuous space time. Their models are in discrete space, but they uh, with, um, well, continuous time, but things are, it's random walk with holding times, so it's essentially, uh, can dis there is a discrete element to the space and time. And the problem arises, that, so the pro what, why, is our, why is our model difficult to study? Two reasons. One is thick particles are moving, they're not stationary in space, so you don't know where they're going to be in the future. Uh, and the second reason is because of immunity. Immunity at the end of my, when I'm infected, at the end of my infection period, I die, or I'm removed in some sense. I'm no longer present, I'm, no longer, I'm never going to get the disease again, and I'm not going to give it on again. So the, the fact that you have immunity or, 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 or death, what that tends to do is it destroys monotonicity. 
It destroys monotonicity. It's a bit like the forest fire model that some of you may have come across. Uh, think about these, well, let's stick to disease. Um, if the disease spreads quickly at the beginning, a large number of people get the disease and then they die off. So there's a big area of space where there's no disease. And if the disease later needs to get through that space to get to some other people who are waiting to be infected, then it, it, it takes a long time to get through that space because the particles are diffusing and there's a big area of empty space. So you're building firewalls. Immunity breeds firewalls. The, 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 the papers referred to on this screen um, are all about, uh, I think all about the non-immune system where frogs become infected, they get better, but once they're better, they wait to be reinfected. And that makes the problem very much easier. Now recently, I want, I, I, I want to mention that there's been a recent paper of Dovell and Sly where they develop a discrete space model, a bit like the frog model, the activated random walk, um, but with immunity. Uh, and so they have a long paper on the archive, um, a long and complex paper on the archive, which is uh, related to our work. Our work is in continuous space time and there's in discrete space, um, but there will be something to be learned from their paper, something significant to be learned from their paper when I've got to understand it. <coughs> so these are, these are um, results. So delayed diffusion, remember delayed diffusion, so uh, particles only move when they're ill, they don't move before they become ill. So we have a set I of infected particles, by which I mean ultimately infected particles. They're all, all the snails that ever become infected. It's not at any particular time. This is the union over all time of the infected set. Uh, and so we can now define a percolation probability, which is the probability that that set of infected particles is infinite, that infinitely many snails are infected at some time, that they have the union over all times. And call that theta. So theta, the same letter as in the percolation probability. And so, there's a, there's a, first of all, in this instance, you know, one of the first questions you ask is, of course, there are two situations. One is only finitely many snails become infected. The second is that infinitely many snails become infected, and there are probabilities of those events. And uh, you, you obviously think there's, there's going to be monoton monotonicity in something. So think about lambda is constant. Lambda is the intensity of the Poisson process. Fix that. Alpha is the important variable here. Alpha is the uh, is a, a measure of the of the rate at which ill particles become dead. So big alpha means less infection. So the question akin to the one that we were discussing yesterday is, is there a sharp phase transition in alpha? Is there a critical value of alpha above which the infection dies out and beneath which, with positive probability, it does not die out? And the answer is yes for the delayed diffusion model. So the theorem says that um, if you're in two or more dimensions, one dimension is special, uh, um, uh, nothing happens in one dimension, nothing interesting happens in one dimension, the infection has to die out with probability one in one dimension. So in two dimensions or more, um, and if you have a value of lambda, which is beneath the continuum percolation critical point, you see there is a, a relationship here to continuum percolation, um, to lily pads. Uh, if, if in your initial distribution, if, if your, your snails are initially distributed like a Poisson process, if there were an infinite cluster of lily pads in, in, in space based upon the set of snails, then there'd be an infinite set of snails such that there is a path from any one member to another member over distances using interpoint distances of strictly less than one. And if that occurred at the beginning, if any point in that um, set were initially infected, if S0 was in that set, instantaneously the entire set would become infected. So that's the consequence of having this hard rule that you infect anybody when you become within distance one of them. And you have to deal with that, because that, that clearly answers the question in the case of lambda bigger than lambda c. Remember, lambda c is the critical, uh, thank you very much, uh, whoever's responsible for that. Um, lambda c here is the critical point for that, so I have to take lambda less than lambda c, otherwise the problem is dead straight away. So take lambda less than lambda c. Oh, let's see, I did it to take up it. Um, I don't like it, but I put it away. There's the critical point there. So take lambda less than lambda c, and the theorem says there is an alpha c, such that if you're bigger than alpha c, then the strictly positive probability of a pandemic, starting from an initial infection. Uh, whereas if alpha is less than lambda c, uh, sorry, the, the, the other way around, if alpha is bigger than lambda c, then, you, then the disease almost surely dies out. If lambda is uh, less, if alpha is less than alpha c, then the strictly, strictly positive probability of a pandemic. 
Now, then the question arises whether this alpha c here is non-trivial. I mean, all, all this says is that the sum alpha c which could possibly be zero or infinity, uh, but, but it could be non-trivial. Uh, uh, the, the question actually becomes, is alpha c finite? And we can't prove that alpha c is always finite. All we can prove is that if lambda is sufficiently small, Lambda is the intensity of the, of the uh, Poisson process. For sufficiently small lambda, it is the case that alpha c is finite. Uh, and of course, one of the main questions is, can you push this, put this, this uh, interval of values of lambda all the way up to lambda c and get out of that? So this is a kind of semi-perturbative statement in, in the language of physics. Uh, we know what happens when lambda is zero, that's obvious. And if lambda is sufficiently close to zero, then what happens at zero still happens, there's no infection. Uh, there's no, no pandemic um, uh, for sufficiently large alpha. But, if, um, but as we move lambda up to lambda c, uh, we can't get all the way up to lambda c. So this sort of perturbative statement, which is a little bit frustrating. Now, that, so there is, a, there is a sharp phase transition. Now, um, and then, you, uh, ha then uh, what you have to prove, you have to prove something about, you know, you want to prove alpha c, you want to understand things about alpha c. Basically, you want to prove that for sufficiently large alpha, something happens, and for sufficiently small alpha, something happens. So the previous, um, how do I go back, by the way? With the arrows. Where are the arrows? Is that one there? Yes, thank you, got it. Um, so uh, this, is, this is the proof that in principle some alpha exists. It's not the proof that alpha c is neither zero nor infinity. So what you've got to prove is that, alpha, is that for sufficiently small lambda, um, alpha c is non-trivial, it might be broken into a naught infinity. So you want to prove that there is a subcritical regime and that there is a supercritical regime. So this is the proof that the subcritical phase exists. Subcriticality means that if alpha is sufficiently large, the pandemic dies out with probability one. Uh, and is that what it says? Yes. So it says that if um, yeah, so it says for sufficiently large alpha and for sufficiently small lambda, uh, alpha c of lambda is finite, so that for sufficiently large alpha, um, uh, the pandemic dies out. That's correct. So that's the so you, you, that's the proof of the existence of the that's the statement of the existence of a subcritical phase. Um, and, and there are some questions which arise there, which I, I'll leave um, for the moment. And I want to talk about methods. So this is methods for the delayed diffusion model, remember. So the existence of a subcritical phase, um, which is, uh, is by comparison with a branching process. Basically, you want to show that as a disease grows, it's governed in some sense by the size of a branching process. This is a classical argument. And then you want to understand the branching process, and particularly you want to understand the mean family size of the branching process. And if you can squeeze the parameters such that the mean family size is less than one, then the branching process almost surely dies out, and that governs the growth of the, uh, of the disease itself. So that's a standard type of argument, um, but it has to be done properly. To show the supercritical phase, that means that for sufficiently small alpha, the disease can, can continue to exist forever with strictly positive probability. You want to show that there's a lower process which can persist forever. And so what you do is you compare now the infection process with a, a process which we understand, which is a type of percolation process. Um, and so we want, to, we, want to bot, we want to bound beneath a percolation process which is supercritical. And then it will follow, so we want a percolation process downstairs, we want to show that we can adjust the parameters so that that percolation process continues forever, in other words, you're above its critical point or whatever, whatever you need to show in that particular context. And then the large process, which is the infection process, will also continue forever. So comparison with branching process, comparison with percolation. And why is there a unique phase transition? Why is there a unique value alpha which separates the subcritical from the supercritical phase? That's because in this model there is some monotonicity. This is, of course, what always happens in these models of probability and statistical physics. You look for monotonicity. If you have something, some function, some macroscopic function, which is a monotonic function of some parameters, then, then you can deduce that, for example, if, it tra if it, in its tra any transition from zero to being strictly positive, that can only happen at a unique value of the, of, the, of the parameter. And so you want some monotonicity, and here there is some monotonicity. The monotonicity is not, uh, not immediately obvious, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, quickly about that. And it goes back to, for me, it goes back to a paper of Kari Kulasmar in 1982, uh, when he was a PhD student of Dennis Mollison at Harry Moore University in Edinburgh. 
Um, and, and this, of course, is one of the advantages of being old, which is uh, at least old but with some, some bit of your memory left, which is you've seen a lot of papers, and sometimes you even remember what's in these papers. And nowadays, of course, we can, we're, we're, we're cleverer than we used to be, and we work things out from scratch. Um, uh, um, but uh, just occasionally, uh, as powers fade, it's good to remember that other people have been there already. Uh, and so the Kulasma argument um, uh, is, uh, is a useful argument to use here. So once you have the monotonicity, you know that there can only be a, a unique value of alpha, and you know the subcritical and supercritical phases exist, so that unique value of alpha must be non-trivial. Now you can extend this model in a variety of ways. I say you can change the diffusion process, you can change the infection mechanism, and I won't, dis won't discuss that at the moment. But let me just remind you, before I talk about quickly about proof series and pictures of proofs, um, uh, let me just remind you of the general setup. We live in indeed dimensional space. We have an initial configuration, which is a Poisson process of points, and that Poisson process are called capital X. Capital X is a, it's a countable set. A countable set of a subset of R D, and those are the points where the initial snails are, where the snails are, are placed. Um, th there's also a snail at the point zero, which we add, which is an infected snail. We have a set of Brownian motions. Snail labeled I follows a Brownian motion zeta I, and so we can write down the state space of this process. This is a Markov process, um, a fairly high-dimensional Markov process. We have an initial state of the Markov process, and of course, remember that snails have exponentially distributed um, uh, in, in infection times. And so, all of that sense can be made of all those objects. Uh, and um, let me just now talk about the. Uh, what I call here the main technique, and this I think is the argument of Kulasma. So the main technique is the following. We start with this infection process and we change it. We do something else. And it turns out in doing something else we haven't actually changed anything at all. So we have this, pro this single process, but from that I extract a whole family of processes. Start with snail I. At some point I may become infected. SI, that's the snail labeled I, starts at some point XI, may become infected. What would snail I infect if snail I were the initial infective? So imagine all these snails, imagine each of them as the initial infective and ask what would they infect. So I start with snail I and I fix all the others and they don't move at all. So snail I moves, he, she, it, they um, will in general infect some other snails. But let's not let those snails move, we're just concentrating on snail eye. So snail eye has some, has some infection uh, uh, um, process in this universe of stationary snails. And that's true for each eye. So for each eye, conditional upon, the, you have to be careful about what you're conditioned on, you condition upon where they start, fix an eye, run snail eye, keep all the other stationary snail eye, infect some particles. And now I think about that as a, uh, as a direct percolation model. So here are the snails in two-dimensional space. Uh, and I put an arrow between SI and SJ, if in this process, when SI moves, SI infects SJ. So the arrows leaving SI just depend upon the, the process, which is sort of the infection process that I've just defined starting at, starting at I. So now I have this, I have this, um, this uh, set, of, set of processes, um, and I can draw the arrows which correspond to that set of processes, and what I see is a type of directed percolation model. And in that, in that system now, I can start off at zero, and in that I can follow the arrows, and whenever an arrow leaves somewhere, I designate the end point of the arrow infected in this new process, it's different from the old process, and I end up with a set of infected particles. And what Kulasma observed is that, so if we, if you remember in, in the lemma here, capital I is a set of infected particles in the initial process, the process I want to study. What I've just constructed is a different process with a different set of infected, infected particles, which I call I hat. I arrows, sorry. And then the lemma is that I equals I arrows. This isn't a probabilistic statement, this is a deterministic statement. So you have to check that. It's not difficult to check, but once you've realized that, then you realize that you have monotonicity. Because I arrows is monotone in alpha. Alpha is the lifetime of the infection, essentially. And if, 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 state, if snail SI lives for longer, they would infect more people, and that's just a simple mon a point wise monotonicity. So I arrows is monotone, though it wasn't obvious that I was monotone. So the theory is then it lies monotone. And from that, you conclude that um, there is a monotonicity in alpha, and so there is a critical value in alpha. 
Now, quickly then, because I'm, I'm, uh, I haven't got much to five, ten minutes left. Um, so the, 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 um, the existence of the subcritical phase, well, you, you want to use properties of Brownian motion and Poisson processes. The Brownian Poisson connection is very strong here. Um, the, the, the Poisson, a, a Poisson, if I'm a snail, as I move around, I'm infecting everything within distance one. So the, the collection of space-time where I'm infecting anybody I find is just the Wiener sausage. It's the, it's the sausage of all points within distance one of a Brownian motion. Uh, we, we know an awful lot about the Wiener sausage. Um, it, it should really be the Wiener sausage, shouldn't it? But everybody calls it the Wiener sausage now. I wonder why. Well, I think we can see why. But... So on, on the one hand, we've got these bracts. So we've got, now we've got Poisson, Brownian, and Brown, and Wiener all in the same soup mixed up together. Uh, and they work together very well. As we know, there are many theories about that. The Poisson distribution is the invariant measure, is, is invariant under Brownian perturbations. The Wiener sausage has been much studied. And when you put these things together in a fairly traditional way, um, you can show that the, if you study the mean number of infections by a given snail, snail S, snail zero, for example, that snail infects a certain number of points as an average. You can compute that average in terms of the volume of the Wiener sausage. Uh, and in particular, as um, alpha goes to zero, that average goes, uh, sorry, an alpha goes to infinity, that average goes to zero. So in particular, for large alpha, it's less than one. That mean number is less than one. And then you want to show that that, uh, that, 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 that is the mean family size of a certain dominating branching process, uh, which you do accordingly. Um, uh, um, and uh, out of that comes the existence of the subcritical phase. This mean, by the way, this mean mu, uh, you can actually calculate it exactly in terms of Bessel functions in two dimensions, and that's a classical result of Frank Spitzer from a long time ago. I mean, it, uh, because Frank studied the volume with a wooden sausage. The supercritical phase is more complicated. This time you want to change, you want to re rescale your lattice, so lattice here is two dimensions, rescale it by a ratio A, so everything is magnified, moved apart by a size A, and you place balls at the the integer points in this rescale lattice, so these balls. So, so, the, so the, these, the red points are the points of the lattice, uh, well actually it's the square lattice rescale by 3a, uh, and then you put balls around each of these, and you define a sort of a local event, an event that depends on, I mean, uh, so given a, take one of these points here, this point here for example, there's a the arrow there, um, you define an event which depends upon the the set of points initially in that box, in that ball, together with their Brownian motions. So that's a set an event that only depends upon the points in the ball and the Brownian motions of those points. So it's independent of the event defined in terms of, any, of uh, associated with any other uh, red point. And you choose that event in such a way that if there's a point in the ball initially, that point will ultimately visit uh, or will infect any point that exists in another ball over here. So it says that infection will, within that event, definitely pass from the first ball to the second ball. And the reason you can do this is because Brownian motion in two dimensions is recurrent. So starting a Brownian motion in the first ball, it will ultimately visit arbitrarily close to any other point. In fact, it will do it uh, un uh, infinitely often. So using the recurrence of random walk, one can define an event locally and then one looks at the associated percolation problem. This is the, this is the block art, the block construction associated with this this uh, this, uh, pro this approach. Uh, and so we have then a, an underlying percolation process. If you can make that percolation process supercritical, then the imperfection process has to be supercritical, and that's how it works. Now this is some, this is somewhat harder in three dimensions, because of course in three dimensions this argument uses the fact that Brownian motion is recurrent in two dimensions. It's not recurrent in three dimensions. But it's still recurrent in two dimensions. So if you take a three-dimensional Brownian motion and project it onto two-dimensional space, a two-dimensional hyperspace, hyperplane, then that projection is recurrent because that's also Brownian motion. But the, the three-dimensional process isn't. So the plane here is the projection of the Brownian motion, whereas the, the blue line is the trajectory of the Brownian motion, which is moving off into a third dimension. And so you, what, you, what you use here, you need a more complex block argument to dominate by percolation, dominate underneath by percolation uh, process. Um, uh, and, and that more complex argument works precisely because in two dimensions, Brownian motion is recurrent, but it uses the fact that Brownian motion is transient in three dimensions. 
uh, and it uses it in the sense that whenever you um, the projected process, well, the projected process will always come back to any near any given point that you pick, in particular the blue point in the plane. But as it comes back, it will typically be in a very different part of the line that goes through that point, because in three-dimensional three Brownian motion, it's really transient, so it's going to have to move away from the intersections that it has down here. So you use that recurrence of intersections of the line, I don't mean intersections, because of course it doesn't quite come back to the line, it comes back arbitrarily close as often as you like. So you use the combination of transients and recurrence to construct a corresponding event. Now, Finally, the, um, the diffusion model. The diffusion model is much harder. The Kulasma approach of representing it as a collection of independent sets of arrows does not work. Because all these particles are moving, you turn your back on them and they move, they're not where they should be. They're moving all the time. So even when they're not being infected, they're moving. And that, that gets in the way of them. And yet this is the more natural model. Um, and um, so we have only incomplete results for the diffusion model. Once again, the subcritical phase is fine. Once again, you can find a branching process argument which dominates it for sufficiently large alpha. So we know for sufficiently large alpha, the process dies out. Um, and um, we're really using properties of the Poisson process to do that. Um, Well-known properties, elementary properties, beautiful properties that um, partly characterize the Poisson process. Well, they certainly do, as I've written them down there. Um, so what are the problems for the Model. What can we do? What can't we do? Well, first of all, there's no monotonicity. Well, we don't have any monotonicity in alpha. We can't prove it because 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 these fireworks we can't control. Them. So we don't know whether there's monotonicity in alpha. And yet, in, intuitively, we're in that domain of probability and mathematical physics where it's obvious there should be monotonicity in alpha in some sense. Obviously, the longer people are infected, the more people they're going to infect, and that's the disease is going to spread. So you think it's obvious, and yet it's not true. So if something is is not you, if something should be obvious but you can't prove it, is that positive indication that it might be false or not? That's not clear. I mean, there are a number of examples in both directions in mathematical history. Uh, so we don't know whether it's monotone, uh, and we certainly can't prove it. So we don't know in particular whether there's a critical value of alpha. Um, nor do we know where, when alpha is sufficiently small, can the infection continue forever? We don't know. We can do the other bit. When alpha is sufficiently large, the infection definitely dies out with probability of one. That's the branching process argument which still works. And in particular, we're uncertain what happens in one dimension uh, in this particular case. Now, um, you might wonder about, uh, this is B, not A, but A just says there are more general situ situations which you can study, but B is an interesting question. How many inverted, you know, we're mathematicians, we say if A, then, what about if not A? Now, infected, or they move at the beginning, and then when they become ill, they, 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 they stop moving. How about you move when you're well, and you're stationary when you're infected? Why not try that? And that's reminiscent of DLA, some of you know about. You have, when, when a point is, becomes, you know, it moves around, it gets trapped. And once it gets trapped by proximity to somebody who's been previously trapped, it, it grows a crystal. And the question in DLA is how does that crystal grow? And it's a very hard and very uh, captivating problem of, of probabilistic physics. So delayed diffusion, I think, is a different game. Uh, delayed diffusion with, with, the fact, with the assumption that you move only when you're well and not when you're ill is a different game. And we will see in delayed diffusion, we will see the growth of the growth of bodies and how those bodies grow. We, we don't know, we haven't thought about. And that, I think, is the right place to end. But to say that um, uh, there is the related paper of Duvel and Sly, uh, which I've only recently become aware of. And Duvel and Sly, they solve um, these problems in their version of the diffusion model. Uh, um, but their, their solutions are uh, definitely not elementary. They're quite complex. Um, I, I haven't understood them. Uh, and I think there is work to be done to, in, in this area to understand the progress of the Valiant slide and how it can help us in this model for COVID. So I'll stop there and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey, for the great talk. Um, are there any questions for you? Well, I warn you, if you do ask me a question, do speak up. My hearing is as good as it needs to be. Putting a distribution on the radii of, of the circles 
uh, help in the analysis or in a complicated picture? Uh, so, uh, a, a natural extension, um, which isn't quite the same as that, um, is that um, as, as a snail diffuses, as a snail moves, uh, he, he, they're infected, uh, what is the infection rate? A, a natural way to say it would be to say that there is some function which governs the geometry of infection. So for example, if I'm here and you're there and I'm ill, uh, and, and one way of doing it would be that, so I'm at x, you're at y, so the vector that leads from me to you is y minus x then there is some function of that vector which governs the, um, the possibility of infection. But there could also be a constant in front of that which, which indicates the degree of my infection or the likelihood this takes place. Uh, and then the, the, the important assumption is that the function be integral. Uh, otherwise, I can infect infinitely many people and you, know, you get into trouble uh, if it's not uh, uh, integrable. And then there's a parameter, and the parameter out the front you can think about as the thing that governs the rate of infection. And then everything goes through. And that, so that's a very natural thing to do. And that, 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 that takes away the hardness, the toughness of, being, of, of looking at the unit disk. Um, the toughness arises because it's on the edge of a percolation model, and suddenly, if you, go, if, if you have, it, it's illustrated by the fact that if you have an infinite continuum percolation cluster, they all become instantaneously infected. But if you have a, if you soften that by taking the function to be the indicator of the unit circle, for example, and then you have an extra parameter which measures the intensity of infection, then you have an extra parameter and everything continues in the usual way. But that's not the same thing. I think a version of your question might be if each snail has a random distance. Um, then um, the answer would have a <laughs> A long answer, but a different question. Hi. May you? <clears throat> no, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. No, but I can still hear you. I mean, oh. oh, yes, thank you. So, it was a great talk. Thank you very much for this enlightening presentation, uh, which related the, the epidemic processes into percolation theory, which is an amazing theory. Um, and just more practical, you see, I wanted to know whether there is, did you even tell how a direct, about the direct relation between your model, I mean this percolation type of model, to the SEER model, where you have uh, two main parameters. The first parameter is the rate of infection, and the other parameter is the rate of removal. I think there was a, it's a close relation to what you said, right? So the point is that then you have the basic production number of the infection, which is the ratio of the two. So is it also the same here? I mean, per relation here. Um, so I'm, so by, by SIR, I guess that's the acronym for SIR, what I would call the SIR. Right, yes. So this is a type of SIR model, of course, but it's an SIR model plus a spatial, plus a spatial element. Um, and the, um, I suppose you could regard the work as a, um, an explanation in the spatial context of the meanings of those two parameters. So the, um, the, it, 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 it's a much more complex model than a normal SIR model. So you, one can't simply relate the, the, existence or non, or the existence of a pandemic to the ratio of two numbers because it depends where people started and how they move. Um, so I think I regard it as a, uh, as a more refined version of the classical SIR model, which adds space and adds movement. Uh, of course, any reasonable, we t typically one thinks that as the, um, as the infection rate increases, the infection will get bigger, and as the death rate increases, the infection will get smaller. And one of the morals of the lecture is that we can't always prove that. Yeah. <coughs> That's a good question, like, uh, so did you have the chance to somehow to calibrate, to uh, fit your model to real data because special, that's the point, special what we do in this SIR model, we just have the spatial distribution in different regions in Bulgaria, and now it would be very interesting, so, because it gets really complicated. Well, I guess, I guess we, we can test this by whether or not this paper would be accepted in the Annals of Applied Probability. <laughs> um, and um, uh, the, um, 
It's um, because, because, I mean, our paper is very much a work of theoreticians, not of applied science. Mm -hmm. So it's not been tested against data. And I think testing it against data would never at the moment be, it's not sufficiently refined to test against data. I remember many years ago in the 80s, 70s and 80s, um, understanding something about how real probabilistic models could be tested against data in certain artificial, I mean special, but well, I shouldn't say artificial, special but real uh, situations. And I'm thinking in particular of the Soviet Union and of Iceland. And in the Soviet Union, one could test models because in those days, the only way, the distances between cities were so great that everybody went by plane. And because of the, uh, the data collection system of the Soviet government, one could find out how many people went by plane from town A to town B on any particular day. And so one can actually build um, models involving disease uh, between towns, which were aggregated within cities, and the question was, what is the spread of infection between cities? One had enough data to build models and test them against the data. The other example I remember David Kendall talking about once was the passage of disease in Iceland, because Iceland is essentially one-dimensional, because nobody lives in the middle of Iceland. The disease only goes around the outside. So then, again, you have a number of, uh, number of uh, um, places of habitation around the outside, and you can model, you can understand, you can model a one-dimensional epidemic quite, quite well, I mean, using mathematics, and you can test it against data. In this situation, the concept of a sort of homogeneous city is a very interesting one. First of all, the next problem, I mean, it's easy to think of problems, isn't it? No, I mean, the answer is no, I don't know how to do it, and it hasn't been done, but the, but the, uh, but the questions are very natural. It, it, you see, one of the reasons we thought about this was because all the discussion, all the discussion at the moment of monitoring of disease, you know, the question, the, the, one of the problems was, of course, to build an app for mobile phones when they became close. It wasn't so much the disease necessarily that we were interested in, it was also what the monitors would say. You know, the monitors, they, they, they tell us we're in trouble whenever we're within a certain distance of somebody who's previously bound to be in trouble. And how do you model that? And of course, the modeling is only going to be good in a, in a fairly homogeneous population. For example, in a city, one might try. Because between cities, the interactions are very different. But it's one more complication. The parameters of the model depend on the time. I mean, this rate of spreading of the disease depends on the time. So you have to, to get this uh, dynamic percolation. It would be very interesting. Is there such theory? I mean, of when the parameters of percolation they change? Well, it's a, it's a, you can regard this, one could regard this as just a very first step in that direction. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, perhaps if we have any further questions to Professor Grimmett, we can ask during the coffee break at 11. Um, we have one more round of applause for Professor Grimmett. black in this dog and white uh, for non-infected vertices. 
Uh, and uh, so bootstrap replication is going to be a cellular automaton, which means that you will run in discrete, it's a discrete time uh, synchronous dynamical system which does the same, uh, performs the same rule at each vertex uh, in a translation invariant way. And our rule of the day will be the following. Uh, so, oops, oops. Um, so the rule of the day is that, that you will become infected if you have at least two infected neighbors. Uh, moreover, we will, uh, in the first, uh, in the first uh, part, we will have a growing set of infections. So whenever you are infected, you stay infected forever. Uh, all right, so let's see what that gives uh, on an example. This will be a growing set of infections. If this is my initial state, um, then uh, on the first step, I claim that these are the vertices that will become infected. And uh, let, let's check why. So if you look at this one, you have two black neighbors, which is uh, okay enough, so it will become infected. This one has three, that's more than enough, so it will also become infected. This one has just one, so it will not become infected. Okay, so, uh, and then you iterate this. All the red guys become black, and uh, you repeat. So on the second step, these are the, the ones that will get infected, and so on and so forth. And so as you might notice, this process likes creating rectangles. So uh, these, this bunch at the bottom is trying to create uh, this rectangle, while this one here is kind of stuck. However, when two rectangles are close together, they start interacting, and they merge to form an even bigger rectangle. So this is really what this process actually does. Uh, so in this uh, particular example, you can check that everything will be done. Um, okay, so a few words about, uh, about uh, why one cares about this model. So you can view it as a very naive model for propagation of infection on a spatial graph, but uh, I think that's a bit too naive. A bit less naive, you could say, uh, you could put it on a different graph. And uh, you can say this is a model for the propagation of some news or some opinion in a social network, uh, and people actually do this nowadays. Uh, but that's not what, not our our approach. Uh, initially, this was introduced in the late 70s, uh, you know, beginning of the 80s. Uh, this was used in statistical physics as a simplification of the low temperature or even zero temperature dynamics of the Ising. Uh, and indeed, studying this was a good first step towards understanding the, the Ising model dynamics. And we'll see yet another motivation from statistical physics in the second part of the talk. Uh, so this is really going to be kind of a prerequisite for studying these kinetically constrained models that I will introduce later. Uh, okay, so this is our model, I got this one here. Uh, what do we want to know about? So we were, we we're going to study just some uh, very basic observable of this, which is the, infect, the first infection time of the origin. The origin is, of course, no special vertex. Uh, so this is going to be some integer, possibly infinite, if the origin stays healthy forever. Uh, and, okay, so, so far everything is deterministic. Uh, let's introduce a bit of probability. We'll do so only in the initial condition, uh, in the simplest possible way. So we just take a product Bernoulli with uh, parameter Q between 0 and 1. Uh, and so each vertex is in initially infected with probability Q, independently of everyone else. Uh, and we will be particularly interested in what I call the low temperature regime, which is uh, the regime Q going to 0. We will see in a second why, but it's probably already quite easy to imagine why. Uh, so we are interested in when you have very few infections, are they going to propagate or will they just uh, basically uh, become stationary uh, immediately and not do uh, Alright, so I hope the model is clear again, but uh, feel free to stop me. So the first rigorous result of this model is uh, from 87 by Arnold van Enter. Uh, and it tells you why we are interested in the low temperature regime because this model has, uh, in a sense, a trivial phase transition uh, in the same sense as, as in the previous talk. Uh, so for any positive, uh, strictly positive Q, almost surely the origin will become infected at some point. Uh, and of course everything will become infected. Uh, 
so this is quite quite easy to show. I will directly uh, skip to the first uh, to the first uh, quantitative results on this, um, which were due to Eisenman and Lebowitz. Uh, so what they showed is, uh, is this, so I'll systematically state, uh, put my statements in this form, so what you should read here is, uh, so for some constant C and C, as Q goes to zero, which is the low temperature regime, with high probability, meaning with probability going to one, uh, this, uh, this inequalities, uh, these inequalities hold. Uh, okay, so th this is now a random variable. Uh, the infection time of the origin is random variable because the initial condition. Okay, so uh, what they say is that this is exponentially large in 1 over Q uh, with two different constants uh, in the two bounds. And I will tell you how this is proved because I introduced some, some ideas that will be important to us. Uh, so for the upper bound, what you need to do is to give a way of infecting the origin quite quickly and show that that is relatively light. Uh, so here I will draw some infections, they will all be initially infected vertices, but I will draw them one at a time so that you see the structure. Uh, so the, okay, let me infect this, this, and this. If I do that, then uh, this guy here will become infected on the next step because I have these two. Uh, so I will get a 2 by 2 square. Uh, then if I have at least one of these two guys that is infected, I will also extend that square upwards. Remember, you can view one single infection as a one by one square, and so it merges into this larger one, you extend it upwards. If you have at least one of these two, then you extend it also to the right. If you have, uh, now you get a three by three square. Now if you have at least one of these three, uh, and at least one of these three, you get a four by four, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, notice that this becomes very easy when the size becomes much larger than 1 over Q. Remember, Q is small. Uh, because, well, typically you will just have the infection on the side and also on this side and so on. So you can expect that this will just uh, have a finite probability of occurring all the way to infinity and it's very easy to compute. Uh, so the, the event that I drew here has... What was going on? as exactly this probability, uh, then you can uh, approximate this product by, uh, by an integral, which happens to have this nice value, uh, and uh, you get this for the probability of this event that I drew happening all the way to infinity. Uh, right, so if you truncate this event a bit, because I just told you that it's very easy to, for it to keep growing once it's big, uh, what you get is that Typically, this event will occur uh, somewhere at, so its probability is this, so it should occur at distance from the origin, which is typically exponential by square over 6q, because we're in two dimensions. That's the factor of 2. Pi square over 6 and pi, over, pi square over 3. Um, so this is what is going to give you this, uh, this upper bound with this big C, which is pi square over 6. All right. Uh, now moving on to the lower bound, uh, it's also not very hard. And so here the idea is to follow this uh, process of merging rectangles. Uh, so remember, we uh, when a rectangle gets uh, gets fully infected, it was because it was the result of merging two smaller rectangles, right? So if the origin becomes infected, it must be one such rectangle at some point. So let's trace back how it. Uh, so it must be, let's imagine it's a big rectangle because the rest is easy to deal with. If it's a very big rectangle, it came from two smaller ones. Let's take the bigger one of the two. And then that one was formed by two smaller ones. Let's take the bigger one of the two, and so on and so forth. And so tracing this back, you can see that you will see at some point a rectangle of any size you choose up to a factor of Right, so we will choose the right size, which is what I call the critical size, 1 over Q. Uh, so we know that we will see somewhere an, a rectangle which is what we call internally filled, so it will become infected only using infections which are initially inside of it, of that size. If you can think of a square. Uh, now the problem is that that's extremely unlikely. 
Uh, and uh, an easy way to see that is that if you have two white, completely white columns, they will definitely isolate the two parts of your rectangle. Uh, so this is not allowed. And uh, if you have a square one, 1 over q by 1 over q, this has exponentially high probability of happening somewhere. The easy exercise. Uh, so this tells you exactly that uh, this such a rectangle will have to be exponentially far away from the origin in the initial, uh, in the initial configuration. And this is what is going to give you this lower bound, because you need to wait a long time to see that it is somewhere very far away. Uh, okay, so that's nice, but uh, a breakthrough came uh, 15 years later by Holroyd, who proved that in fact there is a sharp, uh, a sharp constant here in the exponent, which is pi square over 18, uh, not pi square over 6. Uh, so let me tell you a bit about how he proved this. I will not tell you how he proved the lower bound, which is the harder one. The upper bound is quite easy. Uh, so here's what, what he did. You need a better mechanism for uh, propagating this infection. And uh, this mechanism goes as follows. Let's imagine we somehow got some, some small square infected. It doesn't really matter how. And we want to make it grow. So before, what we used to do is grow one line at a time. One line here, one line here, one line here, one line here, one line here and so on. So here we won't do that. We'll grow several columns one direction, like this. Uh, so what you gain by doing this is that you don't have to have an infection on every single column, but it suffices to have an infection, at least one infection, every two consecutive columns. Okay, that's uh, not hard to check. Uh, so that's nice because you're kind of paying only for half of them, so that's what makes it better. But what makes it worse is that if I go back to this uh, product here, it's as though I'm keeping this k fixed uh, and I'm multiplying many times the same factor. So if I just keep doing that to infinity, in the end I'll get zero for the entire product. So I shouldn't do that. I should just do this for a while and then I should switch direction because my uh, columns are not growing. And if I want to make them grow, I should grow uh, rows instead. So here I ask for an infection on every two consecutive columns. Here I ask for an infection on every two consecutive rows, and then, then I switch again and again and again and again. Uh, and uh, from here, from this picture, getting this, uh, this result is just a matter of uh, choosing this size right, uh, but uh, you really don't need to be very careful to, to do that. Um, all right, so this is the, the upper bound. Now, this result was particularly striking uh, from the point of view of what we call the bootstrap percolation paradox that I want to tell you a bit about. Uh, so it was already present before that and it kept going after that, but it was particularly uh, striking here. So bootstrap percolation paradox is the fact that, uh, so this is, this is a cell door dungeon. It's very inviting to simulation. It's basically made to be simulated. So immediately uh, people started simulating this and they made predictions based on simulations. And the paradox is that every time, every single time somebody did a simulation and made a prediction based on that, they were wrong. So the, there are tens of papers uh, on this and they were always wrong. Uh, and, and this keeps going. I don't know how, why, okay. I mean, we will see a bit of why. Um, but so here it was particularly striking because so here I gathered a few predictions for the constant pi square over 18 before it was known. Uh, okay, so there's a bunch. Uh, this one is even after, it, so I, I won't uh, explain why, but never mind. So I won't go over them. This is my favorite one. Uh, so 0.245 plus minus something very small. And then uh, 15 years later comes somebody and tells you no, theorem, it's 0.55. And of course, people wanted to know why, what is the problem with this? Um, so, in an attempt to explain this, Grabner and Polaroid uh, sought to, to see how fast this convergence is. They wanted to uh, tell you what the error term is, and they proved this upper bound uh, with uh, some constant root. Uh, so, the, the, the proof here is, uh, is again not hard. You just need to look at this picture, allow not fix this le these lengths, but allow them to vary a bit so that you gain a bit of entropy. 
uh, and you do your computation right, you are going to get out of that entropy this, uh, this second. Uh, you can look at, uh, at my preprint from this morning for uh, a version of that, uh, if you're interested, but it's, it's really a very simple computation. Uh, what's uh, much more important is how you interpret this result. So the way you interpret this, if you uh, just want to do this uh, naively, to simulate this naively, what you will do, you know what your computational resources are, maybe you can wait for 10 to the 10, waiting for 10 to the 10 means that you can probably afford a Q which is 1 over 20, something like that. If Q is 1 over 20, root Q is 1 over 5, uh, and then if this constant is not really small, then definitely you're going to perturb this pi square over 18 quite a bit. Okay, so this tells you that uh, this might be a reason why you don't get good results from simulations. Um, right, so uh, then guess what? People wanted to know what is the second term. It seems to be a power of q between 0 and a half. So they did simulations, and they predicted something, and they were wrong. Uh, so this was proved by Gravenhoer and Morris, who showed that the right power here is root q up to a log factor. Uh, and then you will probably uh, guess that people wanted to improve that, so here I'm crediting them a bit too much, but let's say that they proved 5 halves. Uh, anyway, so then people wanted to know what is the power of the log between 5 halves and 0. Uh, they did simulations, they came up with something between 0 and 1. Uh, so uh, we were happy, uh, and this was again disproved by uh, Rob Morris and myself. So we showed that this is uh, a really a constant root q. Uh, so far, it's between two different constants. Uh, I'm not aware of anyone having simulated for to get this constant yet. I'm looking forward to that. Um, so I won't tell you how this is proved because I didn't tell you how lower it's lower bound is proved, and this is much harder. Uh, but uh, instead, let me tell you something much more accessible, namely a uh, result about the, uh, the critical window. So what I'm saying here, that this is what, uh, the cumulative distribution function of the infection time. So what I'm saying here is that the time, when you take the ratio of the time when you are nearly sure that you are not yet infected, and the time when you are nearly sure that you are infected, uh, this ratio is not, uh, not enormous. Some, at most, some polynomial in Q, and I think this power you can put three if you don't uh, if you don't make any effort. So if you put all these on uh, these two theorems on a picture, uh, what you get is this. Uh, so this should be a sketch, not a plot, because I've never simulated this. Uh, but it's a sketch of the cumulative distribution function of the, uh, the infection time of the origin. So the Polaris result tells us that the limit of this plot should be a flat line at 0 to here, and then it should jump to 1. Uh, but for finite values of q, small, what you should, uh, should expect it to see is something like this. Uh, so in terms of the relevant parameter. And this uh, should really uh, tell you why you see results like this when you do uh, naive Monte Carlo, which is what people unfortunately do. Uh, so if you just uh, simulate this naively, you take your solid automaton and you run it, uh, you run it maybe a hundred times for the same parameter just to see what values of this infection time you get. Uh, and you do the statistics of that, you will see that all your values will be somewhere around here. Uh, so you will happily conclude the, the limit is here plus minus this small thing, and you will be completely wrong because you haven't seen this uh, systematic error that you can't get out of the simulation. Okay, so uh, I hope this uh, this was clear and I didn't lose anyone. But in case I did, now is a great moment to wake up because I'm about to move on to. Uh, to kinetically constrained models. Uh, so this is the, the Fredericks and Anderson uh, two-spin facilitated model, which uh, is now going to be, uh, so we're moving a bit away from the previous setting, so this is going to be a continuous time Markov process on the same state space, this one. Um, so it's no longer going to be synchronous and it's no longer going to be monotone. Um, both in the, in the immediate sense that infections will be able to disappear 
and also it will not be monotone in the sense that uh, that Jeffrey was, uh, was uh, talking about. So it's not going to be a contractive uh, process. Anyway, uh, let me first tell you what it is. Uh, and let me first start, so uh, okay, I need a parameter, that's the parameter Q, uh, just like before. And let me start by recalling the Glauber dynamics that probably many of you have seen. Uh, it was also mentioned uh, earlier, uh, well, yesterday. So uh, the Glauber dynamics is a very simple thing. You just uh, have a Poisson clock at each vertex, uh, and uh, okay, so it rings at exponentially distributed intervals of time of meaning one. When it rings, you take out your favorite coin. Your favorite coin has two sides, a white side and, a, and the black side. It's biased. Uh, when you toss it, it, fall, it gives you black with probability Q, and white with probability 1 minus Q. Okay, so when, you're, when your clock rings at a given site, you change the state to what the coin tells you. And you keep going like that. Okay, so this is uh, extremely easy to analyze. Uh, you have it's easy to check that the product Bernoulli measure is reversible for this model. Uh, and uh, it's just a product chain, so you can say everything you want about it. Um, okay, so we will add only a slight twist to this, uh, but it makes all the difference in the world. So the Fredericks and Anderson model uh, asks, so you, when your clock rings, before tossing your coin, you first look around. If you have two black neighbors, you toss your coin and you do just like in the Glauber dynamic, so you change the state to what the coin tells you. If not, you don't do anything, you just stay what you are and you wait uh, until somebody comes to give you those infections next to you so that you can change. Okay, so you should expect that this should be kind of slower. Uh, so this model is quite trickier and you can see this already from the point of view of, uh, of invariant measures. So the product Bernoulli measure with this parameter is still reversible. Uh, however, it's not the only reversible measures. There are lots of them. For example, the direct mass on the whole healthy configuration is clearly invariant because nothing can move. Uh, and there are many others. Uh, right, and as I said, it's also not attractive. We make more an attractive interactive particle system, which makes it quite hard to, to tackle. All right, so let me uh, show what uh, this gives on an example as before. Uh, so here I took some initial condition. This is not synchronous, so clocks ring one at a time. Uh, maybe this is the one that rings first. Uh, so I see that I have two black neighbors, so I'm allowed to update. I toss my coin, it gives me white. And so I put white, and maybe this one rings. I have two black neighbors. I toss my coin, this time it gives me black. Uh, oops, okay, that's a bit too much. Uh, yeah, so we were here. Then maybe this one rings, I have three black neighbors, I toss my coin. Uh, oops, yes, it gives me white and I get, uh, I put it. Then if the clock rings here, uh, I don't need my coin because I have just one black neighbor, so I, I don't do anything. Uh, and so on and so forth. So you probably see that this is uh, this should be slower. For example, these two guys at the top seem quite isolated, so it will probably take quite a while before I can change them. But I can change them. Uh, right. So we would like what what do we want to know about this? Well, basically the same things. Uh, we want to know the uh, the infection time of the origin is a is a nice observable, uh, which is now continuous vari uh, variable, but uh, Never mind. Uh, so, okay, for those who are uh, into Markov chains, you may want to replace everywhere I say infection time from now on by uh, the relaxation time of this process, or the inverse spectral gap, uh, but uh, I just find this more intuitive. Everything works out. Right, so th this is a model from Glassy Dynamics. Uh, it was introduced uh, by, you can guess who, um, in the 80s to model uh, the dynamics of glassy materials without uh, taking into account the static interaction. So this is the goal of this, is to have a completely trivial uh, reversible invariant measure, this one, but reproduce some, uh, produce some glassy phenomenology using these dynamic constraint of having at least two, uh, 
lightning. Um, right, so what we will take is that I didn't tell you what initial condition we will take. We will take the same one as before. Uh, so product Bernoulli uh, with, with parameter Q. But here I emphasize that I'm making a very non innocent hypothesis that I'm taking the same value Q as the one of my coin appearing here. Okay, so I'm assuming that I'm starting at equilibrium, at this invariant metric. Uh, and I'm by no means doing this because uh, one wouldn't be interested in knowing what happens out of equilibrium for a model of glass, uh, because that's kind of by definition out of equilibrium. Uh, instead, I'm doing this because it's much more tractable to work at equilibrium. So the, the very first uh, result out of equilibrium for this model is from last December by Fabio, Martinelli, uh, Fabio Tuminelli and, uh, and myself. Uh, but uh, it's only in the high temperature limit, so again, perturbative uh, a lot in the, in the spirit of, of last talk. Uh, but for this talk, we'll only focus on the equilibrium set. Okay, so, but then we will counterpart we will focus on the interesting regime, the physically interesting regime of low temperatures, so Q going to zero. Alright, uh, any questions so far on the model? Hope not. Okay, feel free to interrupt. Uh, now the first uh, rigorous result on this uh, came only in 2008, even though there were lots of, uh, there was lots of interest in physics by Cucrini, Martinelli, Roberto, and Toninelli. So from now on, all the Toninellis are Cristina Toninelli. Um, so what they proved is the same type of result as for Lutzer percolation in the sense that there is a trivial phase transition for any positive value of Q, almost truly you become infected at some point. Uh, and this tells you why we care about the low temperature regime. You expect this uh, infection time to explode as Q goes to zero, and you want to know the scaling of that. Right, this is a standard uh, statistical physics question you would ask. Uh, so to do this, they use the bisection technique that I won't tell you about, but it gives you a quantitative uh, upper bound, uh, which is this one, so with uh, an exponential constant over Q5. And they also gave a lower bound, which should look familiar. Uh, so this, com this is very easy, uh, and it comes directly from bootstrap. Uh, so the, what, what they use to, to, uh, to get this lower bound is just the observation that what is the fastest way that the origin could possibly get infected. Well, if I'm very lucky and every time I have two black neighbors, I immediately put black, so my coin just gives me black, that's the fastest that I can go. Uh, and that's just what booster population does. Right? Uh, so then you are just importing the lower bound from booster population. Uh, all right, now uh, this was improved by uh, Martinelli and Tominelli uh, quite recently actually. Uh, so they showed that the right exponent that you should put in the, in the denominator is key to the 1 up to this log, uh, log curve. Uh, right, so to, to do this, the, the mechanism that is behind this upper bound is the following. Uh, so you should think of a frame of critical size, this 1 over Q. Uh, that moves towards the origin, so it starts somewhere very far away because it's very unlikely. Uh, and uh, you, what you do is you take uh, one of those, you create a copy of it just next to it, thanks to an infection that you find close by. Then you remove the first one, you place it on the, on the left, you remove that one, you place it here, and you keep going like this uh, until you reach the origin. So this is just the vague idea you have of this, uh, uh, of this result. So already all of this settled quite a lot of physical controversy that I won't go into. So again, people simulated and uh, uh, in this case they also did some, uh, some theoretical physics approaches uh, like field theory and, uh, and whatnot. Uh, so, but it used to give uh, different results, so they couldn't uh, agree on what should be true. Uh, but, uh, so the thing is that, as you notice, this is not even as precise as the very first quantitative result in bootstrap population, which was constant over Q here and constant over Q here. And of course, people were aware of those results, uh, 
uh, and uh, suspected that there might be a good link. Uh, so they made very much more t detailed predictions. So let me uh, mention a few of those. So already in the 80s, uh, Nakanishi and Takano uh, suggested that they should scale like exponential something over Q, and okay, based on simulations, they said that this something seems to diverge. They were not more precise than that. Um, a later writer suggested that this should be some constant over Q, which he didn't write in this way because Holroyd's result wasn't available at the time. But he suggested that it should be, uh, well, the probability of a, the inverse probability of a critical droplet in bootstrap percolation, which has exactly this. Remember, there was a factor two because of dimension. Uh, so this is not this is exactly the pi square over 18, but with a d. Uh, and then there should be another factor which corresponds to how fast such a, such a droplet can move. And he suggested that this should be exponentially slow. Uh, a bit later, Tuninelli, Girola, and Fisher, so this is Christina Tuninelli, while she was still a physicist, um, who, who suggested that this should be, okay, the first part is there, but the second one should be much faster. It should move a lot, a lot faster. Um, and uh, even later, Teomi and Trokev suggested that it should be 2 pi square over 9. Uh, so, uh, of course, all of this was not settled by what I just uh, explained, but uh, to, to, to deal with this, with, uh, together with uh, Fabio Martinelli and Christina Antonelli, we showed uh, this result, which tells you that the right constant is, is pi square over 9, and uh, we also bound the second order term uh, to be at most root Q. So this is still less precise than we know in bootstrap population, but it's, uh, it's a big step forward. Uh, right, so in particular, it tells you that only this, this prediction was correct. Uh, I personally find it quite amazing that they could conjecture this before even the bootstrap population second order term was known. So this was not known in bootstrap population at the time. Uh, and they, they don't say much about why they believe that. Uh, Okay, so uh, another way to write this uh, short, shorthand is that the, this Fredrickson Anderson infection time is about the square of the booster population one. And this result should be, uh, this relation should hold in some greater generality, uh, though not, not extreme generality. So it has its limits. Uh, but let me not go into those universality considerations. Uh, right, so in the remaining time, I want to tell you a bit about the proof, uh, starting with the lower bound, which is going to be quite easy for us, given what I've already told you. Uh, so for the lower bound, you want to say that the origin does not become infected fast. Okay, so notice that in order of definition first, I say that the origin is locally infectable if I can infect it only using in the kinetic electric strain model, so this Fredericks and Anderson model, if I can infect it only using infections which are within distance 1 over Q. Uh, ignore any blocks if you, if you like. Uh, okay, so locally infected. Of course, tautologically, if the origin becomes infected, then before that it must become locally infectable. Okay? Uh, now, okay, could it be the case that the origin is in the, in the initial configuration, the origin is locally infectable? Well, the answer is no, uh, nearly no, in the sense that if in the initial configuration I am locally infectable, remember the initial condition is just product Bernoulli with parameter Q, it's the same as what we have in bootstrap program. And if I can, I can infect the origin in bootstrap population if and only if I can do this in the Fredericks and Anderson model. Right, just running and putting black all the time. Uh, but I know in bootstrap population, we, we already discussed that, that the origin will not become infected until an exponentially large time, and not just some small polynomial. Uh, so this will definitely not be the case in the initial group. Okay, so before I infect the origin, I will need to have a first time when the origin becomes locally infected. And uh, okay, so what happens at that point? Necessarily, uh, an infection just arrived at this distance, roughly one over Q, from the origin and allowed it to become locally infected. 
Okay, so this means that uh, there is a, in this rectangle's process, there should be a rectangle which is internally filled that contains the origin and also the site just arrived close by. So this is exactly a rectangle of critical size, one over Q, containing the origin. <coughs> and uh, quite fortunately, that's exactly what we spent all our energy with Rob Morris down the probability of such a uh, droplet in bootstrap propagation. Uh, and we show this bound on that, which is basically the entire content of the lower bound in bootstrap propagation. And so here you just make a union bound on the clock rings close to the origin, and you see that you need to wait basically the inverse of this probability in time to see this event occur. Okay? Uh, so this is what gives you the, the lower bound. So uh, the upper bound we needed to work quite a bit more. Uh, so what you need to do there is uh, to come up with a definition of a droplet which has three nice properties. To start with, it should have the right probability, otherwise no goal. Uh, so the, this is the right probability. And uh, this means that the structure should resemble a lot of uh, It should be able to move fast because uh, that was the difference between the dominelli birolli fischer conjecture and uh, the writer one. So this is how the fact, as fast as we could get it. Um, but this can definitely be improved, at least in the logs, but uh, I'm not sure if it, they can be removed. Uh, and finally, you should not do what uh, Martinelli and Dominelli used to do, namely this create-delete uh, mechanism. So your droplet should be able to move without recreating itself, a copy of itself. Why is that? Because if we look at the lower bound, here what we were waiting for is to see one critical droplet at the origin. But if you do create delete, you, you are waiting to actually see two droplets at the origin. Right? When you arrive at the origin with your droplet, you just have the previous one there. So you would be waiting for the square of, the, of this probability, so you would be trying to prove uh, the Theomi and Choquet prediction, which is not true. Okay, so you don't want to do that. Okay, uh, so here's some uh, inspiration. Okay, I completely spoiled it. Uh, here's some inspiration on how such a droplet should move. I hope this will work. This is a little movie of an amoeba moving. So as you can see, it moves. You should see that globally it moves to the right. Some parts of it are uh, moving a bit faster, some are moving a bit slower. Uh, and it's doing this global motion just by rearranging its inside. So it's definitely not recreating another amoeba and then uh, doing something. But it's globally moving to the right, as you can see very clearly now. Okay, uh, so let's uh, maybe let me stop this. Um, so this is what our amoebas will look like. They're going to have this. Oops. No. Okay, that was even worse for them. Uh, so th this is what our amoebas will look like. They will have this multi-scale structure uh, with a core, which you can think of as completely infected, and then. Uh, in each of these rectangles, we ask exactly the same type of thing as Holroyd did. So we ask for at least one infection in every two columns here, and here, and here, and here. Uh, every, uh, at least one infection in every two rows here, and here, and so on. And uh, we also allow this to be, so this is an event I'm describing. Uh, we we'll define whether some region is a droplet. Uh, and I will say that my event also occurs if this it doesn't look exactly like this, but maybe uh, this thing on the inside can move up and down, uh, and uh, the, the thing on the inside, so I can, uh, can move left and right, and I do this on all scales. So this is really uh, a very flexible structure. Uh, and of course, the infections in here that I don't draw, they can be anywhere they want. Okay, so most of the work uh, goes into proving that you can reshuffle this structure very fast in this uh, exponential root q, one over root q time. Uh, but, so I won't tell you how that is done. It's uh, 
quite, quite complicated. But uh, instead, let me focus on the last part. Namely, okay, so you, you probably believe me that this has the right probability because it looks a lot like whole words construction. It actually has a slightly better probability um, because it's more flexible. This part is the hard one that I won't show you. So let me tell you a bit about the global motion without recreation. Uh, so to do that, uh, we introduced an auxiliary model, uh, which uh, we call coalescing and branching simple, simple symmetric exclusion, um, which has, as you guess from the name, three types of moves. Uh, you have an amoeba that just makes one step in some direction. Uh, you can have an amoeba that splits. Uh, so this is how they reproduce, creates an offspring. Uh, and we also allow amoebas to uh, cannibalize. So you take an amoeba, it meets another one and it eats it. Uh, and then you have just one amoeba left. And so these two things will happen a bit in, in a sense rarely. This one will happen at a low rate. I don't want to specify the rate, but this, this happens rarely. Uh, and then this one will happen very quickly, but the problem is that because you have low rate of splitting, you kind of have few amoebas around, so you rarely meet one to eat it. Okay, but in any case, what will usually happen is that you just move, uh, and there's nobody around, and that's it. Uh, so for such a model with the appropriate rates that make it reversible with respect to the product measure, uh, we could show, again with Fabio and Christina, this was done precisely for the purpose of this application. Uh, this is an analog of applied probability in that respect. Um, so what we could prove there is a bound on the relaxation time of this, uh, this uh, Markov process on a box of size such that you typically have one amoeba inside. Uh, so we, we actually proved quite a bit more. We proved Lord Sobolev and we treated any graph, but this is enough for the purpose of uh, the application here. Uh, so what this tells you is that uh, the time you need to wait for this process to mix is the inverse of the probability of one droplet, one, one amoeba. And our amoebas had exactly the right probability. Uh, so this one, and so this is what will give you uh, the, the right uh, upper bound in the end. Okay, so I, I know this was a bit fast, uh, so uh, I won't dig more into that. Uh, so thank you for your attention, and uh, if you have any more questions, please. Uh, a universality theory for the hexagonal lattice it's a bit trickier but so that it definitely will matter exactly what rule you put if you put exactly two neighbors again uh, and so on so I, I, I don't remember exactly what should happen on the hexagonal lattice uh, but the arguments themselves are quite uh, quite robust and you can do a lot of variations but yeah I can't Say what the top of my head. Yeah, maybe it's a correlated question. So these two neighbors that you'd like to have affected in order for the updating count, so this comes from the geometry of the lattice, right? So if you change your base graph, then uh, probably it will be with some other number. Uh, right, so you, you yes, you can consider anything you like. And this will lead to a model which may or may not behave in the same way, uh, depending on the graph you like. So the, it's we can character, for example, on the on the triangle lattice, for example, you can uh, the, the right number to put so that it behaves in the same way is three. Uh, but uh, yes, I can't tell you immediately if you give me a graph and. Uh, and the rule of what's going to happen, but uh, there is a theory that it will allow you to, to do that. It also doesn't have to be, it doesn't need to be 2D, uh, it doesn't need to be regular, but then of course you will need to work and uh, to see if this needs to work out. I understand that 
lot of this is driven by experiments, uh, by observing simulations. Do you form your hypothesis based on experiments? I have never seen a simulation of this problem. <laughs> the very little. I guess I'd uh, love to talk. If I may ask a question, um, first of all, did, I noticed you also used the letter Q and you have these quantities that um, look similar to certain products. I think they're called Grammar Nugan and some of others. Um, are there any connections with Alpha X at all? Not that I'm aware of. And I guess the second question, and you mentioned that the, the, at least the two neighbor bootstrap percolation seems to be very difficult to make uh, predictions about. Is it also true of the Frederick and Anderson uh, model? Uh, if so, what do you think makes it so difficult to predict? Right, so for, for FA, I didn't, go more, I didn't go into that, but it's even more so the case. Right. Uh, so because it's generally for these glassy, glassy uh, structures, uh, because these relaxation times the time it takes for the thing to mix is uh, exponentially large. Uh, that already limits you quite a, quite a lot. Uh, so you can't go to large systems and you have very big uh, finite size effects. Um, so yeah, I think it's mostly about the, the, the limited capacity of, of computers. They don't go very far. Right. And they won't. This is, you won't see this particular routine ever. On right, the that's very just good. simulate uh, naively. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Okay, so we thank you. Okay, so um, our next speaker is uh, Liu Ben Vichev uh, from uh, Jean Monnet University and the Institute of uh, Camille Jordan. And he's going to be talking about label propagation on Erdos Renyi graphs. Well, thank you very much, Samuel. So I introduced you yesterday, you introduced me today, so I guess you're square. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this wonderful event and for inviting me. Uh, so I'll present a recent work with Marcus Kiwi from the University of Chile, from uh, my PhD supervisor Dieter Mitchell, who right now works in the University of Catolicia, again in Santiago, Chile, and Pablo Prado from the University of Toronto. Uh, so maybe uh, just to point out in the beginning some small inconsistencies. So my, in the uh, title of my talk, there are Erdős Renyi random graphs, and maybe you saw the program there. It's binomial random graph that's written. These are basically the same thing. So it's the same object. Uh, don't be confused. So the paper's title is contains binomial random graphs, but I thought that maybe Erdős Renyi graphs is uh, more standard. Uh, so I included this in, my, in the title of my talk. Okay, uh, so uh, first of all, I would like to start with some preliminaries on uh, community detection. Uh, and maybe just try to move this. Uh, um, it's not perfect because the title is hidden, but okay, so these are uh, so these are preliminaries of community detection. Uh, what does it serve for? Well, in graphs we So in graphs and complex networks in general, one is often interested to see nodes that are well connected, so groups of nodes that are well connected within the groups, but have not so many edges across the groups. So what is this used for? Well, think for example for um, platforms like uh, Twitter, Facebook, where you have many individuals and these individuals are connected by nodes. Well, of course, the friend of my friend has good probability of being my friend as well. The colleague of my colleague, for example, on LinkedIn, has good probability of being my colleague as well, etc. So these networks tend, to, uh, so the nodes in these networks tend to come together in uh, clusters, and one is interested to identify these clusters. Uh, for example, one application is 
marketing or social networks. So if you have a group of people, okay, you could sufficiently easily identify this group of people is uh, maybe a professional group. So uh, let's say the group of doctors, maybe it's a group of students, uh, maybe it's, uh, it's a group of friends that have a common hobby, etc. And uh, this will allow you to, to pick the correct advertisement for this group and, uh, and win money after all. Uh, okay. okay, so on the theoretical side, so we understood that we want to detect uh, these communities uh, in the graph, so what are the ways to detect them? Well, because of uh, uh, this applicability of the problem, there were uh, many community detection algorithms invented. Maybe the most classical one is due to Louvain. Um, and the algorithm uh, is uh, roughly as follows. So uh, you start with uh, an arbitrary community, maybe one single community. So you have a block of vertices. And to this uh, partition of the vertices, which here in our case is trivial, you associate a, par a parameter called modularity. So the modularity, I don't uh, want to uh, say what exactly it is, I won't want to give a formula, but it's roughly a parameter between 0 and 1. And if this parameter is close to 1, then you detect a graph that has uh, maybe a good community structure. If this parameter is close to 0, then you infer that uh, most probably the graph uh, doesn't have any communities at all. So the idea is to start <coughs> with this trivial partition in the beginning and to refine it little by little. So once you see that uh, you refined your partition sufficiently so that the modularity between consecutive steps doesn't change, you say, okay, maybe I found uh, the partition that uh, I would like to have. I found something that is maybe close uh, to the community structure of my graph and I stop there. Uh, so uh, this algorithm is uh, quite uh, widely used in practice, but for networks that have uh, macroscopic communities. And here by macroscopic I mean that they contain some sufficiently large proportion of the vertices and maybe here is a good moment to say that in this talk I will be talking only about asymptotic events. So the size of our graphs will be tending to infinity and we won't ask questions for graphs that have like 100 nodes or 1000 or 10,000 nodes. So this graph is good for detecting big communities. That's the, maybe the take-home message. Um, so people wanted to fill in the gap. So uh, they, uh, Aldeco and Marie, uh, a bit later, designed another algorithm that's uh, based on another parameter. So basically the difference between the two algorithms is, is in that in the first you try to optimize the modularity parameter and here you want to optimize another parameter that calls surprise. Okay, no surprise. Uh, this algor this uh, algorithm, and, let's say types of algorithms, work well on uh, graphs that have uh, some more refined community structure. But it so happens that if the graph has large communities, so Levant's algorithm manages to detect them, while the Aliko and Marina algorithm fail to detect big communities. So they tend to detect small communities, but once you have a big chunk in the graph, sorry, that is the same community, it somehow doesn't see it. Uh, okay, so maybe uh, another algorithm that's also modularity-based is the Wyden algorithm. And uh, maybe the one thing I'd like to say about it is that uh, so it acts a lot like Lovan's algorithm, so it starts with a partition, it refines it according to its modularity, but the thing is that uh, the Leiden algorithm tries to keep the communities well connected, so okay, as well connected as possible. Uh, so this makes it a bit more efficient. But it, again, uh, has a similar problem. Small communities cannot be found by Leiden's algorithm. And okay, 
uh, as I said, there are many, many algorithms for community detection. So these, the first three are uh, somehow optimizational. So they have several steps and they try to optimize something at each step. Uh, another type of algorithm is, for example, walk trap. So uh, as the name suggests, you have a graph, and on this graph, uh, so you uh, sample a vertex, uh, let's say you inform at random, and you start a random walk. And so the walk trap algorithm tries to detect communities in the graph based on uh, the geometry of this random walk, and more precisely, on, uh, so it looks at the steps of the random walk, and it's interested basically in blocks of vertices, and if you, if you have, say, a block of vertices that has uh, length, uh, I don't know, 10 times n, where n is the size of the graph, and you see that the same nodes repeat again and again and again on this chain of length 10n, so perhaps you can, we could infer that, uh, okay, the vertices that you find in this chain are uh, somehow better connected <coughs> within themselves than uh, to the rest of the graph. Okay, so this is, uh, these are only a few examples. And, uh, okay, so now it's perhaps the time to introduce label propagation algorithms. So there is an S uh, in the end, so it's not like one algorithm, but a family of them. Uh, so in general, as I said, you have a graph G on N vertices, so N will be large here. And, um, in the beginning, every vertex has a label. Uh, so this label will be from some totally ordered set, and uh, in general, you could think about the interval 0, 1, so some real number from this interval, uh, usually sampled in some way, so uniformly at random, or uh, if you prefer your labels to be integers, you could also <coughs> think uh, that the labels are uh, permuted uniformly at random among your vertices so that every label is attached to one vertex. Uh, so this will be the setting that we'll be working with, so we can maybe think about a discrete setting. Um, okay, so you, you have labels in the beginning, so you have some static picture, and this static picture will be updated. So how will it be updated? Well, uh, according to some mechanism, and here it's important that this mechanism is local. So what you do is, uh, okay, there are different local mechanisms, but let's say the most standard one is you take a vertex and you look at its neighbors. Okay, so this vertex, look at its label, so it looks at the labels of its neighbors, and uh, it says, okay, I have uh, two neighbors with label one, I have five neighbors with label two, I have 15 label, uh, neighbors with label three, and maybe uh, three with label four. So within my close neighborhood, so my neighbors and myself, I see that three is the most represented label. So if this is the case, I adopt the label three for the next stage. It's as simple as that. Um, okay, to define the model um, completely, of course, we should decide what happens in, case of, in cases of ties. So, of course, you can have that the label 3 is represented 15 times, but also the label 2 could be represented 15 times, and all the labels could be represented 2 times. Um, okay, but there are different tie-breaking mechanisms. Well, so sometimes you, uh, we decide to break ties towards smaller labels, sometimes towards higher labels, or sometimes uniformly at random. Um, so we'll see, uh, so first of all, um, this will finally be not so relevant for dense graphs, and this talk will be about graphs that are quite dense. Um, but we'll see, so uh, two settings. So one where we break labels towards smaller, uh, we, we break ties towards smaller labels, and second, where we break ties uniformly at random. Okay, and here you might wonder, okay, in the beginning we took a label set that's from 1 to n, so a random permutation uh, of the labels on the vertex set, 
how could we, so if we break this uh, also only uniformly at random at every round, so it wouldn't make much sense in the second round. So one important detail is that the first, at the first round, we will also break ties towards smaller labels. So once we do that, we will see some labels disappear, in fact many of them will disappear, and we will get some big chunks of the graphs or big groups of nodes that have the same label. Okay, so from that moment on, as I said, we can adopt two approaches. But the first round, we will always be breaking ties to a smaller labels. Okay, so why are we interested in this algorithm? Well. It's fast. It's in fact, uh, in many cases, much faster than uh, the approaches that I showed in the first slide. It's local, so locality is important uh, from application point of view. So you can easily program this algorithm. You can easily, uh, so you can run uh, simulations on a computer that are quite fast. Um, yeah, so the, the problem with this algorithm is that it's quite used in practice since uh, maybe more than a decade, but uh, people don't know why it works. So it works well, but so the question of why it works is was somehow neglected. So it's a bit like this programmer joke where you have a code and uh, the code might work or not, but you don't really know why it works or why it doesn't work in both cases. Uh, so that's what we are trying to, to understand, so why the code works. Uh, okay, so let me briefly present the, the random graphs that we'll be working on. Uh, so these are the Erdős Rényi random graphs where you have n nodes, again, uh, n is large. Uh, and between every pair of nodes, so, uh, or also called vertices, so either I have an edge uh, so with probability p or I don't have an edge with probability 1 minus p and you sample edges independently for different pairs of vertices. Uh, and okay, so uh, perhaps uh, some of you think, oh no, again, I'm just trying to random graph, so this is a model of, uh, that's maybe more than 60 years old now and it's not quite an applicable model, so why do you do that? Why do you continue to do it with any random graphs? Uh, so I agree that there are many other models that are more, that are applicable and applied in the sense that uh, Geoffrey presented this morning. Um, so the point here is the following. So it, studying this on the average for any graph has two important reasons. So first of all, um, the Erwin Schreni graph was an important probabilistic object where many techniques were introduced that happened to work in wider generality. But because the setting is so simple, so we often see the core of an idea that works for the Erwin Schreni graph and maybe some refinement of this idea could also work for, say, the stochastic block model or uh, some kind of Percolation, say the chung lu model, where vertices have weights, etc. So many techniques were invented in connection to this model and applied successfully to other models. Uh, okay, so the, the second main reason is that, um, okay, maybe you, uh, some of you have heard, I mentioned it, the, so the stochastic block model, one could think of the stochastic block model as an, maybe an applied analog of the Erdős Rényi graph. Let me briefly mention what it is. So in the beginning, uh, you divide your vertices into say into communities, but you don't want to uh, to do this after the graph is sampled. You do this in the very beginning. So let's say that you have three communities of vertices, and within the, these vertex groups. So you sample uh, edges, say, with probability p, and between the groups you sample edges with probability q. And you want q to be smaller than p, so you want your groups to be better connected within themselves, and you wish them to have uh, relatively, relatively few edges between the groups. Okay, so uh, we got questions from people. 
why don't you consider the stochastic block mode? Uh, the thing is that this algorithm works extraordinarily well on the stochastic block model. Simulations were made, etc. So it's perfect. It detects. Uh, so if we are a bit far from the detection, uh, the detection threshold where you really see that. Uh, so when P and Q. So I said that there are two probabilities. So if the probability within, uh, so of having an edge within a group is. Uh, very different from the probability of having an edge across two groups. So you really can see these communities and you can detect them by algorithms of everything. If the two parameters are close, so of course your graph looks more and more like an early friendly random graph. So at some point it becomes very difficult to detect if you really have the early friendly graph, so basically one group, one community, or you have the stochastic block model. So if you are away from this point, this algorithm works really, really well on uh, the stochastic block model. But we know that. So in the beginning we said, okay, we'll have communities. Then we run the uh, so we run our algorithm and we find these communities and we say, okay, we're happy. The point of our work is a bit different. So in that when you run the graph, it really there are no communities. We said, but if uh, so if uh, the average degree is sufficiently small, in fact, we see that communities arise by pure randomness. So you don't want to see them. You know that there are no communities there. But from time to time, because the graph is, is really, really big, so we call it density infinity, there are some small chunks that are better connected within themselves than with the rest of the world. Okay, so this is somehow confusing. Right? So you don't want to see communities, but you see them. So the goal of our work was to find a regime, so as, as big regime as we could, where no communities arise even by pure randomness. Okay, so I said that uh, this uh, model uh, was not well analyzed, and uh, so from, from what we know, uh, there are two mathematical works on this model, so you can uh, think of them as an upper bound and a lower bound. Um, so the first of them was a work by uh, Kotapali, Panajaru, and Sardash Mook, uh, which showed that uh, when the, so NT is the average degree, so the expected uh, degree of your random graph, okay. Uh, Formally speaking, is n minus one times p, but let's forget about minus one. Um, so, if your uh, <coughs> expected degree is large, then you see that the label propagation algorithm, where uh, so recall we start with different labels, so we start with n labels. Uh, we use the majority uh, decision rule, and in this setting, ties are broken always within uh, towards smaller labels. Okay, so for this setting, uh, this group of three people found that, uh, in fact, uh, so if our graph is sufficiently dense, so in the regime n to the three fourth plus epsilon, uh, so at least that uh, we have that the algorithm converges within two rounds. Uh, and uh, moreover, uh, it not only converges, but it will only converge towards the smallest label, so the label one with high probability. So, uh, where here with high probability means that when n tends to infinity, so the probability that the event that I'm talking about converges to 1. Yes. So you mean that everyone has the label 1? Yes, everyone has the label 1, so the entire graph. And this is a relatively easy argument, we'll see it in a bit. Okay, so uh, this paper was uh, also important for conjecture, so the, the three authors saw that uh, the same is true uh, when the average degree is a lot larger than uh, logarithm of n, and uh, maybe uh, people who could do random graphs uh, at least a bit in the audience, or even the others, maybe know that uh, in this regime the graph is connected. So, uh, log n over n is the threshold for connectivity of our graph, and basically uh, these three authors saw that, okay, if our graph is not only connected, but perhaps well connected, 
then uh, we will have convergence to only one community, but we are not strong enough, so we cannot prove it. Uh, okay, so at the later stage, there was a second a group of authors of Nierling, Langer, Pfister, Schaller, and Steger. They proved that this is uh, indeed not true. So uh, they show that there is a psilon positive fixed constant, so that if your average degree is at most n to the epsilon, then uh, not only the label propagation algorithm terminates with many communities, but so they are not only many, but they are polynomially many. So of course you cannot expect more because you have n vertices. But uh, this was somehow shocking because uh, okay, you have a well-connected graph, so your average degree is polynomial in n. And even though you, you have this well-connected graph that has uh, it has uh, bound diameter with high probability and everything, you still find many communities that are well-connected within themselves and not so well-connected with other communities. Okay, so our contribution goes in the direction of um, of the upper bound, so we wanted to decrease this uh, three fourths. And um, okay, so again, our setting is uh, so we have different labels from one to n. We work with the majority rule, but there is a small difference in our setting, and this is the tie breaking rule. So in our case, we uh, break ties towards smaller labels at the first step. And then we break ties uniformly at random. It so happens that this model is a bit easier to analyze, and we'll see that uh, in some cases it compares very well with the model where you only break towards smaller labels. So, what does our theorem say? Well, uh, you fix uh, a p so that your Erdős Schrenny graph has average degree between n to the 5 over 8 plus epsilon and a lot smaller than n, uh, then with high probability, five rounds are sufficient for our algorithm to converge. And it always converges towards one label. So now maybe the more interesting point in this result is that when the average degree is uh, of larger order, so this bigger, bigger means uh, really of larger order, then n to the two thirds, then uh, this label with, with high probability one, so over this is get label one after five rounds. And uh, if we are in the regime where the average degree is a lot smaller than n to the two thirds, then with high probability we converge to a label that is not one. So. Here in the statement, I don't mention what it is, so I will mention this uh, in a bit. Um, okay, so the question of uh, why uh, do we change the, the, the model so the tie breaking rule appears uh, here? So, can we say something about the regional dynamics? And the answer is yes, in the first regime. So, um, it's quite simple to see that if we break ties. Uh, towards smaller labels, then this is the best scenario for label one, right? So it is the smallest one. So uh, it, is, it is the one that profits the most from breaking ties towards smaller labels. And uh, okay, this this tells us that uh, if n p is a lot larger than n to the two thirds, then with high probability, again, the only surviving label after five rounds will be one. And uh, in the case when NP is exactly a order n to the two thirds, so it, it will have positive probability for the surviving label to be one. Uh, okay, so some comments. I, uh, so in the last sentence, I mentioned this regime where NP is exactly a order n to the two thirds. Uh, well, in this case, uh, the label is one with positive probability and not one with also with positive probability, but we can be more precise. So, uh, if we wish to describe the, the label that survives, we can do that, and it's this, so it's a random variable, and in this case, it is the index of a maximum of uh, okay, some uh, sequence of independent random variables that reads so uh, you have a sequence of IID centered normal variables, but you have the drift. 
So and so this drift uh, of course depends on the constant and it depends on the on the index of uh, the normal variable in the sequence. Uh, okay, so this is not a completely explicit description of uh, the distribution of this index, but okay, it's something that at least you can imagine. Um, okay, so in the regime uh, where one doesn't win with high probability, so we can in fact give the, the order of uh, the winning label. So this, uh, this order is something like n p cube to the minus one half. And uh, so you can uh, quite easily check that, uh, okay, when you have uh, equality here, so when p is exactly equal to n to the two thirds, so this means that p is n to the minus one third, and uh, this quantity here is, is constant. So we uh, kind of recovered um, uh, the intermediate regime. Um, and oh, okay, so I said order. Uh, this was not entirely precise because the constant uh, in front of n p cube to the minus one half is, is random. So basically, if you multiply by n p cube, uh, so root of n p cube, you obtain uh, some convergence in distribution to some, some uh, tight random value. And uh, maybe the third point that we uh, mentioned only in the concluding remarks of our work is that uh, 5 over 8, uh, as you may uh, suppose, uh, is not a sharp, uh, is, is not a sharp bound. Uh, we believe that uh, similar arguments should lead to something that's at least uh, uh, n to the one half, so the average degree being equal to n to the one half. Um, which is uh, really the, the limit of, of our technique and the reason is that uh, at this point the graph uh, becomes of uh, uh, diameter larger than 2 so it goes from 2 to 3 and uh, we have a problem with this for several reasons a bit technical that I, I won't mention right now um, alright so uh, now that we know the setting maybe it's a good place to ask if there are questions on the model or on the main statement. Okay, so if not, uh, maybe I could give some, uh, some ideas about the proof of this result. So we'll start with a simple lemma. And this simple lemma will happen to recover uh, the earlier bound uh, that's really 10 to the 3 fourths plus epsilon. Uh, and yeah, the statement is very simple. So we define some k that uh, may appear a bit magical at this point, but uh, okay, I'll try at least to give some intuition about it. Um, and uh, so it all happens that after two rounds of our pro procedure, uh, so of the more concretely of the label propagation algorithm, uh, then only the labels in the interval one, two of k will survive. And this is relatively easy to prove. Um, so uh, maybe here's a picture. Um, the idea is the following. We fix uh, some uh, vertex that uh, carried the label i in the beginning, where i is some label that is not in this interval, so larger or equal than k plus 1, and we fix some j. So let's consider the three vertices that are v1 that carries label 1 in the beginning, vi and vj. So what really determines the label of uh, the vertex vj after, so after two rounds is the following thing. So we look at the neighborhood of the vertex 1. So it has some neighbors. We look at the neighborhood of the vertex 2. That I, so I will then draw it here. So it has some neighbors, but some of them are connected to vertex 1. So this will get the label 1, so you take them out. Then you look at the vertex 3, so it has some neighbors, but some of them are neighbors to 1 and some of them are neighbors to 2. So you take them out, etc. So for the vertex i, if you want your vertex vj to get label i in the second round, so you want to look at the neighborhood of uh, vi, you want to look at the neighbors of uh, vi, and then you'd like to take out the vertices that are connected to v1, v2, up to vi minus 1. 
So okay, this is a bit complicated, so uh, it's sufficient to just take out the common neighborhood with V1. And once you do that, okay, so for the uh, average uh, vertex V and J that is neither among uh, the neighbors of V1 nor among the labels of VI, then you have to compare basically two binomial groups. Uh, so you have to compare two binomial variables. One of them is the number of common neighbors of V1 and VJ, and the other one is the number of common neighbors of VI and VJ, excluding this time the neighbor, the common neighbors with, with one as well. Okay, so uh, from this point uh, on, it's a really standard argument. You have good concentration for binomial variables, so you can show that the first variable, so the common neighbors of one and j, are really uh, more than the common neighbors of i and j that exclude the neighbors of one as well. So this means that the vertex j will not take label i. Okay, so this is for every every i and j uh, described here. So this means that okay, the label i will not survive with high probability. So the ones that remain are from one to k. Uh, okay, so uh, based on this uh, lemma, that's um, pretty uh, straightforward, but uh, it will be also pretty useful for our purposes. We divide, so the next step is to divide the vertices into levels. Um, okay, so what is the first level? The first level consists of the first 2k vertices. And you may wonder why 2k. So in the last level we talked about k labels that survive. This is purely for technical reasons. So if you wish to think about v1 to vk, you could. That won't change the, the nature of the argument. So b will be the neighbors of A and then C are all the remaining vertices. And maybe something important to mention here is that the size of A is a lot smaller than the size of B, which itself is a lot smaller than the size of C. So after all interesting happens interesting things will happen mostly in, in C. Okay. Um, so, as I said, uh, this uh, label propagation algorithm is uh, hard to analyze. And uh, we need to go around the, the difficulty, in, so the, the main difficulty in some way. Uh, and the main difficulty is that uh, you basically have all the vertices together, you have this exchange dynamics that uh, happens round by round, and uh, so there is no, how to say, there is no direction which the process goes, it's not uh, directed uh, in, in some sense. Uh, everything mixes up very fast. So um, the idea is to define an alternative procedure based on the first lemma. Uh, and this alternative procedure, uh, so what we, it will do is to say, okay, uh, I suppose that uh, my first lemma was correct, so I would expect to, after round two, to see only labels from one to k. So what we can do then is to say, okay, let's take this, uh, this set A that we defined in the previous slide and let's say that in the, first, uh, in the first step of the algorithm, the first round, we will only attribute labels to the vertices in A and B. So we don't care for the vertices in C for the reason that, okay, they will get some label that's not uh, in the interval from 1 to K. So it will be something different, but it will anyway disappear after two rounds. So let's care about uh, this uh, group of vertices in A union B. And we attribute uh, the labels of these vertices only based on the edges that go out of A. So the one that I, uh, that I depicted here. Okay, so this is after one round. So after this one round, what happens? So the vertices in A and B have labels in the interval from 1 to k. And then we wish to attribute labels to the vertices in C. Okay, how do we do that? Well, we only care about the edges from C to the set of vertices A union B. Why? Well, because these A union B are the vertices where uh, I can find the labels from 1 to k. In C I cannot find any such label, so I don't care about the edges there. 
And uh, again, uh, this is uh, by the lemma we just uh, we just proved. Okay, so how does this uh, process make things better? Well, the motivation is that uh, so in random graph theory, um, we often like to leave some randomness for later stages, uh, which allows us to prove concentration for certain random random variables that we expose later on. So in this, with this approach, we expose just a small, very small portion of the space in the first round. So only the edges that are incident to A. And in the second round, we only expose the edges that are incident to vertices in uh, A or B. Okay, so as we said, C is the, uh, so most of the vertices of the graph are in C. So this will mean that after two rounds, we exposed almost nothing of the graph. So most of the edges, uh, we don't know if they are there or not. Um, but okay, so there are several, so basically two main challenges uh, that remain. Um, so let's think about uh, about the second step. So we have our A, so we, we exposed the edges from A to B. Okay, and now in the second round, we want to decide the labels uh, in, the, in uh, the set B. So what do we do? In C, so after the first round, in C we have no vertices with labels from 1 to K. Okay, so we can ignore these edges. So then in B we have edges within this set, so between two vertices of this set that we did not reveal yet. And we have edges towards A. Okay, so if it was only B, then we would say, okay, we have uh, these labels in B, and then uh, we have a random graph that is unexposed, let's expose it. Okay, but the problem is that the edges towards A are still there. And most probably the vertices in A still have labels from 1 to basically to 2K. So this is one thing we should be careful about. So from the second step, uh, the labels in V are not attributed uh, entirely independently from the set A. And in the third step, the same counts for C. So the labels in C cannot be attributed entirely independently from the ones in B because there are some edges there and we expose them. Uh, the second main point is uh, difficulty that uh, I'll say is typical for random graphs. So it hides in a very uh, elementary observation. So one edge has to add vertices. Uh, okay, so if you want to decide some parameter for one of the vertices, in our case this is the label, so this edge, uh, roughly speaking, counts for this vertex. But it also counts for the other vertex. So in this, uh, in this setting, you get dependencies between every pair of vertices. Okay, so usually the way people uh, come around this difficulty is uh, when P is small, to say that, okay, so there is only a small probability that this edge here appears, and if it does not appear, well, the remaining edges from these two vertices towards the other ones are just independent, because there is only one edge that connects them. Uh, okay, so the second point is uh, relatively classical in random graph theory, so uh, I'd like to spend a bit more time on the first point. And okay, the first point uh, was the problem that uh, you have edges towards uh, groups that, uh, so if we are the second round from B to A, and if we are at uh, the third round from C to B. So we have these edges, we cannot ignore them. Um, so the, the essence of, uh, of our proof is that we say, okay, so we have these edges, but we also know the result, say, say uh, let's take B, and let's take the second round of the process. So we know what happens in B. So we know what group of edges approximately, so what group of vertices uh, approximately uh, takes label one, we know what's the size of the group of vertices that gets label two, we know the size of the group of vertices that gets label three, etc. etc. So based on this information, uh, and because uh, at the first round, remember, we break ties for smaller labels, so one will be basically most often 
very well represented label, so many vertices in label one, then there will be fewer vertices typically in label two, even fewer vertices with label three, uh, three, etc. So the thing that we have to prove is that the gaps between these groups are sufficiently large. Or otherwise said that they are well separated. Okay, let's see how this goes with uh, some uh, very easy computation. So uh, let's assume that the average degree is a lot larger than n to the two thirds. So we are in the first regime where one should, uh, should win. Uh, okay, let's take uh, the vertex one. So what is the distribution of this degree? Well, it's a binomial random variable, parameters n minus one and p. And uh, this uh, random variable has standard deviation that's uh, roughly root in p. Okay, so now let's take the vertex two. So the vertex two will give its label to many of its neighbors, but not to the ones that are already connected to one. Okay, so uh, how many of uh, the vertices should be connected to one? Well, roughly NP. So the, here NP is polynomial, so the average degree, uh, so the, the degree of every vertex is well concentrated around the, the average degree. So we can assume that there are roughly N minus NP vertices that remain non connected to one, and uh, they are connected to the vertex V2 with some probability P. Alright, and now let's look at the expected difference of the number of vertices labeled 1 and the number of vertices labeled 2. Well, because we are in the regime where the average degree is uh, so big, it so happens that this NP squared, so the, the expected difference, is a lot larger than uh, the sum of the standard deviations. So this means that, okay, for 1, you have a group of vertices that has size uh, uh, basically uh, NP and that deviates at uh, roughly root NP around this expected value. You have the number of vertices that you be labeled 2, so they are concentrated around this expectation and they wiggle a bit within root NP, but these windows are very far away. So this means that label 1 and label, so the number of vertices with label 1 and the number of vertices with label 2 will be, in some sense, uh, well divided. So you'll be able to guess immediately who is one and who is two. Okay, uh, sadly, or fortunately, I don't know, um, in the sparse regime, uh, this is false. So there, uh, the difference between the expectations of one and two is a lot smaller than the standard deviation. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, this means that basically label 2 can beat label 1 by pure randomness. And the same happens for label 3, label 4, etc. So, uh, in this case, we should be a bit more careful. So, we have these uh, x1 up to x 2k, which are the sizes of the vertex set that carry labels from 1 to 2k, respectively. And uh, we can show that, okay, we have these groups, but not all of them can be the maximum. So the groups that are towards the end, so the, let's say the 2 case one, it's already very penalized because of the fact that, okay, these vertices should not be connected to one, they should not be connected to two, they should not be connected to three, etc. They can be connected only to 2K. Okay, so based on this observation, we find some smaller K, uh, so, so some smaller, uh, integer that we call k star, which is such that only the uh, groups uh, that are labeled 1, 2, 3 up to k star, only they can be candidates for the maximum. Okay, so once we uh, manage to show that, uh, so once we manage to establish this uh, kind of truncation, then we work on the truncated process. And, okay, this truncated process, it, it has some dependencies between the variables, right? It's, uh, so, uh, if uh, the number of vertices with label 1 is very big, this will penalize the next guys. Okay, so, uh, to get rid of this dependency, so what we do is to couple this sequence uh, from x1 to xk star 
with a number of independent binomial variables. So we transition from a sequence of dependent uh, binomial variables to a sequence of independent binomial variables that have some drift. So of course the drift comes from the fact that if you are labeled uh, i, this means that you are not connected to the guys i minus 1, i minus 2, etc. Okay, so once we do this, we manage to analyze uh, this uh, binomial sequence with uh, IAD variables with a drift. And, uh, okay, so this being said, we, in the first case we were interested in the gaps between the groups. So this time we are also interested in the gaps between the groups, so in the, in the other regime. It's just that, uh, so we have to analyze the sequence of independent variables. And uh, okay, in this case it's a bit more technical, a bit more difficult to understand the gap, say, between the first and the second, then the gap between the first and the third, between the first and the fourth, etc. But this can be done. Uh, okay, and once we understand this on level B, so re remember we were at the second round where we care what the labels of uh, the vertices in B are, then we can apply the same thing to C based on a typical structure of B. So where here typical structure is the fact that uh, okay, we have some groups of labels and these groups of labels, their sizes are exactly as we expect them. So the sequence evolves in the, in the typical way we managed to prove uh, we managed to prove uh, once, okay, we managed to understand what I before. Okay, uh, of course, uh, one more time, so this typical structure of uh, the labels in B is different. So if the average degree is a lot larger than n to the two-thirds, we have this deterministic, uh, okay, deterministic in the sense that one is the biggest, uh, label two is the second largest, etc. So you know how this sequence is ordered, and in the other regime you don't really know how. The, who is the first maximum, you don't really know who is the second maximum, but you can estimate the gaps between these maxima. Um, okay, so I won't uh, go into details on how the process is analyzed at the third stage, so between B and C, and for the graph induced by the vertices in C. I'll just uh, mention that there is, uh, uh, or surprisingly, an amplification phenomenon. So, if you see that some uh, group is the largest uh, after, after one round, then, uh, okay, so uh, once you, are, you look at C, so these vertices in C, there are many of them, so almost all vertices are in C, and each of them has a slightly larger probability to get the, the largest label, than the second largest, and the third largest, etc. So from B to C, from the second to the third round, you see some amplification phenomenon in the sense that the largest group in B will become even larger when we make one more step in the algorithm and we go to C. Okay, so the, as the, the gaps grow, it becomes uh, more and more, uh, so the probability to get the winning label after one round becomes larger and larger. And, uh, okay, so after all, uh, we, we look at C at, uh, at the third round. So, recall the third round, so the first round we attribute labels from A to B. At the second round we attribute labels from B to C. And at the third round we attribute the labels within C. So this is the round where we have that the graph induced by C is completely unexposed. So, there was the amplification phenomenon, so the largest label is well separated from the second largest and from the third largest. So once we have this, once we prove that the typical structure is of this form, we condition on this typical structure and we manage to show, to show that, in fact, uh, this gap between the winner, so the most represented label and the other ones is so big, that uh, one more round is sufficient to make over to this in C have the same label. Okay, but now uh, we are happy. So why are we happy? Well, because the vertices in C are almost all vertices. 
And we end with, uh, with another um, simple lemma. So I say simple because the proof is simple. It's just a union bound over all sets of sufficiently large size. So the dilemma tells you that if you have a group of vertices with uh, 0.9 n, uh, so of size 0.9 n, and these all carry the same label, so two rounds are sufficient for this label to be carried by all vertices. Uh, and as I said, the proof is uh, quite simple. You just uh, look at how many uh, sets of size uh, 0.9 n you have in the graph, and you study what happens one step after uh, after the so in the beginning you have uh, this large set of vertices with the same label. You study one step, you get that almost all the vertices without a very small chunk are infected, or infected in the sense that they get the, the largest label. And after one more step, uh, you're done. All of them have the same label, which is the initial one. Okay, so I'd like uh, to finish uh, with a few questions. So um, we approach this problem uh, for the, in order to understand how far uh, down can we go and can we see the threshold for survival of a single label. In this sense, uh, our result is uh, both satisfactory and unsatisfactory. So let me tell you why it's satisfactory. Um, people have seen in simulations on this random graph that uh, if you run more than five rounds, so they notice that this means that you have many communities. Maybe this is because their graphs were small, so I think that it was simulations reported were with uh, 10,000 vertices. Maybe this is the reason, and maybe the reason is that there is something magical about the number five here. Uh, so we reach these five rounds, but we don't really know uh, how, how much further we can go. And is, uh, is this uh, kind of question that uh, the number five is somehow magical in this direction really true? So maybe the input is too small and we just, uh, we just can't see the, the larger picture. Uh, a bit like in uh, Ibarbo's talk. Um, so the other two questions are more open, so uh, could similar ideas be used either to analyze uh, the behavior of LPA, uh, so the, the algorithm on networks that we really care about, so real world networks, and um, maybe it's worth asking what happens if the majority rule is not really a majority rule, so if you just perturb it a bit, and uh, in cases like one vertex having 15 neighbors with label 1 and 14 neighbors with label 2, maybe from time to time it's, uh, it's worth to say, okay, uh, why not label 2? I mean, they are so close that uh, okay, here majority doesn't really count because 14 and 15 are of the same order, after all. So why not choosing some label that is slightly underrepresented? Uh, okay, that's all. Thank you all for uh, listening to me and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm sorry to question. Uh, perhaps you could then, um, on slide 8, you had this interesting uh, representation where the cost is occurring. Was it equal in distribution to the index i of the maximum of something involving a uh, Gaussian sequence. Ah, yeah. Uh, let me see. Here. Yeah, yeah. So where is this coming from, Mark? Uh, so the idea is that uh, you can... Um, so you have the, your uh, vertices in A, and then, uh, as I said, uh, okay, so the neighborhood of one is so concentrated, then the neighborhood is two. Uh, excluding the neighbors of one is also well concentrated, three, four, etc. So you can think of these groups of vertices as almost deterministic. So because they are sizes, you can think of them as almost deterministic. Ah, but they're fluctuations in the gas. They're, yeah, they're, they're fluctuations. Yeah. But uh, so in the regime uh, where NP is equal to, so exactly the order of N to the two thirds, 
you are somehow in the middle. You see these fluctuations, but you also see the drifts, right? So there is some interplay between seeing the fluctuations and seeing the drift in the approximation, uh, so in this uh, approximation step. But, uh, okay, if you take both of them into account, you, uh, you get some, some approximation by normal variables. But of course, you have to take something out because you know that the probability that your winning label is large. Right. Any other questions? Okay, so we have uh, thank uh, you again. Thank you. I think we have a new Monday on board now. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Vitaly Wachtel from the University of Bielefeld. He will talk about a multidimensional process leading a complicated set that is a truncated count. This will be about position. So as you imagine, this is about something like a camper's ring, but more complicated than just crossing a barrier. So it's your time, please. Yeah, thank you very much. But unfortunately, it was not possible to come. As you probably know, there, there was a quite huge strike in Germany yesterday. But uh, people in Munich Airport have decided that they are quite exceptional. And they have started their strike on Sunday already. So because of that, there were no flights to any place from Munich. And I had no time to change my tickets. So, um, this is the reason why Martin has to invite me once again, certain, well, certain time on later, to Sofia. Okay, this talk is based on a joint work with Dennis Denison, which is not surprising me, so we are working quite a lot together, and almost all papers are written in the collaboration with him. So, uh, let me start with the most classical gambler's problem, where we have just two players. So, uh, every round consists in a passing of fair coin, and then the players transfer one euro from one player to another one, depending on the result of coin passing. Right? So, it's a very standard situation, and if the, the classical problem in every st introductory stochastic course is to determine uh, the chance that the first player will win if his starting capital is just x euro. So, what, how can one model this uh, problem? It's also very simple. One has just a random walk on the interval 0n with two absorbing states at 0 and at point n, and the jumps are also clear, so if the first player wins one euro, which happens with probability one half, since we have a fair coin, then his capital in the next step is just x plus 1, or if he loses, then it's x minus 1. And we repeat this game again and again, until this random walk hits one of these two endpoints, either zero, this means that the first player lo has lost the game or is going or he's going bankrupt or he wins the whole game. In that case, uh, the random walk ends up in the left uh, sorry, in the right end point of this interval. Right. And so just writing a linear equation for the probability that the first player starts with the starting capital X, uh, wins with the starting capital X, one can easily obtain that the, the solution to that system of equations is just the linear function and the probability that the first player wins is just X over N. So what will be important for the later part of the talk is that in the case of two players, we have the perfect match with the Brownian motion. So if we start a Brownian motion at point X, and if we look at the probability that this Brownian motion hits first um, N, 
oh, his first hits n before it hits zero, then we get the same expression x over n. So the reason for this perfect mesh is also very clear. So both processes are continuous in different methods, of course, but trajectories of both processes are continuous and they have symmetric distribution. So it's um, in the end, you, you get this very nice expression. And what is more important for us, more important than the explicit form of the, of the answer, that we have this coincidence between Brownian motion and discrete time random walk. OK, and now I move to a, a, prop of, to a gambler's problem with more than two planes. Um, so we have just one coin, and now we will have more than two planes. More precisely, I will always assume that we have, oops, sorry, that we have three players. So it's more than two, and uh, this case can be, so I can make pictures on, on the slides. So, uh, in all other cases, one in the multi-dimensional. So it's two dimensional space is not enough. So how can one run the game in this situation where you have more than two planes? So actually you have to add in the every round, you have to add just one additional step. And this is the step one, which is written here. First of all, you choose a pair of players uniformly at random. So if you have three plays, there are three possibilities to choose one pair, and each of their choices has probability one third. And then, uh, then you toss a coin and transfer one euro from one to another player, which were chosen in the first step. Right? So now, if the total amount of money at the very beginning n is capital N, so this is the capital of the first player plus the capital of the second player plus the capital of the third player. So it, it doesn't make sense to keep the track of all three capitals or of all three numbers. So if you know the first two, if you know the capital of the first player and of the second one, then you know everything, right? So in contrast to the classical situation, you end up with a two-dimensional Stochastic process. More precisely, uh, one gets a Markov chain on the simplex, which is written here. So x, x and y are non-negative numbers. So it's, zero is missing here. And it should be non-negative numbers. And x plus y should be less than equal n. So this is not a mistake. But in the end, I've decided to add, to add to the boundary. So if you are inside of this simplex, then you have the following six possibilities of jumps. So first of all, um, you can go to the right with probability 1, 6. This corresponds to the following choice. So you, you choose um, the first and the third player to play the game, and the first player wins, right? So then you go in the horizontal direction. This means that the Mm, capital of the second player is not changing, and you don't see on the picture the capital of the third player. So it's, this is this arrow to the right. If the first player lost the game, then you go to the left. So if you choose at the very beginning that the second and the third player are playing, then you have ver two vertical steps. And if the first and the second player are chosen, then you have these diagonal-wise jumps. It's clear everything is uh, uniformly distributed. So all these jumps happen with probabilities 1 over 6. And sooner or later, we will hit one of these three boundaries. And if we are on the one of the boundaries, this means that uh, one of the players has lost all his money, and then we have just two players. But in that case, so you don't need the first step in the procedure, you just play the normal game with two players, and in the end, the process will stop in one of the three, these three um, 
states at either at zero or at this area. So this state zero means that the third player wins the whole game. So this uh, point above uh, means that the second player wins the game and this point to the right means that the first player wins the game. So uh, this is the model we will look at and so what, why do we look at that model? It's the situation was, well, th this question was posed to us to, by Percy Diakonis and the question is based on his paper with ATA from 2022. They were able to show that if the first and the second player start with one euro and the third player is the very rich one, so in earlier time I would like I, I would say that the third player is Abramovich, but during the last year he well he become more modest person than it was before. So now you have to choose here any rich person in the world. And they have shown that the third player, the richest one, goes broke first with a probability which is of order constant divided by capital, by the total capital raised to the power of three. So what is not perfect here is that you have two different constants, C1 and C2. So up and low bounds, they have the same order in them, but they have different constants. And this estimate is based actually on more general results from another paper by Iaconis, this time with Houston Edwards and South Costa, where they have considered more general Markov chains, not only of these two dimensional synthesis, <coughs> but in that paper they, well, it doesn't make any sense to, to explain what general inner domains are. It's, I would just say that the estimates from that paper could be applied to any number of players, right? Okay, so <coughs> this analytical bounds is not the only result in the paper by Japonis and Etia. They have also produced a number of numerical results. So not, these results are not results of simulations. Let me say exact numerical results for fixed ends. And they have compared that with a similar problem for the Brownian motion. And they have noticed that if n grows, then you have a very good fit of the probability that the third player goes broke first in this discrete model with the corresponding model for the Brownian motion. And because of that, they, they have conjectured that this probability should be asymptotically equivalent to a certain constant c divided by n raised to the power of 3. And Percy has asked us whether we can prove this um, asymptotical result. And uh, yeah, so as Krzysztof told in the introduction, that the talk will be on random walks in cones, and I'm going to move to that part immediately. So <clears throat> let us consider a random walk as n, multidimensional random walk, as 0 is just any starting position, and xk are independent, is identically distributed vectors with the values on a certain lattice r, which is a linear transformation of z to the power d. So we have, a d, we have a vectors which take values of the d-dimensional lattice. And let k be an open cone, and tau is the corresponding first exit time from that cone. So this means that tau is the first number n, such that as n does not belong to this cone. So if you assume that the cone k is not really bad, so it's uh, c2 convexity 
star light. So quite normal conditions, or quite normal geometric conditions on the cone A. And if you assume that the random walk is n, a zero mean uh, finite variances and plus some more moment conditions, then one can show that the probability to stay in cone up to time n is proportional to a certain function v of x, which describes the dependence on the starting point divided by n to the power b half. So b is a characteristic of the cone, it does not depend on the random walk, it depends only on the cone A. And Vx is a harmonic function for SF field at the time when it leaves uh, the cone K. In other words, Vx is a non-negative or positive solution to this fixed point equation, which is written here. So, besides this uh, asymptotic relation for the tail of tau, one can prove various linear theorems, integral and local linear theorems for, for, for the random walk condition to stay in a cone. And this um, random walks and cones were actually the main topic of our Medellis research in the last probably 10 or 12 years. We have produced many different constructions for, for this harmonic function capital V of x. This is actually the most important part in all our proofs. So if you have a harmonic function, then it's more than enough of the whole business. So the, the proof of limit three is not is not that difficult if you have already constructed somehow this harmonic function V of x. And our experience with cons was probably the reason for for the Aconis to ask us whether we can do something with, with the gambler throwing problem, which is indeed related to truncated cones. Okay, so now I have to introduce the truncation. So we, let us take a hyperplane H, which cuts the cone K into two parts. So the first part, say K1, it should be um, bounded and not empty. So this is the part which is close to, to the origin of the cone, right? It's too close to zero. Zero is a part of the boundary of K1. And the remaining part is unbounded, right? So it's the, the huge part of the cone. And then we just scale this area, the, 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 the domain K1, and introduce the domain Kn. So these are all points x such that x divided by n belong to the k1. So you just shift the, this cutting hyperplane further and further to infinity. And if the distance roughly speaking, if the distance to zero is roughly speaking n, then you get this area Kn. So this is truncated cone Kn. And uh, what we are actually interested in is the behavior of the green function g n x y. So this is the sum of probabilities that s n is equal to y on the event that sigma n is bigger than n. So you start somewhere at point x and then you move inside this truncated part and you have to end at the position y after n steps without leaving this, well, in the two-dimensional situation, this triangle AM, right? Why it's important for, 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 for the gambler's problem? So in the gambler's problem, or in, in the situation which we had before, so we wanted here to co compute the probability that the third player goes probe first, this means that we have to exit this um, simplex through this diagonal part of the boundary. Right? So let's assume that the whole cone K is a positive quadrant and we have here a cutting line, which is this diagonal x plus y equal x 
plus y is equal to 1. So this will be the cutting line, right? And we want to compute the probability that we exit the triangle through this uh, diagonal part of the bond. So this is the connection to, to the endless problem. And why do we need the behavior of the green function? So if we want to exit through this boundary, so we then just use the total probability formula. So you do a certain number of steps, and then you go outside of this truncated area just in one step, right? So, and if you write down uh, the, the sum of all possible time moments, then you will immediately see that the most important ingredient will be uh, this green function. And so we decided to calculate asymptotics for, for this um, green function. Okay, and now this is our main result in this direction. So assume that K is either complex or star-like and C2. These are exactly geometric conditions which one needs to construct the harmonic function in that cone for, for, for the random walkers M. So we assume also that X has zero mean and unique covariance matrix. So there are no um, no covariance between the coordinates, right? So they are uncorrelated. And we assume also that this moment of the random vector x is finite. So p is the constant which characterizes our cone k, and d is the dimension. So if we have these conditions, then there exists a constant c such that the green function g of x y can be bounded from above by this constant c times the harmonic function of the random walk times j divided by n to the power p e plus d minus 1. And this is true for all y's which are in this slice. So they, um, this is the part of the cone k n minus g plus 1 without the cone k n minus j, right? So it's, this is this part. And j is, roughly speaking, describes the boundary, uh, distance to the boundary of the cone a n. Okay, this is an upper bound, which is uniform for over all j, which are less or equal than n over 2. So actually, you have, in a half of the truncated domain, you have this nice um, upper bound. Moreover, there exists a function h, which depends only on the cone k. So actually, h can be expressed in terms of the Brownian motion. So it, depending on, your, on the cone k means, in our world, that it doesn't depend on the, brow, uh, on the random walk. It depends only on the geometry of, of the cone k. And well, in terms of the probability theory, one can say it, it depends on the behavior of the Brownian motion in the cone k. So, there exists a function h such that this green function um, can be written in the following way. We have the product of two harmonic functions, capital E of x, this is the harmonic function of the cone, then little v h is the harmonic function of the projection of, the, of our multidimensional random walk on the direction which is orthogonal to h. So here we have this cutting line h, and then we take an orthogonal direction um, to, the, to this hyperplane, and we, we take a projection of the whole random walk on this direction, and this random walk killed at hitting zero, as the harmonic function which is written, oops, which is written here. And h at point y over n appears in this main part of the asymptotical behavior plus little order. So this is actually 
the most important result for, for, for the gambler's problem. Okay, so if you have this result, if I have time at the end, I will uh, show you the main idea in the proof of this asymptotic result, and you will see how this uh, function vh appears in, in, in the proof. It's quite natural to have this function here. Uh, but let us first look how we can use this result and compute probabilities for, for the gambler's problem. Okay, so uh, recall that uh, in the gambler's problem we have this random walk in the simplex with these jumps. So we have six different jumps with probability one over six. Um, this random walk with that Zn with these six jumps um, does not satisfy the conditions of the one. So the expected value of every jump is zero, but they are correlated. So the expectation of y1 times y2 is minus 1 over 3. So to adjust uh, this random walk to the conditions of theorem 1, we apply this linear transformation t. Just to eliminate uh, covariance, we have to to apply uh, a linear transformation. So you transform the distribution of the increments, but you also transform the whole and the possible chance, of course, right? So from the simplex which we get, which we had before, we get the equilateral triangle here. And from these six jumps, we get this um, set of jumps. So now the angle between two jumps is always p over 3. Right? So it's now you have more symmetric picture actually than you had before. But it's, uh, if you rotate these jumps with the angle which is proportional to p over 3, then you get the same picture. Right? So it's a lot of symmetry after after this transformation. It's also quite a good sign, so if you, if you get symmetry, then, then you do right things. And of course, the, the cutting line y1 plus y2 equals 1 transfers now into this cutting line square root of 3, x1 plus x2 is root of 6. So this is one very simple part which one has to compute. Another very simple observation is that if you look at the cone K, which is just wedged with the opening angle P over 3, then the harmonic function is given by this expression. So it's just a polynomial of order 3. And this means in particular oops, that, that the constant P is also 3 in this case. Okay, so we have a very very nice random walk with jumps without. Well, okay, so if you look at, at these jumps, you cannot jump over the boundary of the triangle. And this implies that the harmonic function for the random walk equals to the harmonic function for the Brownian motion. So in both cases, like in the one dimensional case, if you have a certain continuity, then you have a coincidence between characteristics of Brownian motion and random modes. So <coughs> the harmonic function for the random walk coincides with the harmonic function for the Brownian motion for all starting points x or for all points x in this set. Right. Okay. So next observation which we have to do is the following one. So if we want to hit the diagonal boundary, so this part of the boundary, then it can be done only by two of these uh, six jumps. Either we go to the right, or we go to the, uh, what is, how should I call that, to the northeast, but it's not, uh, the, the angle here is not your four, but P over 3, 
right? So these two jabs can lead to the exit or to the hitting of the bone, right? So therefore, probability that the random walk S at the exiting time is in Y is 1 over 6 gn x y1 plus 1 over 6 gn x y2 where y1 and y2 are this particular vector. So it's, you see, if you go to the right, then you go from the point y1 to y, and if you go to the northeast from the point y2, then you end up again in y. So the probability that you will hit this point on the boundary is given by this very simple expression. Right, so now we have related the so-called harmonic measure of the random walk to the corresponding ring function. So you see it's a very simple expression. The next the thing one has to notice is that the renewal function or the harmonic function for the one-dimensional walk can be computed explicitly and this follows from the fact that look, so we have here this is our this is the direction of our cutting line so we have to to project these jumps on the direction which is orthogonal to this line so these two jumps, this one and this one, will give value zero. These two jumps will have the same projection, and these two jumps will have also the same projection with the, with the opposite side. Right? So it's zero plus value and minus value. So the, the projection, the one dimensional in the walk, will have only three values. Let's say plus one, minus one, and zero, up to scaling constant. And in this situation where you have a game continuity, you can say that the renewal function is just a linear function, and computing this at these two special points, you get that this is just square root of 6 over 2. Okay, then applying our theorem 1, we get this expression, right? So it's 1 over square root x, h, y over n, dx over n to the power of 4 plus little order. So assume now that at the very beginning the first player has capital A euro and the second player has capital B euros. So therefore the starting point of the random walk as n after this linear transformation is just this expression. Right? So it's so now, we, if you plug in this x into the value of the harmonic, or into the expression for the harmonic function, you get that this is just 3 times square root of x, uh, 6ab times a plus b. So, then you have to sum up over all y's. You sum up this expression over all y's, and y belong to this cutting line, right? If you do that, then you, s you conclude that the probability that the third player goes bankrupt first is given by this expression. So this is the cutting line, gamma is the cutting line, right? So this is the first one, and then the probability that the first player wins the whole game and the third player goes bankrupt first can be expressed in these terms. <laughs> Just recall that if you are on the boundary, then you have a standard problem, a standard gambler's problem with two players with explicit uh, solutions. Okay, so that the remaining point is just to calculate these two integrals, so this one and the previous one here. And if you do that, then you get the following answer. So in the probability, with, if you start with y1 and y2 euros by the first and the second player, the probability that the third player will be uh, eliminated first, then the 
second player will be eliminated, so the first player wins is a syntactically equivalent to this expression. So you see that the constant is uh, computed co uh, explicitly here, and similarly, the probability that the third player gets eliminated first can be also co computed with explicit constant. So it's a symbolic expression, but it's not any constant uh, C. This is just this very, very special constant. Okay, it's not surprising if you can compute some characteristics of the Brownian motion, and then you, then you can say, okay, we have a central limit theory for random walks, it should be similar expression, and even more, the constant should be the same. If this is exactly what happens in this um, corollary. Okay, so the next interesting thing, which was observed by Diakonis and Etier, that if you compare the probabilities that first the third player is eliminated, then the second one, for the discrete random walk and for the Brownian motion, sorry. So for the Brownian motion, this means the following. First, you hit this diagonal part of the boundary, and then you have a one-dimensional Brownian motion in the boundary. And depending on in which corner you can stop, you get the corresponding probability. So again, using the numerical experiments, they have suggested that the difference between these two probabilities should be of order 1 over n raised to the power 4. Okay, as you can imagine, it's a very good rate of convergence. Just think a second that a bit uh, about this. Uh, in the central limit theory, normally you have a very bad uh, rate of convergence. It's just a square, one over square root of number of steps, right? So, and sigma n, the, the exit time from this truncated cone is normally n squared. So if you compare this number of steps, the, the normal, let's say, um, rate of convergence of, could be 1 over n. But what they have obtained, or what they have suggested, is that the rate should be 1 over n to the power 4. Unfortunately, we were not able to prove this result. What we were able to prove is a bit weaker result. So we, oops, we've managed to show that the difference of that probabilities can be bounded by a constant divided by n to the power 3. Um, we do not know whether this conjecture can be proved or our result or our rate of convergence is optimal. Um, what we have tried, of course, to use is the symmetry. So I've tried to emphasize that the random walk we are looking at is really symmetric here. So uh, the second, the first. The second and the third moments coincide with that of the Brownian motion. So the first difference, as far as I remember, is in the fourth moment. And so if you have the coincidence on the level of the third moments, then you can already say that the convergence rate in the central limit theorem is better than 1 over square root of 10, right? The corresponding um, term in the asymptotic expansions disappear since you have coincidence of the moments. And, but this, what we were able to, uh, to get is this expression, constant divided by m q. So it's still quite interesting and open problem to get this rate of uh, convergence in this special problem. I think it's also quite interesting from the point of view of numerics. So if you have some uh, some classical partial differential equations which should be valid in diagonal, then it doesn't make sense to 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 use discretization which is based on the standard, uh, let's say, standards 
z squared. So it's much better to adjust the discretization to the area, what people probably do. But this example is quite good confirmation that it possibly it makes sense to, to use very special discretization of the domain. Okay. Um, well, I have five minutes to, to say a couple of words about the proof. Yes. Okay. So, um, the, the idea, I, I just wanted, I just want to show you what is different if you compare our proof with the standard proofs. So, first of all, the, the first step is really standard. So, we want to estimate the green function, so we split the sum of all n's into two parts. The first part is when n is less or equal than epsilon n squared, so little n is uh, too small actually to go from x to y. And the second part is the sum of all n which are at least epsilon n squared. So here, in this part, you have enough time to go from point x to point y. And the standard approach consists in estimating really every probability separately. For example, this, uh, this method was used in a quite recent paper by Francesco and Ron, where they were proving um, results on the behavior of renewal function in the one dimension. Right, so, but we do, we go a bit different route. So for the second time, for the second part, sorry, we use actually the same, the same idea. We just prove uh, local limit theorem. So here, time is large enough to go from point X to point Y. And what we have managed to prove here is the following uh, local limit result. So if you take this probability to be at point Y after n steps without exiting uh, this truncated cone, and you multiply this with n to the power of p half plus t half, then you get this, asymptotically get this expression, so it's v of x, the harmonic function in the cone, times a certain function f at point y over square root of n. Under the condition that uh, little n divided by capital N squared is asymptotically proportional to a constant r, which is positive. So, how you can prove that? It's quite simple. So, you just split the trajectory into two parts. So, the point x is close to the origin of the cone, and the point y is close to the cutting hyperplane. So, if you start at point x, then your first problem is to survive in the cone k, and then you go to some point here in the middle, right? And then you take y and you inverse in the time this part of the trajectory. So here, if you start close to the to this cutting hyperplane, the first difficulty is not to cross this hyperplane. Right? And so <clears throat> and in this red part, you have actually a random walk which is conditioned to stay in a half space, right? So, and conditioning to stay in a half space is equivalent to condition the uh, projection of the random walk to stay positive, right? So, it's the random, the whole two-dimensional random walk in a half space is if and only if the projection stays positive, right? So. Then you just put them, these two parts together. So you use not only the literature local limit theorem for the green part and then for the red part, and then you just combine them and you get the answer. So this part is indeed not a problem. So just a combination of non results. What we have to do in a different way is the first part of the sum. So here, one has to deal with large duration probabilities, right? As I told you before, 
n is too small to go from point x to point y. Okay, and the method of, of uh, Caravella and Doni was to estimate every probability. But if you look at fluctuation probabilities, rather often you have to struggle with big jumps. Right? So if you try to estimate every probability separately, then okay, the number of summons is epsilon to the epsilon times n squared. So many times you have to take into account big jump. Right? So you count this in every probability. And in multidimensional case, it's not that good. We have tried it, it does not work. So we decided to look on this big jump just once in the whole trajectory. So for that, we introduce one more stopping time, theta y is the first time where the random walk is quite close to the point y. Right? So we want to count all that probabilities when we are in y. So first of all, we have to hit this ball. So it's delta times n. So you have to take this sum, then you write this as an expectation of the sum of indicators. Right? So now you have expected value of a certain function of the whole trajectory. Right? So you, and the idea is to, to work with this with this uh, function, not with the separate probabilities. Then by the Markov property, you say, okay, before I hit y, I should hit this ball around point y, and then restart the, the whole random walk, and remove the condition after the restarting in this point as theta y, you remove the condition to be in cold and replace it by the condition to stay in half space. So the tau h is the first exit time from the half space. But if you look at the, half, at the green function for the half space, then there are no results in the literature. So this part can be estimated from above by this expression here. So it's two times the product of distances to to the boundary gamma n. So this is the cutting hyperplane, more or less. And then you distinguish between two cases. So the first one is that the distance between the hitting point S theta y and y is small. But if this distance is small, then the value of the last jump is really high. So this is actually the one big jump which I did not want to count in every probability. So now you see that we count this big jump just once. And since we have to have a large value of x at the y here, this may happen only with a small probability. And the second part is when the distance is large, but if the distance is large, then this ratio is very small, so it's constant divided by n to the power d. Then plus some additional estimates um, will give you the result. So I think, so this idea was used before in my joint paper with uh, Ilya Rachel, Ilya Tarago, and uh, Yetia Durai, where we were looking at green functions for cones, but it works also in this situation. So you, and in the end, this, well, after 10 pages of technical estimates, you can complete uh, the proof of the one. Okay, uh, that's all I wanted to say to you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. You got, got big applause. And now there's the tricky part to ask questions. One easy way to do it is that if you want to ask a question, come here to the podium. Or if you tell me loud enough, I will repeat. There's also yeah. a good option. Whatever you prefer. Do you have any questions? Uh, yes. Uh, I can come up. Yeah, that's good. Hi there, thanks for the lovely talk. Am I really?
really love. Um, if, if you uh, have a poker tournament with uh, three players and it's not a winner takes all poker uh, tournament, so for example, the player that comes first gets 100 euros and the player that comes second gets 50 euros and the player who comes third gets zero euros, then uh, in kind of common poker theory, it's believed that players should be uh, risk averse, which means that they don't want to be involved in coin flips with other players. And is there a way of seeing this kind of concavity of how much, um, how likely you are to win a prize or your expected prize from your formulas? So, the third place is not playing at all, you mean? The, the, the third place doesn't get, the, the, the key point is the winner takes some money, but also the second place gets some money. Oh. I think that could be possible, but what we have used in our formulas is that if you hit just one of the boundary lines, yeah. then you follow the standard gambling pro problem, right? And uh, for, for your question, you have to change the boundary condition. But uh, I think from the philosophical point of view, it should work. I can't Sorry. I can't promise you that that all technical uh, things will work, but I think that if you can, uh, if you just change the, um, uh, the, the the boundary conditions, then one can answer this question as well. Okay, thank you. So it seems that your boundary condition that was discussed in the lecture was just zero at the origin, eventually. And the question I had it about boundary condition being zero, maybe on some hyper... Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I can try to explain on this picture. Our boundary conditions was zero on this part. Oops, what's going on? Zero on this part and zero on this part. And then you have either one on this part to compute the probability that the third player goes broke first, or if you want that uh, one of the players wins, for example, uh, like in this probability, right? So then you impose linear boundary conditions on, on this part. But if I understood the question properly, if the first player, okay, if the winning player gets a certain amount of money in the second another one, so then one can impose different boundary conditions on this part. And then we probably one can do that and in the end one gets the answer, yes. Thank you. Do we have other questions? I have some, and that maybe we don't have too much time. Uh, what about the topology? If this is a random walk, really, and this uh, it jumps on the boundary of the cone, I understand that this is a solid cone in RT. Uh, do you consider it left, the set, or not? Well, um, in, in the problem with the gamblers, with, with three players, there are no overshoot of the boundary. We, we can just hit the boundary. Right, so that, uh, I don't have to think about what, what happens at the, at the time where I'm leaving this truncated part. But in general, if you can jump over the boundary, we, we can also produce some results, but they are formulated in a big different way. I see. So you, you, you are staying here, and then you jump to some position outside. So the, the exiting position is, let's say, in the in the infinite part, in the unbounded part of the pole, and you can compute the probability that if you take this terminal position Z outside of the truncated part, you can compute the probability that that, that at time sigma n you will be in that point. But what we assume always that the random walk is on the is lattice. So we have a transformed lattice of Transformed variant of set to the power D. Thank you. I think we could uh, continue for a long time, but now uh, we need to go for the next talk. So thank you again.
Bye. Goodbye. Have a good day. Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Mateusz Kraśnicki, who will talk about a specific uh, spectral theory related to one side the mechanism uh, for Levy processes. Thank you very much. I know that you're interested in cones, so my talk will be mostly about cones in dimension one, which are just, just half light. Half light. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Mladen and all other organizers for, for making this happen and for inviting me here. Uh, it's my first time in Sofia, second time in Bulgaria, and I really like that very much. Uh, and I'm really happy to, to be able to talk about... Sorry? Yeah. Uh, I'm really happy to talk about, uh, about these kind of things because uh, this is something that, that, that lasts for, I don't know, maybe 10 years now. Uh, it all started in 2000 early 2010s and it probably reached the end in some sense so this is somehow complete. Uh, so, so my talk is, the, the topic of the talk is rather general and I will speak about general things for the first part of the talk and then I'll focus on my results only at the very end. So if I can this sort of go away and I can probably you can see the outline of my talk and I don't know how to do that. So. operator with, uh, with lambda j's on the diagonal and the unitary matrix which transforms this operator into, uh, into L is given by the eigenvectors. Okay, and we call this eigenfunction expansion and that's a very basic thing. Uh, and we can, we can extend it to infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces uh, as long as your operator is say compact. Uh, then you can indeed find a complete orthonormal sequence of eigenvectors and uh, and the operator can again be cast in the, in the diagonal form. Uh, but now the matrices are in some sense infinite. Uh, the picture is more or less the same. The series converts into two and it's, it's all well defined. That's a standard Hilbert Schmidt theory for, for self adjoint compact operators in Hilbert spaces. Okay. Uh, and the picture in, in, in greater generality for self adjoint operators in arbitrary Hilbert spaces is much more complicated, but you still have a spectral theory, which tells you that essentially every self-adjoint operator is a multiplication operator after some unitary transformation. So you can find a unitary transformation of your Hilbert space into an uh, abstract L2 space, on some, some abstract measure space, uh, on which your operator acts as multiplication by, say, a function or we for our purpose, lambda. And this can be written in a form which involves resolution of identity. There are many other ways to write this theorem uh, too. Uh, but that's kind of in the explicit. And in what I will talk about, uh, we're more interested in something which is more down to earth. And if, so, so, so the, the way we would like to view spectral theorem for, for general self adjoint operators is similar to what we know from, from the finite dimensional case. Uh, so we'd like to write. Uh, this integral as the integral of some function lambda r, which depends on variable r. And instead of spectral resolution or, or some unitary, abstract unitary copy, we would like to have the scalar product, the inner product of, uh, of uh, our functions uv, or, or, or elements of the Hilbert space actually, uh, uv, uh, with some, I'll call it still, eigenfunctions. Uh, if these were true eigenfunctions, then we would be back in the compact state, in a compact uh, operator case, essentially. Uh, so this, these are no longer square integrable functions, no longer but elements of our Hilbert space. Uh, but these are what's called generalized eigenfunctions. And if you're lucky enough, uh, then you can indeed 
uh, prove that a theorem like that, that the most general result of that kind probably is for what's called a cardinal operator. A cardinal operator is an operator which has an integral kernel, and you need to assume that this integral kernel is L2 in each variable. For, for almost every x, it's in L2 is very probable with respect to y, and vice versa, it's a symmetric kernel. So, uh, so, so you just need to require that for, for, for a single variable. Uh, now, for Kahneman operators, uh, there's a theory that shows that indeed uh, this unitary operator can be described as uh, integral with respect to what's called the generalized eigenfunction. So you, you get a family of generalized eigenfunctions called phi r, and uh, the, the, the operator takes diagonal form in uh, in this uh, in this uh, well generalized eigenfunction expansion maybe, uh, identity. And okay, mm. now that's for self adjoint operators, but most objects that I like, would like to consider in this talk are not self adjoint. Uh, so, what happens in a non self adjoint case? Well, of course, you can extend this to normal operators. Uh, so, that essentially, everything that I said is, is true for normal operators, but when your operator stops being normal, uh, then you kind of do it. And in finitely dimensional vector spaces, well, the most general result is, is, a, is called Jordan normal form, but it's not something that we're interested really in. We would like to still keep eigenfunction expansion in the simplest possible form. So, uh, the form, like, like, that's what, that one. Uh, that, that, that requires some luck. I mean, for almost all operators, in some sense, this is true, but, but still you need to be a little bit lucky to have uh, this kind of expansion. In this case, the difference is that we have eigenvectors phi j and co eigenvectors psi j uh, involved in these expansions. So these are two families of, uh, of vectors. And well, this is one now, this is just, just a diagonalization of uh, uh, an arbitrary matrix which has basis of eigenvectors. So these are true eigenvectors, the co-eigenvectors are eigenvectors of the joint operator, and uh, well, these form, this eigenfunction expansion corresponds to, uh, to matrices made of, uh, a row matrices made of co-eigenvectors and column matrices made of vectors. Okay, so this is also fairly standard. Now, the, the, problems, uh, the problem starts um, when you try to move to arbitrary Hilbert spaces. So even in the compact case, when you're in the infinite dimensional Hilbert space, uh, and you, your operator L is a compact operator, uh, then, well, this is sort of true. I mean, you still have a collection of eigenfunctions and co eigenfunctions, and in some sense, you can write your operator in that form. Uh, so you still have some kind of eigenfunction expansion, but, well, the convergence of that series is not immediate, and it's not always true, really. Uh, so you need some luck, again, to have this series converge. Uh, so even in this case, uh, it's not straightforward whether you can, can kind of prove eigenfunction expansion for your favorite operator. And if your operator is not compact, uh, then, well, in some sense you're doomed. Uh, so, so, so the goal of this talk would be, on the analysis side, would be to figure out for what operators, I mean, find a class of operators for which you can kind of mimic what happens in the self-adjoint case, in the case of Kahneman operators, uh, but uh, for non-normal operators. So the question is whether we can find a family of generalized eigenfunctions phi r and generalized co-eigenfunctions psi r, uh, which are in some sense maybe true pointwise say eigenfunctions, uh, and such that we have these generalized eigenfunction expansion of G double E uh, for the operator L. Okay. Now that there's no probability involved here, but I'm a probabilist, so I prefer to speak probabilistic language, so let's move to the more interesting part, probability. What kind of operators do I like to study? Um, so the, well, in this finite dimensional setting, the most general idea that one can come up with in, in, in probability is to consider a continuous time, or discrete time for that matter, micro chain. Uh, so I'm interested in continuous time, so let's speak about continuous time only. Uh, so this Markov chain corresponds to the generator matrix, which has uh, intensity of jumps or transition rates away from the diagonal, and um, all each row and, uh, adds up to uh, to zeros. So that uh, on the diagonal you have uh, escape rates from each state. And again, the transition probabilities of that Markov chain are given by exponential of t times the generator matrix. That's something we teach students probably the first. 
semester of, of uh, stochastic uh, processes course. And so, so these are the operators that are interesting on the uh, on the probabilistic side. And of course, uh, the generator itself, the joint of the matrix, is symmetric. Uh, and in this case, you can just use the eigenfunction expansion and write your generator uh, in, in that way that we've seen before. Here we write minus lambda j to keep lambda j positive because all the eigenvalues have, uh, in general, they have non, non positive real parts. And here they are just simply uh, negative numbers, possibly zero. Okay, and, and the transition uh, rates at time t can be given by a similar eigenfunction expansion. You just change the eigenvalues to, to the exponentials. So that's one way to define functional calculus for your favorite operator. Okay. Uh, now, if you want to move uh, to infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, then you can consider Markov chains on infinite state spaces or more generally Markov processes. And the natural candidates here are the Brownian motion uh, on some, possibly on some domain, or maybe on all of RD, or maybe some Levy processes or other jump processes. Uh, these correspond to generators which are either local for, for diffusions or non-local for, for jump type processes. And uh, again, uh, for in this non-local case, we can think of an arbitrary generator uh, of that form where new uh, corresponds to the intensity of jumps from x to y. Okay, and if this is regular enough, if there's a nice mark of processes behind that operator, then you can define transition operators, uh, which describe the rate at which the process moves at, in time t from, from point x to point y. And well, formally, you can still expect that this is exponential of t times l, but this is no longer uh, well defined in, uh, as a series. Uh, and if you, lucky enough, there are densities of these transition, I mean, these are called transition operators, and they, they may have nice kernels, functions, which are called transition densities, and you're interested in studying these objects. And uh, spectral theory is just one way to study these. Of course, there are various ways to prove regularity estimates and so on of, of, of these objects. Uh, but, but spectral theory provides a way to get what kind of explicit formulas, as long as you know eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. Okay, now, if uh, your operators are symmetric, so if, uh, say, the transition rates from one point to another, or jumping rates, uh, are symmetric, uh, then your operators are self adjoint and you can write down the spectral theorem. So if, if uh, for example, your transition operators turn out to be compact operators, then you have these eigenfunction expansion, which is of the same form as for, for the micro chains, except that you have infinitely many eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So that's very straightforward, and this corresponds to mostly processes in bounded domains, which are kind of killed or reflected on these, uh, on, on these domains, because then compactness is, is just saying that the integrals of the heat kernel, double integral of the heat kernel, is, is finite. Uh, so in this case, this is kind of well understood, and of course, studying the distribution of, of lambda j's, the asymptotics of lambda j's, or estimates of, of obviously, the ground state, or the, the, the principal eigenvalue lambda 1, as well as the properties of these eigenvalues uh, phi j, um, eigenvectors phi j, uh, is a well, very broad subject, and various tools are used to do that. And uh, of course, you can ask whether these series converge, because these are no longer finite sums. Uh, convergence of them is uh, not always straightforward, it's not always true, really. Uh, but if you have some minor assumptions, if you put some minor assumptions on, on your process, then you can really prove that uh, these series converge pointwise, and you can even change the order of the integral to get e expressions for the heat kernel and so on. And I will discuss that later for, for some other examples. Okay. Uh, now the question is more interesting or maybe more challenging when you move to non-compact case. Uh, so for example, if you consider processes in unbounded domains, uh, even the simple problem motion in unbounded domain, so with, with killing on the boundary, which corresponds to the third boundary condition. And uh, in that case, mm, you can figure out rather easily that uh, transition densities are bounded, and of course they are integrable when you fix one variable. So that means that PT, the transition operator, is a Carleman operator. So you can use generalized eigenfunction expansion. This has been done by Gator already in the 50s. 
And so in, in a rather huge generality, he was able to prove that if we have a symmetric Markov process which satisfies some really minor regularity assumptions, uh, then there is a family of generalized second functions uh, which allows you to write the operator, and uh, more, more importantly the, the, the transition operators, the generator and the transition operators, uh, in terms of these generalized second functions. And in fact, again, you get pointwise expressions. Uh, so of course, the only problem again is to figure out what lambda r and phi r really are. And if, as soon as you get explicit expressions for them, you can write down an integral formula for the heat kernel, uh, which is something. Of course, in, in most cases, uh, like Brownian motion with uh, potential of Brownian motion domains, you're not really able to figure out what these eigenfunctions, generalized eigenfunctions are. Uh, you can get maybe some estimates and some properties. So this has not been widely used to get explicit expressions because, well, in most cases, it's simply fails. Uh, but anyway, people used it in the 80s to study Schrodinger operators, for example, on RD, based on, uh, on the Brownian motion of Laplacian, uh, and to some success, even. Uh, but this is kind of a motivating story for, for us, because in our case, it would turn out that we can get, well, at least half explicit or semi explicit expressions uh, for the pro processes that we're interested in. And, and we, will, we will see that the similar uh, expressions turn out to be true. Okay. Now, the uh, problem is, as I mentioned already, we're interested mostly in non symmetric Markov processes. And in this case, well, if, you're, if your operators turn out to be compact, then you can still count on uh, standard theory of, uh, of compact operators uh, apply. Uh, so to, in the optimistic scenario, you get still a convergent series for your generator, for your transition operators. Uh, but even here, convergence is not clear in, in every case. And when you move to a non-compact case, well, you know nothing really. There's, there's no general theory of uh, spectral analysis of non-normal operators, even if you assume that they correspond to uh, nice, very regular Markov processes, such as a you non-problem know, motion to the drift or something. Uh, so in, in some sense you do, but there's no general way to, to, to go. Uh, but well, if you're lucky, then maybe some, something will turn out. Uh, let's let's you know, have a look at the toy example, the simplest possible example, uh, one-dimensional Brownian motion with a drift. So let's start with one-dimensional motion with zero drift, just, just you know, the second order derivative operator or the linear process, right? Uh, so in this case, well, it's all very basic, but let's, let, let's just see what it looks like. Uh, you can write down Tanshul's formula, uh, which essentially tells you that uh, uh, well, the Fourier transform of, of the second derivative is uh, the Fourier transform of your function times minus variable squared, variable psi here, free variable. Uh, so Tanshul formula tells you that uh, the object that you're interested in, the, the quadratic form, uh, oh, bilinear in this case, bilinear form associated to your operator, can be written in a diagonal form in the Fourier variable. Uh, so when I, was, when, when I was younger, I never looked at Fourier a Tanshul formula for and, and, and this kind of expressions as a, as a spectral resolution of, uh, of an operator, but it, it turns out that this really provides you with a with a way to, to write down spectral resolution or generalize like a function expansion of the second derivative explicitly, uh, because the Fourier transform is just an inner product of you with a non L two non square integrable eigenfunction generalized eigenfunction phi psi, where phi psi is simply exponential to i psi x. Okay. So this is precisely the GEE formula we're looking for, and if or mean, here is for free as, as as long as you know the Fourier transform. All right. Uh, now the, the problem is that if you if you look at the generalizing and function expansion for uh, non-symmetric operators and non-normal operators, so you allow for different eigenfunctions and different co-eigenfunctions. Uh, then you lose uniqueness, even in this very basic case of, of, of the second derivative operator. Uh, but you can think of that integral, which was written in the previous slide, as a complex integral along the real axis. And then, if your functions behave nicely enough, then you can deform the contour of integration to a 
essentially arbitrary line that goes from minus infinity to plus infinity in any reasonable way. Uh, so you can write the second, der second, or second derivative of u of this bracket missing here, sorry, as the inner product of LU and V. Copy yeah, paste that, sorry. Uh, you can write this expression that you're interested in as uh, an integral, not necessarily along the real line, but along the arbitrary curve gamma. Mm -hmm. and, but in this case, it's, it's obvious that the, the choice of real axis for gamma is optimal in the sense that, first of all, you get the same uh, phi and psi, the same eigenfunctions and co-eigenfunctions, and also you get well-behaved functions that are bounded, for example. They're not super integral, but they are bounded. As long as you move away from the real axis, uh, this e to i psi x stops having modulus 1, so they can still be, I mean, they, they grow exponentially. This is still reasonably good, but, but it's not as good as being just bounded, right? Uh, but now let's have a look at the different example, uh, the, the one that I mentioned before, a uh, Brownian motion with true drift. Let's say b is positive, and your process goes to infinity at rate b, uh, plus, plus a Brownian motion. And in this case, the operator is just the second order derivative plus the linear term. And again, you can use Planchard's formula and the, the expression for the Fourier transform of u uh, to write the, uh, well, the, the eigen generalized eigenfunction expansion of your operator. Right? So in this case, uh, the multiplier here, the Fourier symbol here is minus psi squared plus 2b i psi. And well, it's polynomial. Right? And you, you get the same expression with the same generalized eigenfunction function phi xi. It's just exponential i xi x. Right? Uh, and that's satisfactory, that's, that's, that's kind of nice, and, and we all know that. But, but again, you can, you, you can play with, uh, with this contour of integration. And it turns out that there's a different choice, which is also reasonable here, and which is widely used in applications, which allows you to, to transform your operator into a, well, a symmetric one in some sense. Uh, namely, if you choose gamma, the curve of integration, to be a, a, a line parallel to the real axis, but with imaginary part equal to b, then this expression, minus psi squared plus 2 bi xi, stops being complex valued and becomes real valued. Okay, and in this case, the eigenfunctions are e to i psi x, which is just an the exponential of modulus 1 times an exponential function of real value parameter. And this corresponds to conditioning your process or, or transforming or your sum of transformation depending on your point of view, which allows you to think that the Brownian motion with drift is just a modified Brownian motion, let's say modified probability measure or dupe edge condition with a, uh, using the exponential harmonic function. Okay? And in this case, these two choices are both well-founded in some sense. One of them leads to bounded eigenfunctions and co-eigenfunctions, which are the same as eigenfunctions. The other one leads to different eigenfunctions and co-eigenfunctions, but the symbol becomes real. And if you symmetrize the integral, then you get real valued expressions for everything that, that appears here. So this is also reasonable. And you don't really know which, which one to choose. And then one more, let's add one more ingredient to that, to the picture. So let's add killing at zero. Okay? So you start your process at some point x, and you run it until it hits zero, and then you kill it. It's a normal resist, sub-probabilistic process. In this case, this corresponds to the same generator, because the, the behavior of the process is the same, except that you add a boundary condition at zero. So you, you set u of zero to be zero, or require u of zero to be equal to zero. Okay? And now we can do the same, but well, it's maybe not immediately clear how to find out the generalized eigenfunction expansion. Uh, one way would be to, if, if b was 0, we could just simply extend our function to be an odd function of all of r. Uh, but in this case, it, it, it's perhaps a little bit more complicated. You can use this dupe h transform trick to, to, get, to, to, to get back to the zero drift case, or your sum of transform. And that's what people usually do, but let me, let me approach this problem differently. So let's first try to solve the, the eigenvalue problem. I mean, phi is supposed to be in the, the eigenvalue of our operator, the eigenfunction of our operator. So let's solve the, solve the eigenvalue problem uh, with, uh, well, with an arbitrary eigen 
value here, uh, but this one is particularly well suited because we know the solutions for this eigenvalue. I mean, manipulating psi along psi to be complex, you could get a, an arbitrary a complex number here. So this is, in, in fact, entirely general. But for, for this eigenvalue, we, we know at least one solution, global solution, all of R. This is exponential to i psi x. But we also know another one. Uh, this is a quadratic expression, so it takes each value twice. Uh, and the same value is taken at x and at a number which is minus x plus 2iv. This is a mirror image of x with respect to the point on the complex <coughs> on the imaginary axis with, with coordinate b. Uh, so we have two solutions. By taking a linear combination of them, we can fit the boundary condition. So if you just take the difference of these two, uh, you get a solution in the positive half time which satisfies the Dirichlet boundary condition. Okay? So this is a uh, the eigenfunction which corresponds to that weird eigenvalue minus psi squared plus 2i by 2 i b psi. Okay? Uh, so now if you look at it, it's not longer clear that you'd like to keep psi real, because, because even if psi is real, then the other guy is no longer I mean, the exponent <coughs> minus psi plus 2 i b is no longer real. So if you want this one bounded, then that one grows exponentially. Or decays exponentially depending on depending on the side, really. Uh, oh, no, it's a sign of B. Uh, so so it's, it's not very clear whether we should really keep psi real. Perhaps it's better to, to, to set psi complex so that we kind of minimize, we, we make these two terms balance, or we minimize the growth of psi. Okay. Uh, so in this case, uh, an, op oops, an optimal choice is, maybe I'll use mouse for that, an optimal choice is uh, to take the line of integration which is parallel to the real axis and has imaginary, uh, imaginary part equal to, uh, to b. Uh, in fact, if you, if, you, if you really write down the expressions, you just get half of that. Well, it corresponds somehow to, to taking half line in the real space, but it's a Fourier space. It's, it's just a coincidence that I mean, you, you get a half line here as well. Uh, so so, so if, you, if you really write down the explicit expressions, what you get is uh, the integral over just a half line, or maybe any other contour which starts with the imaginary axis and goes to plus infinity, uh, of these guy, uh, where eigenfunctions and co eigenfunctions are given by the formula that you've seen in the previous slide, except that you have a complex conjugate of psi uh, in, the, in the expression for psi. And now the choice of, of the, and say, optimal contour of integration is clear again. So you, you really want to choose that one and not the real. Uh, half line, uh, because that makes uh, the eigenvalues in the, co uh, the eigenfunctions and co-eigenfunctions as, as, small, uh, as small as possible in some sense. They grow exponentially, and the rate of exponential growth is, uh, is least when you choose precisely this contour of integration. Okay? And as a bonus, you get real valued expressions, because it turns out that in this case, phi and psi are real valued or maybe purely imaginary valued that just multiply by i. You get real valued expressions and the eigenvalues are also real valued. Okay. Now, this is already a non-normal example. This operator is not normal. It does not commute with this conjugate, with this joint. Uh, so that shows you that at least in some cases it is really possible to write things down explicitly even though your operator is not a normal operator and get a useful formula. Uh, so if you write this down, really, this boils down to Fourier sign transform applied to your operators. And this is all, of course, well known. Uh, but it's a good starting point for, for our excursion. Uh, so what is our goal? Our goal is to study these kind of expansions for, well, as much Markov processes as possible. That's a probe goal. <laughs> but in this talk, we focus on a particular class of Levy processes. And as an application, you can get expressions for, uh, for the heat kernel, so for, for transition densities of your processes in a half line. And uh, by integrating them with respect to y, you get extinction probability, or actually survival probability, uh, the probability that the process is still alive at time t. Uh, so if you shift it down back uh, to the zero axis, uh, then the problem that the process is still alive by time t when it is killed at the level of minus x is essentially the same as uh, the probability, I mean, it's the same even uh, as uh, the, the infimum functional at time t being greater than minus x. 
So essentially, by integrating these outputs to y, you get the distribution of the independent functional. And the same is true, of course, for the supremum functional, not for the joint law of the two, though. Uh, so this is a way to get to the, the holy crowd of function fluctuation theory of Levy processes, in some sense. Uh, and this is in some, well, this half of my original motivation to study these kind of things. Uh, so I wanted to, to see if, if one can come up with explicit expressions for the infimum and supremum functionals of Levy processes, uh, at least in, for, for, for some class of Levy processes, including say, stable processes, not necessarily symmetric ones. Okay. Another goal was to, uh, to study the case of the interval. Uh, and for some reason, I was interested in eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of, uh, of stable processes killed upon leaving an interval, or maybe a ball in higher dimensions, but in one dimension, one is just an interval. And when you think of it, uh, well, locally, an interval is just a half line. So if, you, if you're interested in high frequencies, these two cases are not really much different. And there has been studies from fluid dynamics, hydrodynamics, from, from the 40s and 50s, where people really considered the, the case of, say, an ocean covered by a dock of whatever ice or something, uh, which is semi-infinite. They solved this explicitly, and then they used that solution to study the case of a you know, fishing problem. It's called fishing problem. So you make a circular, a circular, um, circular hole in, in the ice, and you start fishing, you observe that the water is slushing, and you wonder how high does it get, what are the frequencies, and so on. Uh, so people really get to that uh, via the infinite uh, problem, where, where explicit expressions are available due to certain phenomena in, uh, in, in complex analysis, essentially. Uh, so, so the program was essentially the same to, to see whether we can, what we can do explicitly in half-line uh, in order to apply this to, well, first, infimum and super functional, and second, to, to the interval. Uh, so when it comes to interval, uh, for symmetric processes, this was done in, already in 2012 uh, with, 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 with some success and then extended to other processes, uh, for, first for stable processes and then extended to more general symmetric Levy processes later on. Uh, for non-symmetric processes, it's still widely open. The existence of non-trivial, meaning not, not the first one, uh, eigenvalues and eigenfunctions is, is still not known as far as I know. Uh, and once this is established, probably we have a tool to get to asymptotics of these guys, but even existence is not known, as far as I can tell. So this is widely open, uh, but on the other hand, the application to, to infinite functional uh, is, is kind of settled. Okay, so I, I should say what, what kind of Levy process we study. Well, it, it, I suppose most of you know what the Levy process is. It's a translation of the Markov process on error that tells you nothing unless, unless you know what the Markov process is. Uh, if, you, if you come from PDE side and you want more interested in, in operators, so generators, so let the operator is, is a local part which corresponds to the Gaussian process, has a linear term which is the drift part, and the non-local part, which I do not write really explicitly, but which describes you the intensity of jumps. And we were mostly interested in this intensity of jumps, which I, call, which, which I did not really knew. Uh, this is what well, the density of the Levy measure, and this corresponds to this transition rate from x to y that you see in, uh, in one of the previous slides uh, when, we, when I discuss Markov chains. Right? Uh, so the, 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 the link between Levy operators and, and these characteristics and, and, and other stuff that you're familiar with is via Levy Kinchin theorem, which tells you that a, uh, the Fourier transform of L, the Fourier symbol of L, is given by what is called the characteristic exponent of the Levy process, which is again the Gaussian part a psi square, uh, the, the linear term minus i b psi, and the integral uh, of the Levy measure. Uh, and of course, when, when we say Levy Kitchen theorem, we, th we think really that uh, this is the, the exponent of uh, the characteristic function in the characteristic function of, of the distribution of x at time t. Uh, so, the, in other words, the transition operators are fully multiplied with that symbol. That's more, more, more PDE slide in some sense. Okay. And now, what kind of assumptions do we put on, on the Levy process? Uh, so, mostly, um, we're in, what, my original motivation was to study stable Levy processes, but it turns out that the theory can be made more general. What you need to assume is that uh, the density of the Levy measure is extremely nice. 
By extremely nice, I mean completely monotone, uh, which means it's on the positive half line, it's decreasing, but concave, the third derivative is again negative, the fourth derivative is positive, and so on. So in other words, by Bernstein's theorem, it's the Laplace transform of something positive or a positive measure. And on the negative half line, it's the same, but the mirror image of, of, of such Laplace transform, or a totally positive function, I mean, that's the true name. So all derivatives of new uh, for negative z are positive. Okay, uh, this is called completely monotone jumps in short and was introduced by Rogers in the 1980s. Uh, and this is our standing assumption. Um, now, the characteristic functions of these class of Levy processes uh, have been studied by Rogers in, in, in his very first paper on the topic, maybe also the last one, uh, from 1983. And he, was, he, he proved that the characteristic functions have a uh, decent complex, uh, complex analytic holomorphic uh, extension to the right complex half plane. Namely, uh, this extension is what I call Rogers functions after him. Uh, it's a, a holomorphic function such that if you divide it by psi, you get a function with positive real, uh, real, uh, real part. Uh, so in other words, f of psi over psi is a Nevanlinna big function in the right complex half plane. It preserves the right complex half plane. So if you come from the complex analysis side, then that's probably one of the basic notions, but if you don't, then that may be new. Uh, the, the, these, these class of functions, uh, the Rogers functions, uh, have very nice analytic properties, and many of them play a key role in, uh, in what I will discuss in the last part of my talk. Uh, so one of these is uh, that you can construct what I call the spine of that function. Uh, so if you remember that this function uh, divided by psi has positive real value, that means that the argument of that function is between 0 and pi on the imaginary axis and between minus pi and 0 on the negative imaginary axis. So if you, if you move along a semicircle from the negative axis to the positive, it goes from negative to positive. Uh, so the argument must be zero at some point, and call this point psi r. It turns out that, uh, uh, sorry, zeta r, z, z, z r. Uh, it turns out that this point is unique. There may be at most one point of a such semicircle uh, with argument equal to zero. So, in, in other words, it's at most one point at which this extension of the characteristic exponent takes a real value. Uh, so that tells you that there is a curve which starts at the origin, possibly, and goes somewhere to infinity, which crosses uh, circles at, in, in at most one point, well, exactly one point, uh, along which your Rogers function, your, the characteristic exponent, takes real values. Okay? Uh, it may turn out that it doesn't really start at the origin, or it can go back to the imaginary axis, because the argument can be really zero also on the imaginary axis. It's not strictly negative here and positive here, it is just not positive here and not negative here. But apart from that, it's, it's essentially arbitrary. And uh, moreover, well, this is the level set of a harmonic function, of the argument of a, of a holomorphic function. So it's smooth, but it need not be smooth at the boundary. So the question is how regular it is in the boundary. And this turns out to be important in order to have some integrals conversion. So it turns out that this is Helder continuous. So the, the, the dependence of uh, zeta on r is 1 over 30 Hilder continuous. So the exponent is 1 over 30. I mean, it's not optimal. The likely optimal Hilder exponent is 1 half. At least that's the worst one can construct easily. Uh, but I don't have a proof for that. And if you evaluate your function at this zeta r, you get what I call lambda r. Lambda, this will be, serve as the eigenvalue in a minute. Uh, and this turns out to be 1 3 Hilder continuous. And this, this is an optimal exponent. That's quite funny that you can't get uh, the optimal Hilder exponent of, of zeta r, but if you compose it with that, then it's simple to, to see that it, it, it's, it's one third Hilder continuous. Now, uh, okay, so the picture here is, is really nice, but uh, I mean, this, the curve is, is really nice, well behaved, but some, some strange things can happen. Here are some, some examples of, of spines. So if you take the Brownian motion plus drift, then the spine is just the, the horizontal half line that we've seen before, the integral, uh, the curve along which we, we integrated in the generalized eigenfunction expansion for the uh, burn motion drift killed at zero. Uh, for stables, this is also straight. Uh, it's a ray originating from the origin, 
um, with the angle of theta, which corresponds to the parameters of the stable process. Uh, so the stable process is parameterized by this uh, scale parameter, which doesn't play any role here, but also a symmetric parameter, uh, which is typically called beta, and you can express theta in terms of that, that parameter beta. Uh, you can think about two stable processes, independent stable processes added together. So if their indices of stability are different, then you get what is sometimes called the mixed stable process. And uh, in this case, uh, this curve gamma is no longer straight. It looks like, uh, it means kind of almost straight at zero at infinity. And the tangent lines, and the, the tangent line at zero and the asymptotic line at infinity corresponds to these two stable parts. Uh, so so that, that kind of tells you that the local behavior of your process translates into the global behavior of, uh, of the characteristic exponent and vice versa. And you can make it really rigorous. Uh, so these are still very nice, but, but you can see much, much less nice examples. Uh, you can think about processes, which are sometimes called meromorphic level processes, uh, for which the characteristic exponent is a meromorphic function. In this case, you can, you can calculate things explicitly, and uh, the, the spines for these kind of processes can be like a semicircle here, uh, like a bunch of semicircles here, uh, a, a line which, which kind of reflects from the imaginary axis, uh, axis at, at the angle pi over 3. You can get arbitrarily close or even be tangent to the imaginary axis if you prefer, which causes some troubles, and that's why we really need some regularity of that new boundary, uh, for otherwise the integrals that I'm going to write won't be converted simply. We'll come back to that one at the end of the talk, which is getting very near. By the way, I should speed up. Uh, okay, so what we're interested in is, uh, in, in analytical terms, is an operator which is uh, constrained to zero infinity. So we put kind of zero boundary condition in the exterior. And in probabilistic terms, we just terminate our process whenever it goes below zero. Okay? And we add a plus to the notation to indicate that we're interested in these kind of operators. So let me move to, to the results. Uh, so first, uh, the, the first result on that was for symmetric processes, in which case we know from the tourist result that there are generalized eigenfunctions, and it turns out that one can write them explicitly. I won't give you the formulas because they involve uh, some Laplace transforms of, of objects which are defined in terms of exponentials of integrals. It's pretty complicated to fill in the slide and not really tell you much. Uh, the, the, the main point is that the eigenfunction phi r is essentially the sine wave. And the sine wave with frequency given by r and the phase shift uh, given by some explicit integral alpha r. Okay? So these two are given sort of explicitly, I mean alpha r completely explicitly. Uh, the, the, the correction phi tilde, which, which, which appears here, is a completely monotone function which is also given by some weird integral. And you can really get to that if you, if you, if you think about, of, of an example that you can write down an expression explicitly in some sense. Uh, so, so, so the picture is here. Uh, the blue one is the eigenfunction, the red one is the sine wave, and this completely modern correction kind of fixes that sine wave at the origin and smooths it, and smooths uh, that correction up to infinity, right? Uh, so asymptotically phi r is just a sine wave, but uh, near the origin weird things can happen, okay? So that was approved uh, in the early 2010s with Gyatso uh, Kowalski and Michał Ryzna. And then it was applied, as I mentioned, to study the interval and also to study fluctuation theory to some extent. Okay? But this is symmetric and is, is, I mean, kind of boring. Uh, let's see what happens for non symmetric ones. So here is the, the, the main result in some sense. Uh, let's uh, have a look at it. There are some assumptions. Uh, under these assumptions, we get the GEE formula. So the, 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 the action of the transition operator on U tested against the function v, is given by the integral that we're interested in. z is, is the set of those r's for which the spine intersects the semicircle. Lambda r is the value of the, of, of the characteristic exponent of its holomorphic extension at that intersection point. And phi r and psi r are again given kind of explicitly. They're written here. And the main part is again that we have the, the, the kind of sine wave minus a correction, okay? And now, uh, 
Let, let's have a closer look at it. So uh, what we assume is that the Levy process just has completely monotone jumps so that the characteristic exponent extends to a Rogers function. Uh, but there's also this technical assumption which is needed in order to write down the integrals so that they converge. Uh, what does it tell you? That the, the spine at infinity does not get too close to the imaginary axis. Okay? So the argument of zeta r, which is just a point on the spine, uh, is not too close to plus or minus pi over 2. Okay? That's the only assumption about the process. There's also an assumption about the test functions u and v. They need to be admissible, and I'll explain that in the next slide. One intermediate slide. Okay, and the, the, the eigenfunctions, the generalized eigenfunctions, are given by the sine wave modulated by a, a, a exponentially growing or exponentially decaying amplitude. There are phase shifts which are different for eigenfunctions and co eigenfunctions. There are correction terms which are again completely monotone, so they are kind of small. Uh, but notice that one of these two guys is exponentially decaying, the other one is exponentially growing. So if, if say, the imaginary part of zeta r is positive, then phi r will be exponentially decaying, so very, very weird behavior for it like the function. So it will be actually an L2 eigenfunction. And the other one will be exponentially growing, which makes things bad because you want to integrate with respect to v and then you fall into trouble. Okay. So that's the result. Uh, now, if you think that u and v are, say, compactly supported, then you can estimate roughly how big these guys are. And it turns out that, uh, that the first one grows exponentially, while the other one decays only as a power function, which makes the integral divergent. You can write, write it like that for no compactly supported U and V. Uh, so that means that admissible might, must mean something else, not smooth, infinitely smooth, and compactly supported. This is too bad. You need something else. Uh, so the right condition is that, well, first of all, u extends the whole morphic function in a sufficiently wide cone. <laughs> and uh, then the Laplace transform of u extends to an entire function which is unbounded near the negative half axis. Uh, but you, certainly, but, but you assume that it is bounded in a sufficiently large hole. I mean, this is a consequence of the estimates on, on u uh, of that kind in that sector. Uh, but actually what you need is only uh, the bound for the Fourier transform, for the Laplace transform. If you move to the Fourier transform, then you rotate your picture by 90 degrees. And uh, so the Fourier transform must extend to a holomorphic function in that region, except for the epsilon, the two epsilon cone, uh, or angular sector near the, uh, near the imaginary axis. Okay. Uh, now, this class of functions is dense. It's sufficiently rich. For example, uh, exponential uh, if minus r times psi log psi is admissible for any r, which gives you a Laplace-like family of functions which are admissible, and linear combinations of these are dense in L2. So you can approximate any L2 function with that. So it's a decent class of test functions. Uh, but no compactly supported function is in the class, which is kind of weird. Uh, all right. Uh, now, if you want to apply your theorem to get a pointwise expression for the heat kernel, what you will essentially do, I'll move back two slides, um, you would like to expand the integrals in these color products here, get a triple integral in the right hand side, change the order of integration, and observe that both integrals, both sides are integrals of u and v with respect to some kernel. And since u and v are from a dense class of functions, you, you, you can conclude that the kernels are actually the same almost everywhere, and since they are continuous, they are the same everywhere. So that will bring you to the expression for the heat kernel, right? Then it's okay as long as you can change the order of integration. And you can't. What I told you in the previous slide tells you explicitly that with no additional assumptions, you can't. And in order to do that, you need to assume something. For example, you need to assume sufficiently many small jumps or sufficiently big uh, local activity of your process, as it is sometimes phrased. Um, and the te technically, the assumption is from here. It means that epsilon is of the form pi over 2 beta, where beta is some number greater than 1. And then the integral, which involves the imaginary part of the point on, your, on the spine, must be bounded by something like that. That's a technical assumption, which is true 
for many processes, for example, for every stable process of index greater than 3 over 2, for most, well, in some level process, stable level processes with index between 1 and 2, 1 and 1 half, 1 and 1.5, and only for symmetric level processes, stable level processes with index below 1. This is not quite optimal as we have a result for general stable uh, level processes obtained with more or less the same method, but, but which also takes advantage of the fact that the, the spine is a straight line in this case. And this might possibly be extended to some more general processes, but that gets just too technical to overcome the difficulties. Uh, so, so this result, as stated here, is not quite optimal for the case of stable level processes, and certainly not optimal within the class of level processes completely more than jumps. Uh, but it's just the best one can, one can get with the methods that are available to us. Okay? So we get a pointwise kind of explicit expression for the heat kernel for a pretty general Levy process. It's, it's something that I was surprised that is, is, is ever possible. Now, it, you can think that you can integrate it with respect to y to get the expression for the infimum functional, and that's essentially what you do. So you get the Fourier transform of that guy at zero. Well, that's Fourier transform understood in a proper sense. Uh, but, but the proof is actually completely different. You start from scratch and you reprove that formula and to, to get well reasonably wide assumptions. So the assumptions are a little bit different in that case. Uh, so you, the, the, the spine can touch the imaginary axis uh, on the positive side. It cannot touch it on the negative side, side though. But on the other hand, you need some regularity to be able to kind of pass the limit at zero here in some sense. And I don't want to make it rigorous. Uh, so the, the regularity is uh, required, I mean, is, is found by requiring the, the, the extension of uh, the characteristic exponent to have positive, strictly positive argument along the line segment somewhere here, which is a very technical assumption, but that tells you roughly uh, that your, the, the characteristic exponent scales well at low scales. It's, it's kind of weak scaling condition, as some people tend to call it, uh, but written in a somewhat different way. Uh, it's not, not clear how to translate these, uh, this, this condition into, into conditions on the levy measure, but we give some sufficient conditions on the levy measure which uh, assert that this, is, this holds true. Okay? And in this case, as these assumptions are written here, I don't want to discuss them in detail because they are kind of technical, uh, assert that we can really get an expression for the infinite functional. Notice that there's just a negative of the imaginary part here, no longer an absolute value of the imaginary part of zeta r which gives you some flexibility. In particular, you can apply it to, to a number of explicit examples to get really explicit formulas. Uh, so one that I find particularly cute is a classical risk process. So take a, a, a unit drift upwards and, and, and negative jumps with exponential distribution uh, such that the process that you get is a martingale. So, so it's perfectly compensated by the drift. The jumps are per perfectly compensated by the drift. Okay, then up to scaling uh, of time space, you can write the characteristic exponent as, as uh, in that form as minus i size square over 10 minus i. And then if you figure out what the spine is, it's just a semicircle. It's the example that you've seen before. Okay. Now you can write down the Fourier transforms of the general eigenfunctions and co-eigenfunctions. You can transform them back easily. These are just uh, meromorphic functions. Uh, you can write down the integral, and it turns out that the distribution of the infimum functional of that guy can be written as a simple integral. Uh, the original one looks like that. It's a little, it gets a little bit simpler if you, if you substitute alpha for 2 times arc sine of 1 half r. And in this case, you get an integral from 0 to pi of that expression. It's a numerically stable, a fairly explicit expression for the distribution of the infimum function of one of the fundamental processes in, say, risk theory. And as far as I know, this expression is new. And there are not so many explicit expressions for, for, for that guy. So that might be one of the most numerically stable and efficient ways to evaluate that probability. And I'm not an expert in that, but any comments on that would be welcome. Uh, and you can do the same essentially for the process with small drift. So if, if the drift is smaller, or the jumps occur at a higher rate, as in here, so add, that should be r squared, sorry, add a, a coefficient r squared to the, to the rate of, of, of jumps, 
Then you can again write down everything explicitly that the semicircle becomes a little bit larger. The capital R corresponds to the radius of the semicircle. And the expression is a little bit nastier, but still it's numerically stable and pretty efficient in, in numerical calculations. I was kind of skeptical about these expressions, so I did some numerical experiments. I agree with, with Monte Carlo methods, so it looks like it looks, looks legit. Okay, uh, I'm running out of time, so let me just uh, mention that, uh, well, I already told that the Fourier sine transform leads to the general second function expansion for the Brandon motion. For the Brandon motion with drift, this can be this completely standard, this can be found by Dupes H transform, by Gish Sanders transform, or, or by whatever else, uh, if you like. Uh, the symmetric, uh, symmetric uh, processes and operators uh, correspond to certain subordinate Brownian motions corresponding to complete subordinators, as it is called. And this was studied in a series of papers started with the tool that I mentioned before. And then I mentioned a paper with Alexey Kuznetsov from 2018, where we study uh, stable levy processes. Uh, in this paper, we do essentially the same thing as we do here. But we speak a completely different language. Uh, there's a special function involved, the double sign function, which is fairly weird. But if you know Alexei, you know that he's mass uh, in special functions and complex analysis. So he was able to handle that. Uh, and the general algos was studied in the two papers that uh, one of them appeared in 2019 and one is submitted last year. Uh, if you ask about the proof, I won't give you any details. I'll just show the sketch of the proof, which consists of, of, of uh, well, mostly. Uh, simple and well-known tools, but from various worlds, various areas of mathematics. You start with fluctuation theory, and then you do some complex analysis, which is not really very much involved, but I mean, nothing fancy there, but it's a little bit technical, and it gets even more technical when you want to uh, change the order of integrals and, and deform contours of integration, and, and like that. And even some harmonic analysis is involved, because you need, at some point you need regularity of Hilbert transform of heterocontinuous functions, most uh, essentially. And uh, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. 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 Thank you
The first speaker is speak, uh, Nate Maker. The title of this presentation is uh, Forecasting Power Concentration of O3, MO2, and PM10 using mixture of dynamic generalized additive models. I must apologize, but I would like to drop out additive to do it from my presentation. This is because uh, it's there. This is a very powerful theory and methodology and well developed software, but for such type of data with a lot of predictors. It's quite heavy to, to have good results <coughs> for a short period of time. So, I will continue with generalized linear models instead. This is a joint work with some colleagues from the National Institute of Meteorology. Uh, this is a project with the municipality of Sofia because it's important for the health and other social activity of the citizen in this town. <coughs> it is important to have a forecast at about 72 hours ahead <coughs> in order to have um, to make a decision to stop the transport and other things. So from an economical point of view it's very hard take a decision depending on the pollution of the atmosphere. Today the weather is bad, but there is no air pollution <laughs> in, the, in the area of Sofia town. <clears throat> so some of the people, uh, Nekov, Nechev, Nekov are statisticians, the other are meteorologists who are developing numerical weather prediction models. Uh, as I said already, some of the results that I am going to present are 40 forecast of 48 hours, some are 70 hours ahead. For several five monitoring stations distributed in the Sofia area. These are Pavlo, Hipodruma, Drupa, Nadezhda and Kopetito. These are air quality monitoring stations of the Executive Environmental Agency. They are collecting data in every hour. Every 15 minutes they make average and re report the hourly concentration So, the data that are analyzed recently concern this period of time. 1st January 2019, 7th May 2021. These are 20,592 hourly average value concentrations of these ingredients. They are missing value because of the failure of the equipment or human error. So, for instance, only 1918-1941 are complete observations. The other are missing observations. Standard statistical methods are not able to process cases with missing observations. We have to recover this data somehow to improve the quality of the data or to drop out them from the statistical analysis. So it's important to, to try because we've got five stations to improve the quality. 
of this data. So uh, you are missing about 10 data. Ten, ten samples. I, I, I do not understand what you are asking. How many data are you missing? 20,592 data because we make imputation, we improve the quality of the data. For instance, 175 observations are missing for ozone in these Pavlo stations. Uh, 25 observations are missing in NO2, but I am only two ingredients I am showing, and 145 simultaneously in the same hour are missing. That's why, uh, in general, 3,102 points are missing data due to failure of the equipment. So we have to improve using information from the other sessions. We can use standard multiple time series regression models in order to make this imputation on the data to improve the quality. Uh, to have an impression about the distribution of um, NO2, these are monthly box distributions. You can see that during the cold half of the year, the values are very high. During the days, NO2 are very high because this is a special process dependent from the vehicle and other. These are during the week and weekend. The values are smaller than during the weekdays for this period of time. This is about ozone distributions. It is well known that ozone the values are very high during the warmer part of the year, warmer part of the day at noon, because this is a photochemical process and depends on NO2. <clears throat> and this is about PM10. Also during the winters the concentration is very high because Everybody is heating in surrounding Sofia because this is a valley surrounded by mountains, so the inversion is very difficult. Today we've got a bad weather, but clear atmosphere. <coughs> Due to the wind and the rainfall. So, <coughs> the distribution is highly non normal. <coughs> You can see from the right skew distribution of NO2 and quite complex for ozone data. Here is the logarithm of these uh, values, and you can see <coughs> that if somebody is trying to do with normal distribution, this is not appropriate for any other purposes. Uh, so, how to make forecasting models, we rely on the numerical weather prediction models to give deterministic forecast of three days ahead and to use this as a predictor for the stochastics model. Um, in this particular study, we are using well-known weather research and forecasting model developed in the United States. I'm not going to say because I'm not specialist <coughs> in this area, but one can uh, get output of work model, deliver 72 hours forecast, which is one kilometer by one kilometer, and can characterize the atmosphere from the ground to six kilometer above the surface. We are using not only the derivatives of the weather world model but also lack of this 
derivatives as well lack of this ink air pollution ingredients so the number of the predictors increase exponentially here are the derivatives of the work models surface temperature with 2 meters dew point temperature soil temperature surface temperature etc wind direction wind speed i'm not going to <coughs> give more information about this because the distribution of the concentration is highly complex it's not possible to and then using logarithm of uh, this uh, concentration with air pollution i i use for no2 o3 or pm10 at the moment t let's by xt denote the vector of predictors of the matrix of the predictors of the data well with lux y t minus r t minus e and what kind of lux well i deserve a lux of the concentration which are which is of interest predictors are due to the work model also finite fourier terms are included in order to follow the cyclic behavior of the process during the day during the day of the years in the camp because of the concentration during the weeks are higher than during the weekend so it we can use categorical variable as a predictor and due to the complexity we decided to use a mixture of gaussian distribution regression time series models however with not fixed p but functions uh, of the pre of the some of the predictors in this way we are, we are solving uh, we estimate this p by or the nominal logistic regression model because this is a multinomial probabilities with this constraints the distribution of psi with j, j component this is a standard normal linear regression model if i would like to use generalized additive models any one of these predictors should be a spline function or wavelet or some other function of the predictors and there is no unknown parameters in explicit form but they exist because of the representation with splines and the number of unknown parameters became much larger than with the with this explicit linear form so the number of parameter increase and what does this mean with probability p1 we got one model for one type of weather with probability pj we got another model and this is the weighted linear combination of models in order to make prediction for y <clears throat> we are maximizing the to to maximum with the maximum likelihood we are maximizing the likelihood function but this is a complex uh, <clears throat> um, optimization problem because we have to solve with constraints this lagrangian and in order to reduce the number of predictors or to make a selection of the significant predictors we are using additional term penalization or regularization technique lasso in this way because we are using first norm of the unknown coordinates of the vector side so <clears throat> uh, 
how to estimate and how to under, uh, have an impression about the quality of the feeds. We split the data in training and uh, testing data. With the training, we are estimating the unknown coefficients of the model, unknown parameters. For instance, in this, in this case, the first two years are used for training data, and in 2021, we're using for testing, to test the quality of the feed. But because of the process, this is a time series process, we have to do it in a special way. Using the rolling forecasting origin procedure cross-validation technique developed by Hidman and the Greek, one of his students. What does this mean, rolling forecasting procedure? Because we are using 48 hours ahead, we are testing, we are making a model for the training data and make prediction the first and second January. Then we predict this data of the first and second January without any information, only use the coefficients of the model and the predictor of the testing data. They are independent from the training data set. We store these predictions this forecast and first and the information of the first and second January is added to the training data set. Then we estimate the parameter again and use third and fourth January. We store the prediction and remove the data for the third and fourth January to the training data set in order to have independent forecast on this. So, as a result, in order to have the impression about this, uh, about the quality of the feed, we are using, well, we, we are selecting a best model by Bayesian information criteria, etc., etc., with a lot of running of, of these things. <coughs> and we are using mean absolute error, mean bias error, root mean square. All this measured are based on forecasting data. We are forecasting and then we subtract from the real data but in this rolling procedure. So these are the quality of the fits. Well, they are reasonable. It's not possible to well, perhaps, perhaps it's possible to in, reduce the, the values of root mean squares or to increase the, um, Pearson, the value of the Pearson correlation coefficient. But we are not uh, satisfied with, um, well, it's always uh, nice to have a high quality, uh, high value of the Pearson correlation coefficient, but this is not the best uh, measure for the quality of the field because extremes in the data um, we follow the trend but extremes are not able to account some here are some you to have an impression about the quality of the field for different time period for instance, these 3,000 3, and um, more hours, the first 142 hours, 43 hours, uh, because zero, 42 hours, uh, and with the red line, with the red lines, these are the observed, but in the trade uh, with the test data, and the blue one are the forecasting with the disrolling forecasting procedure. Any, any two days are forecasted. <coughs> this is for the second portion of the hours. 
third portion and fourth portion of this period in order to have an impression if we are successful or not successful visually with this specific model we for NO2, this is for O3, the same for PM10. Well, these are very high, although these are not so high. This is about 50 or 60 um, measure one. And this is if we transform the continuous values in contingency table because the society don't need the exact value of the forecasting but in some categorical variables because 50 is a critical value for the for the health information that's why we are doing this in this contingency table in order to have an impression <coughs> about the quality of the fit. Is it possible to use uh, directly to transform the original data and to use the nominal logistic regression, regression time series model? It's difficult because when we transform the data in categorical, by mean the ingredient of concentrations, the contingency table is too sparse and so it's not possible to estimate the, uh, robustly the probabilities for belonging to this category. That's why we prefer in this way to model the process. Well, I think I'm not able to to give you more information about uh, this. Our desire is to use uh, generalized additive models because the functional relationship in these models <coughs> would be much better than with this linear form in participation in the models. Uh, of course, it is better to use this mixture of distribution with heavy tail like student distributions or we've got experience with gamma distributions what normal inver inverse gaussian uh, i demonstrated only with the log normal because it's very simple understandable so this is a work in progress thank you very much for your information Because 
one mixture, one of the components of the mixture is related with some type of weather. The other um, component of the mixture is related with another type of weather. And in this type of weather, some of the variables are not significant, but in another type, they are significant. So it's not possible to reduce this variable from the whole process of uh, handling of the computations. So we need uh, to use more powerful software. Okay, do you have more questions? Uh, please. Can you go back one slide? So just what? The question is about one, back one slide. Which one? So the one you just on the, the table. Next one. Which number? Uh, I don't know. I don't see the numbers. This yeah, this one. Yeah. So it says that when the when the observed levels were around were below fifty, then this is correct, uh, correctly predicted. Uh, I guess what ninety five percent of the time, ninety seven percent of the time. But when the the observed things are over fifty, then it would seem to be much higher rate of maybe 10-15% error. So in the sense that, you know, if you read off this table and say that the predictions are more accurate when the, when the, when the actual, when it's low, then it's uh, I, I'm afraid I didn't understand you. I can't hear quite well what you are asking me. Yes. Like probably my English so, is not so good. So when, when the observed levels, say the top table, is below 50, then that is correctly forecast I guess that looks like 98% of the time. But when the observed levels are over 50, then there's quite a lot of false false predictions. There maybe 30%. So three out of 11 is 30%. Let's discuss this later. More questions? More questions, please.
All numeric, all random elements that we discuss are defined on a, in on one and the same probability space with filtration omega fp. It's well known that the Poisson homogeneous Poisson process is usually interpreted as the number of events that have happened, usually renewals, that have happened before the time t if the interregular times are independent, exponentially distributed. Um, here we denote everywhere the interregular times by tau 1, tau 2, and so on. By assumption, t0 is equal to 0, and tn is the moment of the arrival of the end event. In homogeneous Poisson process, it's well known that it is Erlang distributed. More precisely, the definition for homogeneous Poisson process is well known. You know that it almost sure start, its sample parts almost sure start from the coordinate beginning. It has independent additive increments, which means that over an overlapping intervals, the number of events are independent. And if we have a fixed time interval ST, the number of events is Poisson distributed with parameter lambda times t minus s, which means that this process has stationary additive increments or the number of events depends on the length of, on, of the interval but does not depend on the position of the interval over a real line. In order to feel the difference between the mixed uh, homogeneous Poisson process and mixed Poisson process, we have simulated five sample parts of a homogeneous Poisson process with intensity 1 and five sample parts of a mixed Poisson process with the same mean for a fixed, for any fixed uh, point of time. And you can see, you can observe the over dispersion in any mixed Poisson process. Any mixed Poisson process is over dispersed, in particular our mixed Poisson stasis process also will be over dispersed. In 1920, Greenwood and Q have considered a mixed Poisson process with gamma mixing variable. In this way, they discovered the so-called negative binomial process. And we use the main ideas about mixing of Poisson processes start from their work. In 1964, Stacy defined a very interesting distribution. It is a generalization of the gamma distribution. It is defined by this probability density function. And it's interesting to know that this is the distribution of the root C of a gamma random variable with parameters alpha and beta to power C. This distribution is very general. For example, it contains as a particular case the positive Weibull distribution. It appears when the first parameter is 1 and the parameter C is actually the uh, shape parameter of the Weibull distribution. For example, here c is equal to 2, and here c is equal to 1 over 2, and here we have heavier tails than here. <coughs> you are more familiar with Weibull distribution. If the parameter c is negative and, c is equal, and alpha is equal to 1, the classic Stacy distribution contains also Frenchet distribution in his family. The, minor, the parameter, the absolute value of parameter C is actually the shape parameter of the Frenchy distribution. Here you have 100 sample parts of a Frenchy distribution with the shape parameter 2, and here you observe 100 simulations of a Frenchy distribution with shape parameter 1 over 2, or this is much heavier case than this. In order to get a better idea about the behavior of, of the Stacy uh, random variables, we have plotted also some uh, probability density functions. On the left figure, you have uh, Stacy distributed uh, probability density functions of Stacy distributed random variables with parameters 1, 1. And when C is positive, these are actually very positive density probability density functions. When C is negative, these are actually probability density, two particular cases of probability density functions of rigid random variables. In case when we have positive label with uh, parameter, shape parameter 1 over 2, the probability density is plotted by dotted red line, uh, dotted uh, 
already one, yes. And if we have a fractured distribution with the same shape parameter, this probability density is this uh, black dashed line, and you can observe there is a, their asymptotic equivalence in the tail. They have asymptotically equivalent regular variety tails. The second uh, figure depicts the scaling property of the uh, Stacy distribution and why the parameter beta is not important. Here the parameter beta is equal to 1, here the parameter beta is equal to 2. The only difference between these two plots, as you can see, is that here we have divided the scale by 2 and here we have multiplied this uh, axis, the scale this axis by 2. Therefore, parameter beta is not important, it is not so informative about the considered distribution. The Stacy distribution consists of much more uh, behaviors, can model much more behaviors than only fractured or positive label. For example, if alpha is equal to 2, you can observe uh, the corresponding probability density functions for different parameters C. On the right plot, the parameter alpha is equal to 1 over 2. And it's interesting that as a particular case, the Stacy distribution contains folded normal. Also, the folded normal is in this family. And this is the well-known probability density function of the folded normal distribution. In our work, we need the following Kratzel integral. It is very similar, but not uh, identical, and uh, it does not contain as a particular case the gamma function. But something similar to the gamma function, new parameter appears in the same way as the corresponding parameter of the gamma function. However, here we have one more parameter rho, and this uh, Kratzel integral has two popular presentations. They differ in the substitution. If in the first integral we substitute 1 over y with t, we obtain the second integral. It's well known that this Kratzel integral is very well investigated, uh, is, very, is well defined when rho is positive, in that case nu can be any complex number, or when rho is negative, the real value of nu also has to be negative. It's interesting to note that this Kratzel integral has been defined and very well investigated in a Bulgarian proceedings, in a proceedings of an international conference in Bulgaria in 1979 by Kratzel. Later on, there are also some investigations of the Kratzel integral. However, the main investigations date from this year. There are very small particular cases when the Kratzel integral can be expressed in explicit form by, by a gamma function. However, as you will see later on, we can work with this integral because it can be computed, it can be plotted, corresponding functions can be plotted, the corresponding kind of variables can be simulated, which means that only the formula looks complicated, but it only looks complicated. It is not difficult for work with it. In order to define our process further on, we need to define the distribution of the interregular times. They will be dependent in the process that we will define la later on. And we need the following definition. We say that the random variable tau is x stacy distributed with parameters alpha, beta, and c, alpha and beta every value will be positive, c every value will be different from zero. And we define this probability density function via, uh, we define this random variable via its probability density function and we denote briefly this in this way. Tau belongs to the class of vector space distribution with such parameters. This distribution contains as a particular case parameter distribution. It appears when c is equal to 1 and it's very interesting because when c is equal to minus 1 we again obtain different parameter distribution with different parameterization and it is proven in the, in the paper of Wilmot from 1993. Again, we have simulated some uh, realizations of such random variables in order to observe them 
I have many quotes, but I'm afraid that I have not enough time, therefore I will skip the next quotes, only will show them for a while, in order to be able to discuss them during the break. And these are the realizations of uh, x stacy random variables. They, they are something similar to exponential distribution. Here you can see the corresponding probability density functions, some of the cases for different parameters. <coughs> And we should know that in 2014, Prince introduced the Kratzel distribution and describes the relation with generalized gamma distribution. In 2019, Kudrevcev defines gamma exponential distribution of the so-called G distribution. But both these L types are different from the X Stacy one, which means that our definition seems to be novel. At least I don't know previous. Uh, such definitions. As far as the random elements that we will discuss, most of them will be dependent. We need some, depend some definitions of multivariate distributions. And first we define the bivariate x stacy distribution of the first kind with the same parameters by its probability density function and we denote this distribution in this way. In this theorem, we investigate the properties of this distribution. We show that it is a mixture, or it appears as a distribution of exponential random variable, given that the parameter is stacy distributed. It possesses the scaling property, and uh, the second parameter is the scale parameter, similarly to the stacy and similarly to the exponential distribution. This random variable is well defined as far as it is a ratio of two independent random variables. Further on, we have computed its uh, moments, different moments, and we have found the condition when these moments exist. They are not always finite. The variance is always also not always finite, and this is the condition, the variance to be finite. And this distribution has equivalent presentation. It can be expressed as continuous function of two independent random variables. Further on, we have found the probability density function of the mixing variable given the mixed variable. And the mean square regression, first of the mixed variable given the mixing variable. This expectation comes from the exponential distribution, nothing substantial. But this is interesting. The mean square regression of the mixed variable given the mixing variable has this form. And more interesting is that in case one S C is equal to 1, this distribution is just gamma distribution with parameters alpha plus 1 and T plus beta. And therefore, this uh, complicated formula in that case is very, has very simple form and it is just the expectation of a gamma random variable. Again, we have plotted some mean square regressions of x stacy distribution in order to observe it, which means that uh, we need inverse relation in order to use this uh, mean square regression. So, in order to define the intervariable times between the, uh, in the process that we will define later on, we need the following definition. We said that the random vector tau 1, tau 2, tau k has multivariate x stacy distribution of the second kind with such the same parameters. If it has such uh, probability density function, joint probability density function, we haven't written this in our manuscript up to now, but it is a working version. Actually, here the copula is Archimedean, if someone is interested in copula. We denote uh, this distribution in this way, and again in particular, in case when c is equal to 1, we obtain some form of multivariate Pareto distribution with Archimedean copula. In order to describe the distribution of the moment of arrival of the end event, we need the L1 stacy distribution with parameters n, and the next, are, the next parameters come from the parameters of the stacy distribution. We denote this in this way. Tn is a long stacy distributed with such parameters. And again, we have plotted this probability density function 
Never mind that Kratzel integral participates in this probability density function, we can plot these densities, we can observe them. And now, these are the properties of the ecstasy distribution of the second kind. It appears as a distribution of the ID exponential random variables with one and the same mixing variable which is Stacy distributed. Therefore, this is X Stacy of the second kind, this is its univariate marginals are X Stacy with the same parameters. This vector is well defined as far as it can be presented as a continuous function of uh, uh, in different random variables. In this case these are exponential and this is Stacy. The next property explains why this is a one stacy distribution as far as this is some of these eight stacy distributions and analogous to the relation between exponential and one distribution we have called this distribution a one stacy and we have found the numerical characteristics and the cases when the expectation and the variance exist. Also there are some different uh, transformations that, uh, that uh, present again the erlang stacy random variable. This distribution possesses the scaling property and for c equal to 1, if we divide the erlang stacy random variable by beta, we obtain a beta prime, well known beta prime distribution. And now in order to uh, count the number of events up to time t, we need to mix it with own Stacy distribution. We have defined it by its probability mass function. This probability mass function is proper, and never mind that participate uh, that gradual integral participates here. We have plotted some of the probability mass functions and we have observed them. Something similar to geometric, but not exactly the same. And this is the main definition in our work. Let lambda be positive and strictly increasing in continuous function starting from the coordinate beginning point. This is uh, non-random time change. C let be a Stacy random variable and when n1 to be homogeneous Poisson process with in independent of x. We call a random process n, uh, which is this n1 of x times lambda t, a mixed Poisson process with Stacy mixing variable or MPPS process and briefly we will denote this in this way. The condition that uh, time change starts from the coordinate beginning is not so restrictive as far as otherwise we would shift the mix of Poisson process with its initial value. And again, for C equal to 1, we obtain the well-known result, and we can check our results by using this result, that this, um, this is a non-random time change polar process, or the so-called negative binomial time series process. And time negative binomial process appears as a particular case of the Poisson, Poisson Stacy process. We have plotted some sample paths of a mixed Poisson process with Stacy mixing variable. This dependence on the trend function is not so important. More important is the dependence on the parameters of the Stacy distribution. Here, alpha is equal to 1 over 2, beta is equal to 2, c is equal to minus 0.5, and we observe relatively small number of isolated the sample paths. If C is equal to 1, we have a time change negative binomial process and we have more isolated sample paths. And if C is equal to 0 0.5, we have many isolated sample paths. In order to describe the joint distribution of the time intersection of mixed Poisson Stacy process, we define the order on Stacy distribution. The first parameters come from the Stacy distribution, and we need the second, the next parameters, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n. 
And this probate, multivariate probability mass function is defined on the set where k1 is less than k2 and so on, less than kn, all of them are integer. This multivariate probability mass function is defined in this way. We briefly denote this as order with some stacy with such parameters. In order to describe the additive increments, because in our process they are dependent, we need also mixed Poisson Stacy distribution, multivariate mixed Poisson Stacy distribution with the same parameters, and this is the formula for the mixed Poisson Stacy with such parameters. As maybe some of you can guess, the next propositions explain the relation between these two multivariate distributions. If this vector is ordered Poisson Stacy, these additive increments are mixed Poisson Stacy. And conversely, if this vector is mixed Poisson Stacy, its cumulative sums are ordered Poisson Stacy. And now we investigate the properties of mixed Poisson Stacy process. Its univariate marginals are, has mixed Poisson Stacy distribution. Only the second parameter change, it is beta divided by lambda times t. We have found the numerical characteristics of the mixed Poisson Stacy process and the conditions which guarantee the existence of the mean and the variance. Then we have probability generating function, formula for the probability generating function, probability density function of the mixing variable given the number of events, the mean square regression of the mixed variable given the process, and um, factorial moments of the mixed Poisson Stacy process. As I already mentioned, we needed this, uh, we need this definition in order to describe the multiple distributions of the mixed Poisson Stacy process. And we need this distribution in order to describe the additive increments of the mixed Poisson Stacy process and they are not independent. Tau 1, Tau 2 are dependent, which means that this is not a renewal process. And tau n, these are exp stacy distributed, this is the one stacy distributed. We can present our process as a Cox process if we use the stacy uh, process, if we define, we could define stacy process in this way. And uh, in that case, however, the investigation will be more complicated, therefore this is just a note. And the last theorem in my talk concerns the merging of mixed Poisson Stacy process. If we have a Stacy random variable and given this Stacy random variable, these are homogeneous Poisson process, then when we merge mixed Poisson Stacy process, we obtain again mixed Poisson Stacy process. Only the parameter bit of change will have to be divided by the number of the merged process. We can merge also a random number of mixed Poisson Stacy process. In text case, we need to mix the resulting mixed Poisson Stacy process. And I will finish my talk with some conclusive remarks. The set of X Stacy and the one Stacy distributions is very general. It coincides with the set of the ratios of gamma random variable with first integer parameter and any Stacy random variable. Mixed Poisson process with Stacy missing variable are appropriate for modeling of counts of more than Poisson arrivals. Their particular case is the negative binomial process. The problem for estimation of their parameters is simultaneous and still open. Its solution would be very useful because these distributions are very general and therefore it will be easier to find the right model for our data. Application of the method of moments requires to solve a system of equations where the unknown parameters participate as argument of different gamma functions. Moreover, this approach works only in case when the considered moment exists. If we solve a system of equations that arise in the maximum likelihood approach, it has no explicit solution. Therefore, the explicit analytical form of the estimators is still an open problem. And finally, I would like to thank you for your attention.
Okay, so which please. Uh, thank you for your talk. So my question is, uh, do your results for uh, mixed Poisson processes generalize higher dimension? Mixed Poisson process, it uh, it can be it can be done. Of course, many other results can be obtained. Uh, you can consider mixed Poisson process in higher dimension, but we still haven't made it. It is only one dimension of this Poisson process. But it would be interesting, very general, and very useful, but you will see the problem with estimation. We need to solve this problem in order to use it in practice. More questions, please? Okay, uh, I think that this integral, capital Z, uh, maybe it omits representation in terms of Bessel functions. Uh, of course, I, uh, I should check, but... It is possible to... It has many representations, actually. It's an uh, infinite series, for example. Uh, as a Bessel function, I don't know, actually. Uh, I will check, but I think that uh, it's I possible. Prefer, I prefer this form as far as it is easy for work. This, uh, well, well, I need to find the integral in cross form. Uh, ah, in general it is uh, possible. In terms of Bessel functions, but I will check. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, more questions please. If, if not, please let us take this one.
Arabic speaker in the last century of GF. Its talk is a critical Markov branching process with real distribution with the symptom. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, my talk will be, I, I will try to be a quick, but more uh, not to omit anything important in our work. Uh, So, I usually start my talks about branching processes uh, from the topic where I came from. It's a cosmic race physics, uh, where is the biggest branching process in the world. When they come in the atmosphere, they start to branch and produce hundreds of different particles. It's also uh, available in the CERN provider, where you have a, a particles which is track on. Uh, having this big natural process which is, which is permanent in the nature, you have to measure a different cases, different events, natural events, which is caused by different initial position. Something in the beginning is changing during the time. You have a different medium conditions, if something happened in the middle, and all the process is going down. Usually the solution, the, the problem which we have to solve as a scientist is to detect on the bottom, usually. It happens even uh, if you try to, uh, to measure hairs of family, the first ever branching process, studied branching process in 200 years ago, you, you have to estimate what's going up in previous steps. So, uh, when you talk about the hairs of family, it could be easy. But if you talk about a such kind of industrial scale branch process, it's also invisible. So, uh, we, with my colleague, Ben Kermeisman here, uh, started to work on this topic, and now we have a series of papers uh, which talk in only a small problems, a particular problems, on this big, large branching process. They could not explain in full uh, the process, but they make uh, some estimate about particular cases. We did uh, in the past, uh, uh, so we have uh, studied uh, the branching mechanism, which starting from geometric, uh, by, uh, which is induced by geometric process, uh, branching process induced by the geometric distribution. Uh, we have studied a linear work process which uh, which changing initial conditions, uh, we try to, to find a different case. What is the purpose of this? Uh, when you have to solve a this uh, so big question, uh, so big problem, you got to solve a, a big statistics and to implement a, such kind of uh, computational solution. This is not physical, physical to solve by any different kind than uh, computation. But if you have to implement some a computational solution, you have to calibrate all of this by this process. So these particular cases, step by step, is making a framework which we try to make to before we want our software, which is almost available in some particular cases. So in this particular case, which I'm talking about, is about a subcritical process, a special case. Uh, when, the particle, when the particles are exponentially, this is the key word, exponentially distributed with any constant parameter. We are starting with the standard, uh, which is uh, common with the branching process uh, uh, terminology. You have a probability generation function. Uh, we have to solve uh, back like chemical equations. Uh, number of particles and uh, following the, sta uh, the standard uh, way. So, uh, what is important in this particular case that we selected is, uh, okay, because uh, the, expo uh, the exponential time, we, we have uh, a this form, which is first introduced for, uh, well, Supercritical processes by a tear, 
Later, uh, by Pakes, it was uh, studied for uh, subcritical processes. Uh, this form it could be uh, this modernity der uh, derivative could be added in this form, in general form, and we could uh, obtain well, this, well, for this particular case this uh, limits are true, and we have uh, these conditional probabilities. Uh, so, we're going back to, to the form, this form in four, which is important, and this form, which is here, with this function f star, uh, produce, in good, it use a following idea. You have uh, some measurement below, and something that, which happens above, uh, when well, the data below is measured by is estimated by asymptotic, and we want to guess about the reduction law which happening in this particular case. Uh, this is our proposition, and uh, we have uh, uh, this uh, relation, uh, and finding uh, this recurrent uh, form, we found this recur recurrent form, uh, we were looking for this uh, recurrent equation of PMF, which is include this recurrency of probabilities. The question is how to find A, this uh, uh, reproduction numbers, and this P, from which, uh, from which distribution this came from. Uh, the solution probably exists for every, for every case, but the problem is which solution is probabilistic. So what is looking for is uh, AN to be uh, as a probabilistic value, not every possible value. For example, if you, if you take a, a Poisson distribution uh, for this particular case, so uh, it uh, does not switch. Actually, that does not work. So the Poisson solution is not a solution, uh, not a, a solution. Uh, so, following this, we look for looking at the row uh, distribution. Row distribution, okay, it's not strike fair to say, but think about the row distribution as Poisson distribution with truncated by zeros. So it's very similar to a Poisson, but without zeros. Uh, in branching processes, it is very well known for subcritical processes when you count a total progeny. Uh, we using this in different way here. Yeah. Uh, the broad distribution, you see how quickly it's uh, decay uh, with probabilities. Another uh, special function we, we use is one of the W function. We already use this function for the critical process uh, of the branching process induced by geometric distribution. Uh, this function is quite useful. This reminds of uh, Borel distribution uh, parameters. Uh, it's uh, what is it? It's an inverse function of this form. For example, if you, miss, uh, you have an x e on power x, this function, the this, this inverse function is this. Uh, the solution is uh, for complex value. It's available. Every, uh, it's always available. But if you look for the real values. Uh, you have a one main solution, the red one, with uh, real uh, variables. The one is in complex, in complex uh, variables is the blue one. We are looking at this. So we have uh, solving this. Um, so for that we have a function. You have uh, this following uh, variables, which is very well known. And what is important in this the one by W function is very easy to compute. Uh, Cornish in 1996 and 1997 proved a very quick computation, so just uh, from less than a second you can compute uh, the W and Beth function by any uh, complete uh, by any uh, computer. So now let's go uh, to the problem. Uh, we have a, a two different version. Now we have to combine this graph function with this uh, W on back. You have a two different version of this F star function. Oh, one is this version, one is by W on back. That's why we use both of them. 
Now follow and this is the this function. They are absolutely adequate, even in computation they are very the same. If you see the gray line below, it's very the same part. So we start to to uh, to, to, to use a star like uh, generation function pn following the row distribution. Uh, so what we found of course is uh, so this is assumption of a known case, HS is the process which drives, uh, which drives uh, the branching and uh, uh, so this is the, the process and this uh, F star is what we measured. Following this, uh, if we uh, use a Borel distribution, this probability is A0, A1 and AN is switch, uh, fits quite well as a probability. This is the result. Uh, we can see uh, for two different cases, for one, two. Sorry, I missed one, the, one, one a third, one half and two thirds. You see the probabilities for n. Again, it's quite... Uh, uh, it's characteristic for close to... Oh, sorry, but it's not as well. So, uh, this... Uh, there is a uh, walk convexity, it's quite strong uh, solution, it's, we proved this and uh, we found the number of particles which are alive at any moment. Mathematical expectation is also available in this form here. Uh, the next one we found is extinction probability, it's expected variables. Uh, this is the Extension probabilities. Uh, this is the probabilities for x equal to n. So this is the form here. Uh, for example, the form is quite different than Poisson distribution. Again, something different than Poisson distribution. Uh, we also found uh, con conditional PGF, which is if x is larger than zero, the pro uh, what is the probability of x equal to n? Uh, the of course, is the max function. What is important in this that at t forward to continue, we have uh, exactly the real distribution. Uh, this is uh, the general result, and now we do um, statistical inference. Uh, the statistical inference is uh, based on factorial moment, factorial moments of real distribution. Uh, we Computed, it's very forward, no, nothing surprising. And what we have found is expectation and variation function. Uh, and variance uh, to mean ratio, or index of dispersion as well, is available. What we found that uh, here, this value is a threshold, and the process is under dispersed and over dispersed. So we, we, we quite sure can see it here. And, uh, of course, we, it's easy to find the skew, kurtosis, and uh, the rest of uh, major statistical parameters. What is important in this moral distribution, this process, is that it's very prone to produce a larger alpha. So it's a process which is not, which produces more, uh, more probably to produce a larger alpha, which makes even this uh, subcritical process is making a more difficult uh, to make a statistical inference. So it's just in brief uh, our findings. Uh, we expect to, to, to publish the print in the next two weeks, so I think it's better to look in details than to, to talk here. So I, that's why we try, I try to be more quick.